four, three, two, one. Good evening and welcome to a special meeting of the Northampton School Committee, Thursday, October 14th, 2021. Um, this meeting is being held online as a Zoom meeting pursuant to the state's uh, modification to the open meeting law. And we have a, 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 a brief agenda this evening, which is our uh, quarterly meeting with the uh, student union or the student representatives. Um, and so I'll begin by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Mayor Narkowitz. Present. Member Busanski. Present. Member Fallon is gonna be a little late this evening. Uh, Member Seraphie Cox. Present. Member Condon. Present. Member Levy. Present. Member Kaufman. Present. Member Goldman. Present. Member Voss. Present. And Member Gold. Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I will turn now to our, um, to our student representatives that are here this evening. Okay. If you wanna introduce yourselves and um, I'll turn the floor over to you. Sure. Um, I will start. Um, right, uh, we currently have three members that are going to be presenting to you. We have myself, Jake Fine. Uh, I am a junior at Northampton High School. Um, and then Lila or Dahlia, you guys want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Lila. I am a sophomore and I'm the student union representative for the school committee for this year. And my name is Dahlia Breslow and I'm a junior. Okay, Lila, do you want to start sharing your screen? Yeah, can, am I... Am I enabled to share my screen on this Zoom? Yes, you can. Right. It's your Zoom. Thank you. All right, hopefully this works. Oh no, I have to, sorry, I have to figure out a setting apparently. This should work. Oh, I see. Okay, sorry, one second. Okay, it says I have to, to leave this meeting in order to share my screen. Jake, do you wanna start sharing and I'll, I'll try to come back? Sure. Okay, sorry. That's fine, okay. So I'll start, sorry, okay. Um, so I wanna start with a little preface, preface. I guess, um, on what we're presenting. So we're presenting on a survey that has not yet been sent out to the student body. And according to my knowledge, I don't think that the student union has ever presented in a survey without results of the school committee. So it's a bit of, uh, it's a bit, something a bit new. Um, but we felt like it would be important since this survey is one of the most extensive that we have done, at least in my time. Um, and that's because a lot of things have changed this year. Um, we added standards-based grading officially this year. Um, we had the new start time. Uh, we have Otis, our new grading platform. And we're in person again, fully, for the first full year in a year and a half. So it's a lot of things and we tried, we're trying to get the most, we're trying to get as big of a picture as possible from students. And so with that, I'll go into a bit of the um, goals, I guess. So last year, I don't know if you remember, um, we got about 300 responses, 287 to be exact, on our survey. And this year, we're hoping to get a lot more. We're hoping to get at least 500. And specifically, we're hoping to get um, people from 
low socioeconomic backgrounds and uh, students of color, since the participation in that section in that area was extremely low and it was very hard for us to get get a good picture of what those students needed or wanted from our school. So that is one of our goals to increase um, students of color and so low socioeconomic backgrounds response rate and to get a, at least 500 of about the 850 students in our school. And so just to go over the format of how we'll be going over everything, um, the survey is broken up into different sections. So we'll be going over mostly over each section and then the key points. And then if you have any questions at the, there's a time at the end to do that. And so with that, I'll get started. Uh, the first section is of course asking about demographics so that we can properly contextualize our data. So we ask for the grade, gender, race, socioeconomic status. And then we also ask the question of if students feel like there's any part of their identity that is important, then that needs to be represented along with their um, answers um, to give it the most meaning. Um, the next section um, is driver's ed. Um, and I talked a little about this with Dr. Provost at our ESSER 3 funding meeting, but the student union has come up with an idea of trying to fund or subsidize or find some way of helping students from low income backgrounds to pay for driver's ed because currently driver's ed costs 700 to 800 dollars for the entire process of paying for driving lessons um, then taking the test and that's an expensive process for something that opens up a lot of opportunities for students including jobs and possibly even attending colleges that are further outside of our area and so we, in order to get information about this, we're asking students first whether or not they are allowed to drive, including permit or JOL, and then also asking if they themselves thought that cost was a substantial factor in their decision or not, whether or not to take um, driver's ed. And then we are also asking students if they think this district, the district should be um, finding some way to help students. And we ask them if they think it's, they should subsidize it for all students. So kind of act as a negotiator and take 800 students as like the bargaining chip and say, reduce the cost to $500 per student, or just to act in the interest of low income students and reduce the cost for them. Um, both are valid ways of doing it, we're just wondering where student, what students think about it. Um, the next section is the Lending Library. The Lending Library is something we instituted, created last year. Um, and it's a two section, two system uh, thing, divided into school supplies and basic needs supplies. Um, and I can go a bit more into this if people have, if members have questions about this at the end. But all we're asking students is if they know about it and if they know where it is and if they have used it. Um, because that will help us know where we have to do outreach to students to let them know that this resource exists. And then I think the final uh, section I will be presenting on tonight is mental health. So we're starting off with how students are doing just to see how the general sentiment of the school is. And then we ask uh, specific questions about student stress, what's causing them stress. Is it grading? Is it college applications for seniors? Is it um, work, family life, social life? Um, just to, again, get a bit of a sense of how students are feeling. And then we also ask them, also give a list of resources that the student union has thought of that they that 
we ask if they think would be helpful. Things like a, the peer mentoring, a peer mentoring program, things like a mental health day that we instituted last year, um, things like help, um, mental health newsletters and the weekly Hello Ham um, that gets sent out by Ms. Valancourt. And then we also ask students if there are any other resources that they think we haven't thought of. And then finally, we end off by asking what their thoughts are on an emotional therapy dog, emotional support dog, um, which we just thought we sh thought we can add in there for a little bit of uh, lightheartedness. And so I think Lila will, will be presenting next. Is Lila here? Yeah, hi everyone, sorry for my technical difficulties at the beginning. Um, so the next section uh, in our survey is grading. Um, I don't know, I'm sure many of you know that we implemented a new uh, grading system this year called standard-based grading. Um, and it, um, so yeah, we because it's such a big change, we wanted to know how students are feeling about it um, because we've heard a lot of positive things about it and also some negative um, feedback from our peers and our classmates. Um, and then if there are any worries about grade inflation, because standard-based grading allows a lot of reassessments. So some students are concerned that because of this, it's really, really easy for, get, for kids to get a pretty high grade in certain classes. And so they're worried that their hard work might be dim diminished, especially in the eyes of colleges who aren't quite um, at this kind of new uh, standpoint on grading yet and are still using a more standard grading system. Uh, Jake, do you wanna go to the next slide? Yeah, so then the next section is about advanced courses. Um, last year, I believe when we released our diversity survey that was more uh, trying to figure out how students of color um, were um, in like advanced courses um, and how those were for them. This is more because of all the different demographics we collected at the beginning. Um, it's seeing which people are in advanced courses and who feels like they belong and who maybe it feels like it's more of an unwelcome um, environment based on their identities, if at all. Jake, do you wanna go to the next slide? Um, and then this is the, Another thing that we worked on last year um, is Smith classes for high schoolers. Um, and one of the things that we talked about a lot in student union last year was the GPA requirement, which right now is 3.4. Um, and that's controlled by Smith. Um, so it's kind of a difficult thing for us to make a mark on, but we want to know kind of students input on that. And if they feel like that's kind of a fair, um, thing for them to have to meet in order to take a Smith class. And then these next questions are for students who have already taken Smith classes or in them. And it's just to see how they're, how supported they were when taking the classes. Um, yeah, those two are the same question. Yeah, uh, Jake, next slide. And the last thing that, uh, the last section that I'll be presenting on is the new start time, which I know you guys deliberated a lot last year. Um, because it's also such a huge change for students. So we're asking how they feel about it um, and how students are liking the new schedule and challenges um, because a lot of students are having to miss um, fourth and sometimes third period classes mul multiple times a week um, for athletic events and like games and stuff. And so, and that kind of provides a challenge for those students and also their teachers who have um, groups of students missing different lessons on different days. Um, and if they would support changing the start time again. Yeah, and then I think I'll hand it off to Dahlia. Great, so um, FluxLog is also another re recent addition um, since last year and it also changed a lot this year. So this part in our survey will cover um, mostly the helpfulness of FlexBlock, um, but also it will tie into what Lila talked about, the start time, which is that adding on this um, 35, I believe, minute period of time uh, makes the day a lot longer. And there's um, a couple complications 
sometimes with students involving sports or other activities. So we ask them, um, number one, like if flex block would be more helpful if it was at the end of the day, um, because then it would be easier for them to miss it instead of missing um, another class where they might have a test or miss a lecture or something. Um, but secondly, we just kind of want to address whether FlexBlock is help helpful for them. Um, it's designed to like be time for them to meet with teachers or collaborate with other students. Um, and we wanna know if that's really being played out and if they have any other suggestions for how to make it more helpful. So um, one thing that the survey asks is if people would enjoy um, and find it helpful for the student union to have a FlexBlock offering for them to come talk to us um, with issues around the school or just to discuss things. Um, yeah, next slide. Lunch. Um, this probably happens every year, but lunch is very short. Um, it's like a little over 20 minutes and students have been complaining that's not long enough time to eat, um, eat their lunch and relax and digest. And yeah, that basically happens every year because it's short and it stays short. Students don't eat quicker the older they get. Okay, next slide. Um, and this part of the survey talks about sustainability and because this is a very current topic and students are really concerned with the impact um, of climate change, we would like to hear how, what they think the school is doing on sustainability. Um, just generally, I think there's like an, students can share like whatever they feel right in their own words. And then also what they think about um, selling plastic water bottles because that's bad for sustainability. Next slide. So um, this slide doesn't cover the content in the survey, but it's just generally um, what a subcommittee on student union is working on. So the anti-racism subcommittee um, is carrying on from last year. And our general goal is to diversify Northampton High School's curriculum um, and also to spread awareness about um, anti-racist practices. So one strategy that we've thought about this year is to update the history textbooks to include more diverse perspectives and also just reflect modern times and modern perspectives. Um, another way thing the anti-racism subcommittee we're working on is to educate and adjust students, possibly through social media or website um, or some other way, like videos, um, that will educate students on black history or maybe provide a reading list um, of books that will appeal to them that include diverse perspectives and also propose, um, promote the work of SOCA at NHS because they um, are often underlooked. Um, another thing that we've been thinking about but might not necessarily do is to create recommendations for NHS departments to diversify. So that's um, going beyond just history, it includes English, basically all the curriculums. And it would either be us um, compiling like just a list of recommendations after reviewing their curriculum, or perhaps um, working in some student ideas. And generally we um, will be moving forward with anti-racist work by using a survey that went out last um, spring, right before school ended about um, anti-racist practices at NHS. And we'll be using those data and the responses from students to drive our work going ahead. Next slide. Oh, that's it, perfect. So we just wanna know if anyone has any questions about any of this. Dr. Provost, do you have your hand up? Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. It's always so impressive to hear from students. I did have a question around the last goal about diversifying the curriculum. Um, it's long been a goal of mine to have students involved with textbook adoption process. And so one of the things I'm wondering is understanding that the goal is to have greater diversity across the curriculum. Can you say more about why you've targeted history as a priority area? Um, well, first of all, why we're talking to history textbooks in specific is that they're old. Um, old isn't necessarily a bad thing, but um, having updated history textbooks 
would provide a more current um, idea of history. And the current idea of history is that diverse perspectives throughout history need to be um, taught. And like when, we're, especially in American history, a lot of those perspectives are overlooked throughout the ages um, and even now, I think. So we targeted history because students have um, told us and just the general conversation around NHS is that there's a lot that isn't being talked about, that isn't being discussed. Um, and one step would be to include it in the history textbooks. Does anyone else have anything to add to Thank that you. question? Member Kaufman, you have your hand up next. I do. Um, Thalia just asked a follow-up question though, didn't you? Oh, I was just asking if Lila and Jake wanted to add into that. Um, yeah, I'd like to I'd like to add a little bit that um, aside from the history textbooks, another thing that I experienced particularly in my in the required U.S. History one course that I took last year as a freshman is a lot of the worksheets and the like documentaries and videos we watched were kind of outdated, um, and the focuses of the class were kind of disproportionately on um, like kind of how white people were positively affecting America. And I think one specific example I remember is that we learned not that much about slavery and what we did learn, uh, the biggest thing was Nat Turner's rebellion, which kind of sheds a big, uh, a negative light on um, slaves and didn't really highlight the um, more like the culture and the other things about like being an enslaved person in America at that time. Yeah, I think that sums it up perfectly. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much for doing this. I, I'm, uh, I, I've done hundreds of surveys in my life, so I love surveys. Um, I, I'm gonna regret saying this, but um, results of surveys could really be, um, can lose credibility if the wording and the options aren't posed in a specific way. So if you have any, if you have anybody to look over this when you're done creating the survey, uh, that would be great. And if you can find anybody, I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> but I do I do love what you're trying to do in terms of expanding the number of people that are going to respond. I just want to make sure that um, the language that you use is going to create credible results. And I'm really anxious to see the results, which leads to my question of what do you plan to do with the results? Do you have a plan at this point? So I can answer this. Uh, yeah. So one of the main things um, is just to get gather information. And for most of these issues, we know it's an issue. That's why we've been, that's why we put it on the survey. But we don't know, sometimes we don't know to the extent uh, that the issue exists. And other times it helps us get what we want, basically. If we can have, if we say um, there are students at Northampton High School who can't pay for driver's ed, or they have, they're struggling and um, it's a resource that would be very helpful. Yeah. If we can show someone that yes, students of low income, 75% uh, of them, for example, answered yes on this survey and 500 um, of our 850 responded out of the school, it, it would helps us um, deliver the message that we are already trying to say. To who? Uh, well, I guess to you, the school committee, and uh, to the administration of Northampton High School. Gotcha. Okay. So just as an example, if you were going to write a survey question that said a lot of students feel like uh, driver's ed is unaffordable, do you agree? That would not be a good question to ask. So just know that I, I, I'm hearing what you're saying tonight in terms of things that you want to get, but if you word it differently, you'll get a lot more credible well, responses. The, so. the exact question phrasing yeah. um, is like this, um, was cost a substantial factor in your decision on whether or not to take driver's ed? And it's a yes or no response. Yeah. And good. then we added an elaborate section right under it. Right, and that was my other question. Well, these are gonna be closed ended, right? Many uh, uh, other than comments? Yeah, most of them are closed ended. Yeah, great. Thank you, Jake. Good luck. I would like to add that like the elaborate sections that Jake's talking about, are another added benefit of these surveys because they provide us with a lot of feedback from students that we might normally not get. For sure, great. 
Okay, so I have several more hands up. Um, Member Bisansky. Great, thanks. Um, thank you so much uh, for this presentation and running this by us before you even ran, you know, have conducted the survey. I think it's really great. And I think this is like one of the real added values of the student union is to um, survey students and really try to understand where the issues are at. Um, I also spent a part of my career writing surveys. So I'm gonna just underscore what Member Kaufman said, I think it's really important to try to uh, remove your biases in the questioning. And so the more you can um, do that and run it by people and test it out, and the more that you hear what your biases are and try and remove those from the questions, the better your results are going to be. So um, that was the first thing. And, and to really try and just lean away as much as possible from sort of leading questions, because just like Member Kaufman said, I think it really just would undermine the results. So I hope that, um, you know, I know there's great teachers at Northampton High or Member Kaufman himself who would be probably happy to run through it or other people in your life. The other thing is, I think you're asking questions about a lot of brand new things. And I think it's hard when um, these things like the grading, um, the new start times, flex block have only been in place for two months. Um, it's great to gather baseline information and use that as a baseline, but it's really hard to say two months into school, like, oh my God, we got to change that, right? Because everybody's upset about it. Like it sort of play itself out, but it's really great that you're, you could like use this to gather sort of baseline information. And I would just encourage you to use it that way. Thanks. Okay, before I um, recognize the next member, I, I just wanna say to folks that are joining the meeting right now, the school committee is currently in a special meeting that we held prior to our regular meeting with the Student Advisory Council. Um, and so we're just uh, in the, and still in the middle of that. And then we will be starting our regularly scheduled uh, school committee meeting when we're completed. Um, so the next member who has their hand uh, raised is Member Levy. Member Levy? Hi, thanks. I'll echo my gratitude. Um, thank you so much for sharing this with us uh, at this time. And thanks for your presentation. It was really, really helpful. Um, you have a lot of folks here who are who have done a lot with surveys. I'm one of them as well. Uh, so I won't echo what folks have said. Um, actually, I'll ask a question. Um, what are your plans? You have a really great goal of getting participation in your survey. What are your plans for for uh, trying to get folks to participate in the survey? Um, so we've actually been thinking a little about a this. Little about this. Wait. Did I freeze? Did I freeze? Your your picture was frozen, but we hear you just fine. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, so, so the original the first parts would be putting it in Hello Hamp, um, the daily bulletin. Um, that those don't cover many students, but it just for just putting it out there. Um, and then we we're also thinking of going to individual teachers um, that have wide ranging students. So. Um, freshman and sophomore English classes, U.S. history classes, things like that. And we were also thinking of uh, putting flyers up across the school with QR codes to the survey. That way students could just take their phone out, which they have all the time, and uh, just fill out the survey or at least see that it exists and then possibly take the time later on. Great. Uh, it sounds like that's a really great way of getting word out. One of the things you might want to think about is working with your administration to see if there's any kind of incentive that um, could be provided once you've reached your goal. So things like free pizza for the whole school if you reach 500 survey respondents or things like that. Um, something to think about. And then the other thing, I won't repeat what my colleagues said, but one thing I'd strongly recommend is, um, I don't know if this is, if, if what you presented to us is in the order of how the questions are on the survey, but my strong recommendation is that you move the demographic questions to the end. Uh, if you have them at the beginning, that will, um, that has the, the um, possibility of really strongly impacting the results you get. Uh, and, and putting them at the end is really helpful, as is having something on there that says, 
why you're asking those questions so that people understand um, that it's important for them to fill that out. Um, thank you. Okay, Member Gold. Uh, yes, uh, thanks as well to all of you. And um, I, I think that um, something that I was really excited by was the survey on the late start, because I do hope that we as a district um, assess uh, how its impact and how effective it's been and what adjustments might need to be made. And so I would hope that the district itself would at some point soon, and I agree with as member Bosansky said, um, doing it too early might not give us the um, the, the whole picture, right? And so doing it, using your all survey in conjunction with whatever the district is gonna be doing to assess it would be valuable, right? Rather than surveying the students again or surveying families again. And so I just encourage you to see what you can do either to partner with Dr. Provost and his team to figure out like what really do the, we need to hear from students um, regarding the impact um, of Late Start and what, what's been great about it, what needs to be adjusted about it kind of thing. So um, I'd encourage you guys to see how can the district make use of your survey as well in its research on Late Start. Member Voss. Hi, thanks. Thank you all. Um, I agree with a lot of what's been said and I'll just add one small comment, which is another change that was made that you might consider asking questions about is the new approach to embedding honors within the math classes. And a reason to consider that now is that you have students who have, will have had both experiences. So maybe this is a little early if they haven't already had that, but at some point I think that would be a nice thing for you guys to explore as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I believe those are all the questions from school committee. Um, do, are there any closing comments or, or other things that you'd like to add as from the student union? Um, no, I'd just like to say uh, thank you for all of your input. Um, we will consider taking those into, adding those into the survey. Um, the demographic one, really, I like that one. I think that's we probably will do that. And I look forward to sharing the results with you in a few months. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, um, have a good night. Okay, good night. Um, so I would now um, entertain a motion to adjourn this special meeting so that we can then move into the regular meeting. If there's a motion for that. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. And Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. Vote is nine in favor. Okay, so um, that adjourns our special meeting. And uh, now it is uh, 6.52, so I will now call to order the regular meeting of the uh, Northampton School Committee for Thursday, October 14th. Uh, 2021. Um, I will dispense with the roll call. So since we literally just did a roll call to adjourn the prior meeting, so I'm confident that we have a quorum present. Um, and just for those who may have joined um, after the start of the last meeting, um, we are holding this meeting as an online Zoom meeting um, in accordance with the uh, modifications to the state's open meeting law related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I would ask folks to please um, stay muted during the meeting um, and, um, and to turn screens off uh, when uh, you're not part of the meeting. Um, and we will move into the public comment period next, which is an opportunity for, for the public to weigh in. So I would ask folks who wish to speak during the public comment to raise uh, their virtual hand. Um, and I will call on you in that 
um, order. Um, that would be under now more frequently under the reactions menu. There's a raise hand function. If you have an older version of Zoom, it may actually still be on the on the drop down participant menu. Or if you're calling on a phone, it would need to um, you'd need to use the star functions to raise um, your hands. So okay, so we have um, a couple of hands up, and then the only other piece is I would just ask folks to please. Um, identify yourself, your name, and where you live, because um, sometimes the the uh, Zoom uh, screen is not the same as who's actually calling or or, or attending the meeting. Um, and I will be keeping a timer of three minutes um, so that everyone has an equal opportunity uh, to speak. So I'll, as you approach three minutes, I will um, just give you a heads up so that you can wrap up. Um, and that's a uh, obviously a three minute max, it's not mandatory that you go the full three minutes. Um, so with that, I will start with the first hand, uh, which is uh, Liz Bowen. Liz, do you wanna go ahead and um, unmute? Hi, uh, my name is Liz Bowen. I live on Herald Street in Ward 1. Uh, over the past few months, I've had multiple conversations where it was clear the person I was talking to had an inaccurate perception of the, demo, the current demographics of the elementary schools. Given that some of those people were district employees or members of the school committee, I wanted to share some current statistics about our four elementary schools. All of these numbers are taken from the DESE website. You can find them at profiles.doe.mass.edu. These statistics are reported by each district to this state. This year's numbers will be posted sometime in December. So the numbers I'm about to share are for last year. Since our schools range in size, I am using percentages, although I will touch on the number of students who are designated high needs by the state. I've rounded these numbers to the nearest whole number since this setting requires that I ask people to follow what I'm saying without visual support. The percentage of students the state describes as students with disabilities, which I believe is students with IEPs, is highest at Bridge Street at 25%. Leeds and Ryan Road are a percentage lower with 24% each. Jackson Street is at 16% students with disabilities. The percentage of students who the state classifies as economically disadvantaged is also highest at Bridge Street at 44%. Next is Ryan Road and Leeds at 31 and 30%. Jackson Street is at 22% economically disadvantaged students. The percentage of students who receive ELL services is highest at Bridge Street with 10%. Next is Jackson Street at 6%. Leeds and Ryan Road were both at 5% last year. The state uses the term high needs to describe students who fall into two or more of those categories. The percentage of high needs students at Bridge Street is 57%. Leeds and Ryan Road are both at 42%. Jackson Street is the lowest at 31%. By my calculations, based on the student body reported last year, that means that there are 137 high needs students at Bridge Street, 123 high needs students at Leeds, and 98 each at Ryan Road and Jackson Street. We'll have new numbers before budget season. I'll come back and share those then. I'm also emailing this comment to the school committee members with a link to the source in case you wanna refer back, the state has a pretty chart. Uh, a note that I wanted to compare student teacher ratios, but I couldn't figure out how to compare K through five. And since the preschools are so adult heavy as they should be, uh, it's hard to compare across schools when only two out of the four schools have a preschool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, the next uh, hand that's raised is um, uh, Principal Brown, Lauren Brown. Go ahead and- uh... Hey everybody, I am Lauren Brown. I'm the principal at Jackson Street. Um, I also live in Northampton in Ward 6 on Park Hill Road. Um, I would like to speak up as myself. I also have something to share from Principal Choquette. So if, if I could have six minutes, that would be lovely. Uh, let's get go, go proceed. Thank you. I'm here to speak up in favor of voting to ratify Dr. Provost's contract tonight. Simply put, I'd very much like to keep working with John. I'm choosing my words carefully. I don't work for John. I work for kids, I work for their families, and I work for other educators. 
everyone on the administrative leadership team works together with John. That team dynamic is one that John cultivated intentionally. He does not allow his title or any shred of ego to interfere with the good work we were all called to do, to support our children and being the happiest, most whole, most empowered, most capable people they can be, especially the most vulnerable children in our community. Dr. Provost has created a team of educators who are free to follow our visions for each of our schools. He has also worked to unite us so that the elementary students in Northampton have equitable experiences. As a new and enthusiastic school leader, I am deeply grateful for the freedom I have to envision Jackson Street. I am deeply grateful that I'm not being micromanaged in a way that would prevent me from following my community's beautiful lead and making our school everything we want it to be. John's leadership allows for us to listen to our communities and dream together about what our schools can be. My favorite thing about working with John is that he expects us all to disagree with him on a regular basis. That sort of trust on a team is crucial to its authentic success. The fact that I can look at John on my little screen and say, John, I do not agree with everything you say. I do not like all of your ideas and that that makes him smile and that I'm safe to do that and that I was safe to do that with an interim in my title is the same kind of safety that we want our students to feel when they take the risks we all know are necessary for learning. And that kind of trust is not easy to build on a team, but it's there under his guidance. While I do appreciate so much of what it's like to be on this team of peers, kids are what matter most. John puts one foot in front of the other every single day to do what's right for kids in every decision he makes, no matter how big or small. And he works hard every day to listen to this community, to grow his ideas about what it means to do what's right for kids. Let's keep him on board for them. That was your first three minutes, <laughs> so. Okay, okay, so now I'm speaking for Beth Chiquette. Good evening. Knowing that Dr. Provost's evaluation was on the agenda tonight and knowing that I am not able to attend due to my college teaching duties, I wanted to be sure to send you my thoughts on this exceptional leader. As someone who has worked as a principal for 16 years, 10 in Northampton, and as an educator for the past 22, I not only have the expertise in what strong leadership should be, I also speak to you as someone who, as a principal in Northampton, experiences exceptional leadership every single day from John. In my 22 years as an educator and school principal, I have worked with eight different superintendents, and although six of them were just fine, two of them, my former superintendent in Vermont and John, have had a profound impact on who I am as a leader. First and foremost, John always puts students at the heart of every decision he makes. He doesn't make decisions based on what is popular or because he is pressured by the politics of it all. He doesn't make decisions based solely on what others may want him to do. Rather, he makes decisions based on what is best for our students. It is always about the students. He has the courage to stand up for what is right and just. He is a strong advocate for social justice. He believes in every student and he believes that every student can be successful. John not only leads with his head, he also leads with his heart. He is caring and understands a tremendous amount of time that teachers and administrators put into their work. He appreciates all of us and values our work, our commitment to our students in schools and the sacrifices we make for the district. John's commitment to equity and student achievement are at the core of who he is. He understands the data, shares the data and has high expectations for all of us. He supports professional development, of teachers and administrators and encourages all of us to push ourselves to be better. He collaborates with his leadership team, is a servant leader and supports our goals. Finally, John is a communicator. He communicates with his leadership team, our NPS faculty and staff and our community frequently. He understands the role of a school committee, superintendent and principal and has the courage to let people know when they are crossing the boundary. 
It is easy for people who aren't educators who have, or who have never worked in a school to pass judgment on those of us in the thick of it all, doing it every single day. But until you sit in that chair, you'll never understand what the job does to your mental, emotional, and physical being. It is a thankless job, yet John does it with grace, kindness, and admiration for those that he serves. It is very easy to take everything he does for granted if you haven't, and if you haven't worked under the leadership of other superintendents, then you have no idea how good we have it in Northampton. I am so thankful for his support, encouragement, and for his belief in me and my colleagues. Thank you, John, for your exemplary leadership. I couldn't imagine doing this work without you leading the way. Thank you for your time tonight, Dr. Beth Chiquette, Bridge Street School Principal. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Principal Brown, and thank you, Principal Chiquette. Uh, in absentia. Um, the next person whose hand is raised is Stephanie Matry. Stephanie? Hello, good evening. Um, I'm, I'm, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I am a parent who sends her children to a school that is affected by the Northampton School District. And I also have a professional medical degree. I'm writing to ask you to vote no, to send a letter to the Board of Health mandating the COVID-19 vaccine to children attending schools in this district. My story is not uncommon and it can be remedied with reason and logic. I have three daughters, ages 12, 10, and seven. All of them have been vaccinated for various illnesses per my informed consent with their doctor's support and, um, and help. Um, uh, I'm sorry. As a physician, I understand the importance of informed consent for everybody to be able to make choices for their own bodies and their own children. My husband and I are vaccinated for COVID-19. I do believe in the vaccination. We both work in healthcare and we consider it to be important. What I don't believe in is mandates because everything, uh, everybody has certain situations that pertain to them. Um, my husband and I have had vaccine effects from this shot. My menstrual cycle has been permanently affected. Um, it has not gone back to normal at all. I am passing baseball sized clots if, if I can get graphic. And my husband who has had epilepsy since he was eight um, has gone from one to, one to two seizures per year to two to three a month since his vaccination. Um, my sister-in-law had idiopathic encephalopathy two years ago. Um, they were able to abate it with autoimmune drugs and she is a prominent doctor in the New Jersey area. So she went to get her COVID shot like a diligent professional and she ended up having a relapse um, of encephalopathy. She has not been able to get her second shot and now her, her job is on the line. So I just ask that everybody take into account the real data here that we're looking at before we make decisions about our children's bodies. And I think that having um, a vaccine that's still not approved through the certain veins of the government that need to be approved and asking our children to choose whether or not they want to go to public school or homeschool based on their bodies um, is an injustice to them. My eldest daughter is fighting Lyme disease. Her doctor has advised against this shot due to cardiomyopathy. Uh, myocarditis, I'm sorry. Um, my middle child also has the same seizure disorder as my husband, so I'm certainly concerned for her. Um, all I'm asking again is that everybody takes in before we have more information on mandating this vaccine. I do believe in choice. So thank you very much for letting me share. Thank you very much, Stephanie. 
Um, the next person whose hand is raised is uh, Principal Sarah Madden. Principal Madden. Hi. Uh, so I'm here tonight to support our thoughtful and wise superintendent, John Provost, as this committee discusses his contract renewal. When I began my tenure in Northampton nine years ago, a year before John, I thought I made a big mistake coming here. I was shocked at how far behind this district, this district was as compared to any of the districts where I had taught or led. There was no curriculum, no consistency between elementary schools, no cooperation between school leaders and a complete lack of vision or high expectation for our district. However, when John was hired, I became hopeful and inspired and our hard work began. John listened and outlined expectations, facilitated the creation of norms for our work together, surveyed stakeholders, and led with integrity, enthusiasm, and hard work. He is the best district leader I have ever worked with. In 2014, when we conducted our superintendent search, there had been a good deal of administrative turnover in Northampton. Everyone stated the need for someone who would join our team with commitment to the work and a dedication to the long haul. John has proven to be that and more. Before John became superintendent, elementary schools were pitted against one another and some schools were known as the schools with the diverse population or the school where students with autism attend. We were violating the civil rights of our students and it was John's leadership that put an end to these practices. He hasn't stopped advocating for students and families who might not have a voice. He often asks our leadership team to evaluate who are the underserved in our district, why? and how can we foster change? This work is vital to our core values of building communities of engaged students, enabling students to reach their potential and nurturing kindness and empathy. These values were narrowed down based on a Q-sort tactic of gaining as many perspectives as possible. John was the leader of this work and he continues to challenge us to create schools where the vision and values are clear. I have watched some members of this committee treat John with such mean spiritedness that it is embarrassing and upsetting to me as a principal to work here. I have seen some of you complain and criticize a man who goes above and beyond what you have requested. I have watched this dysfunctional group repeatedly argue until the wee hours of the morning and put your own views of self-interest above the needs of our district. Anyone with students' best interest at heart would not think twice about renewing this man's contract. The fact that non-renewal is on the table is disgraceful and it should make all of us question whose best interest this committee really does have at heart. How can a committee that has reviewed John's performance without any input from the leadership team, I might add, evaluate his goals and outcomes with ratings of proficient and exemplary and now be contemplating whether his contract should be renewed? What we should be hearing tonight is thank you. Thank you for your incredible dedication and working more hours than seems humanly possible in your servant leadership in this district during the most difficult of times. And um, Mayor, I do have something from Chris Wentz. I don't know if that goes into the next three minutes. It's very short. Say what again? I, I missed who you have. I have a statement from Principal Wentz as well, the principal at Leeds. That's, that's fine. If you want to go ahead and read that into the record, that's right, fine. Right, thank you. I would like to thank Sarah Madden for sharing this with uh, you this evening as I am not able to be at public comment this evening. On the agenda this evening is the vote to ratify the superintendent's contract. In my opinion, and having worked with other superintendents in Massachusetts, I believe Dr. Provost is an excellent superintendent his work here in Northampton has been supportive of the mission and vision of the district. He supports and promotes the new district improvement plan that was developed with a great deal of collaboration with many stakeholders. The other day he came to our leadership meeting dressed as a coach with a game plan for the dip. His enthusiasm and positivity was felt around the table. He's a very dedicated and supportive leader who cares about all stakeholders in Northampton. He has led us through this pandemic always with safety of students and staff at the heart of his decisions. His collaborative approach allows for a variety of voices to be heard in the decision-making process. Lastly, he is always available. There has not been one time that I have reached out with a question or concern that he has not taken my call. I am in support of ratifying his contract and I hope that you would vote in favor of that as well. Thank you, Principal Prince of Leeds School.
Thank you very much, uh, Principal Madden, and, and thanks for reading Principal Wentz's statement. The next person whose hand is raised is Andrea Agito. Andrea, you can go ahead and unmute. Thank you, Mayor. My name is Andrea Egito. I am the president of the Northampton Association of School Employees. And I'd like to speak to you tonight on two very important issues. The first issue is around COVID-19 vaccines. We know that the best way out of this pandemic is through vaccination. We were able to negotiate an agreement to require all employees of the Northampton Public Schools to be vaccinated. And the members of NACE voted to ratify that agreement by an overwhelming majority of 95.5%. Now is the time to act and pass a vaccine mandate for all eligible students. The only way that we can stop the ongoing disruption that is caused by COVID-19 is to have as many people as possible vaccinated in our schools. All employees will be vaccinated by October 22nd. And the next step is to have all students vaccinated. We hope that you will vote to send a letter to the Northampton Board of Health requesting a local mandate for students to receive a COVID-19 vaccination in order to attend school in Northampton. The second issue I would like to speak to you about tonight is to request that this committee put in place the policy of protections from discriminatory bias and symbols of hate that bans all hate speech, hate symbols, and acts of discriminatory bias in our schools. Over the past years, you have heard from multiple students and faculty about how disruptive and harmful these acts of discriminatory bias and hate symbols in our schools are. I implore you to act now without further delay to adopt this policy as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. The next person who is has their hand raised is uh, Nick Bernier, our school business administrator. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I speak tonight to urge you to ratify a fair contract for Dr. John Provost. Though my time here has been short thus far, it certainly hasn't taken long for me to confirm what I already know about his incredible leadership. Working with him briefly in another district, it was evident how dedicated, focused, and compassionate he was about students, their success, and his overall work. He was so highly regarded there that when folks from my previous district learned that I was coming to work in Northampton, a very large number of administrators, teachers, and even caregivers told me how much they miss him and how much I would enjoy working with him. And this is 11 or so years after he had left. I can only hope that people speak that highly of me after having left only four months ago. Working in our central office has shown me exactly why so many people spoke so highly of Dr. Provost. He is a dynamic, forward-thinking, and supportive leader who, no matter what is on his plate, always has time for his staff. He, he makes you always strive to want to do better, and not in a way where you don't feel you're doing a good job, but rather he motivates you to be the best educator and best self that you can be. Perhaps his best quality is how genuine he is. He deeply cares about the success of students, staff, and of the district as a whole. That sentiment is felt day in and day out in our central office. To not ratify a fair contract for Dr. Provost would be a detriment to the district. From my understanding prior to him coming here, there was quite a bit of administrative turnover. He is in his eighth year now and has shown how dedicated he is to his work. In many ways, this district is miles ahead of many others, particularly in terms of culturally responsive teaching and ABAR. This, among many other things, uh, which you've already heard this evening, have been done under Dr. Provost's superintendency. On top of this, his most recent evaluation yielded proficient or higher in each area of the DESI evaluation rubric for superintendents. One would not ever think to not renew a teacher's contract who had a similar evaluation. The same standard should apply to the superintendent. So please, later tonight, do the right thing for students, staff, and other stakeholders of this district and ratify a fair contract renewal for Dr. Provost. 
not only would you be hard pressed to find a superintendent who is even close to as good as he is, but his mark on this district over the past seven plus years should prove that he sure has earned it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Nick. Uh, the next hand that's up is uh, first name Emily. Emily? Hi. Hi. Thank you. Hi. I'm gonna, you Thanks. Identify yeah. yourself and where you live. So, I'm Emily, and I live on a dare place in Northampton. I have two children. Um, I am here for two reasons tonight. One is that I ask the school committee to realign with DESE and remove outdoor masking rules for our children. Um, this is not an evidence-based intervention and it is unfair to our children and it's time to um, shift out of that mode. I'm also here to um, ask you, the school committee, to oppose sending a letter to the uh, Board of Health asking them to mandate vaccines for eligible students to attend school. As David Lenhart state, cites in his newsletter from the New York Times, on the 12th of this month, nationwide statistics from England show children under 12 appear to be at less risk than vaccinated people in their 40s, if not 30s. He goes on, quote, COVID is a threat to children, but it's not an extraordinary threat, unquote. Dr. Alice Dare Monroe, a pediatric infectious disease specialist at the University of Southampton has written, quote, it's very ordinary. In general, the risks from being infected are similar to other respiratory viruses you probably don't think much about. When we look to the UK, which I do, as I have a British husband and British American children, we see that the JCVI decided the risks of the vaccine in 12 to 15 year olds do not outweigh the benefits and did not recommend vaccination for the age group across the board. It remains a parent's choice, and given the risks, only one dose is allowed for this age group should a parent accept to vaccinate their child aged 12 and up. It should remain a parent's choice here. We lack the long-term safety data to, for such a mandate. I am pro-choice, and I implore you to please vote no to ask the Board of, Trust, the Board of Health to issue a vaccine mandate for our school children. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is uh, Antonio Pagan. Uh, good night. Uh, my name is Antonio Pagan. I'm the Chief Information Officer for the City of Northampton. And I work with uh, Northampton Public Schools as a, a technology leader. I'm here to speak on behalf of uh, the ratification of the contract for Dr. Provost uh, in order to uh, give some context to my words, I want to mention that I consider myself an educator. Most people know me as a technology manager, but I started as a, a technology teacher in, in the mid eighties in Puerto Rico. And I have taught in many institutions uh, throughout um, you know, my, my country, my island and, and Massachusetts. And also um, throughout my career, when I worked with the collaborative, I had to work with 33 superintendents on technology projects. And in a previous job, I actually worked with about 80 superintendents uh, throughout Massachusetts. So I do have uh, a good reference point when I'm going to talk about the leadership that we have in the superintendent's office in Northampton Public Schools is actually the second to none, I would say, in Massachusetts. There is no one other superintendent I have met with all respect that I have to superintendents that have the leadership that, that we have in our district is not only uh, a person that has uh, a very innovative uh, mindset and that works mm -hmm. on uh, always looking for the best ways of, of doing things. He is a person that listens actively all the time. He has respect for all stakeholders in our community, not only uh, educators and school committee members, but every uh, caregiver in the community. You can see that on every action that he takes. Uh, he is a very political aware person, one of the most that I have met, but he's never influenced by uh, political uh, uh, pre pressure. And also uh, 
as many people have mentioned today, is always available for the staff. It doesn't matter whether it is Sunday night, Saturday day, it doesn't matter what day of the week, it's always there. And I have to say, he is very demanding uh, as a peer because I actually report to the mayor, not to the superintendent. I am a peer of the superintendent. He can call me anytime, day or night, and he does, because he always is looking for the best of the kids. And he doesn't care if he's disrupting somebody's life in order to get what is needed for the kids. And that is something that a leader has to be able to do it himself in order to demand from others. So I'm pretty sure that um, Northampton has had many superintendents. I have worked with many of them during my seven years in, in the collaborative. Uh, but Northampton has not had another superintendent that is as dedicated as uh, John Provost, um, in my opinion. And I have a reference on many other superintendents in two states. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Antonio. Um, the next person whose hand is raised is uh, Jody Shaw. Jody, if you can unmute yourself and just let us know where you live. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, Jody Shaw. I live at 197 North Elm Street. Um, and I oppose the imposition of COVID-19 vaccines for students in Northampton Public Schools. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Both myself and my two children have received all of the standard vaccines found on the childhood vaccine schedule, all of which over the course of many years have proven not only to be safe, but unlike the COVID-19 vaccine, 100% effective at preventing the illnesses they target and the transmission of said illnesses. So first off, this virus does not pose a risk to children. It's very, very low. Um, according to the same New York Times article that Emily quoted earlier, published this week, children under 12 appear to be at less risk than vaccinated people in their 40s, if not 30s. For children without a serious medical condition, the dangers of severe COVID is so low as to be difficult to quantify. And the risk of long COVID is very low. There is not scientific consensus about vaccinating children like there is about adults. And it remains unclear how many countries will recommend the vaccine for young children, um, let alone mandate it. Um, there are several countries all over the world who have access to the very same data that we do, who have come to very different conclusions, and many of them not man mandating this vaccine. Uh, October 8th, Reuters. The Delta variant of the coronavirus does not appear to cause more se severe disease in children than earlier forms of the virus. End quote. Children are more likely to get seriously ill from the flu than this virus, and we do not mandate the flu vaccine. Um, I just want to respond to an earlier speaker, Angela. She said the, that the only way to um, defeat this virus is to have everyone vaccinated. This virus is endemic. It's here to stay. And the sooner we accept that, um, the so and the sooner we accept there's not a one size fits all solution to this, the sooner we'll be able to confront this um, and as a community. So now let's talk about the dangers. Uh, physicians, immunologists, and virologists around the world are increasingly speaking out about the dangers of this vaccine that they've either witnessed firsthand or in the course of their um, research. Um, I want to remind everybody, phase three trials for this vaccine are not complete until 2023. According to the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, as displayed on the CDC website, there have now been 56,000 adverse events, including 15,000 deaths. The number of adverse events reported now exceeds those of all other vaccines in the world in history combined. And when I say adverse events, I'm talking about things like heart attack, stroke, paralysis, blindness, Guillain-Barre syndrome, myocarditis, et cetera, et cetera. This is not a standard vaccine. There is still a lot we don't know about it. This is not the bubonic plague. It's a virus with an infection mortality rate of less than 0.05% for most of the population and close to zero for children. And that's who we are talking about, our children. I want to remind the, ch the council that our standards for mandating a novel injection for a novel virus must be very, very high when we are talking about children. I do not believe we have met those standards. I urge the city council to take a watch and wait stance and above all, to do no harm. And I also want to remind everybody here that, um, 
as children become eligible means when children, when this it's supposedly approved for ages five to 12, that means children as young as five will be mandated to get this vaccine if you, if you pass this resolution. So please don't do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shaw. Uh, the next person whose hand is raised is Principal uh, Desmond Caldwell. Principal Caldwell, do you want to go ahead and unmute? Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Desmond Caldwell. I am the proud principal of JFK Middle School. Um, I'm here tonight to share my support for Superintendent John Provost. Um, I want to start by saying that I don't enjoy speaking under such circumstances or sharing personal information, um, but here I am. Uh, last year, I unexpectedly ended up in the national spotlight. Um, many people try their hardest to go viral, um, but I promise you it's not fun. Um, someday I may share all of the hate mail um, and share the conversations I had to have with my six-year-old. Um, there's a reason that I refuse to stay and work beyond a certain time. Um, and a lot of people think it's because I am um, keeping work uh, home life boundaries. Um, when the fact is that I need to be home to tuck my child in at night or he thinks the bad people got me. Um, in short, last year was a tough year for a lot of reasons, um, but one of those reasons was unique for me. Um, I was urged to resign numerous times by family and friends. Uh, I was offered uh, several other jobs. Uh, I'm still here because of my commitment to your children and the support of Dr. John Provost. Uh, I've worked in three states for five school districts and nine superintendents, and none of them, zero, have shown me the courtesy, care, respect, support, or mentorship that Dr. Provost has shown me. I promise I would not still be here if not for John Provost. He's truly a servant leader. I've never felt more seen, respected, trusted, consulted, or valued professionally. Uh, when I decided to stand up to hate last year, I didn't need support from my superintendent. That's who I am. I didn't need help to make that choice. But John supported me. John knew the fight that was ahead of us. He knew the fight that would ensue, but he backed me the entire way. The fact that I'm here is a testament to John's support. The principals in this district are tasked with leading our respective schools. We should be an important data point for your decisions. Our opinions should matter. We are not afraid of change, far from it. We deal with change on a daily basis. We are change agents. However, a change of superintendent, especially at this critical time, would be a colossal mistake. We are lucky to have Dr. P. We even forgive him for being a Yankees fan. Please vote to ratify Superintendent Provo's contract. Thank you. Thank you, Principal Caldwell. The next person whose hand is raised, uh, Lori. Lori, if you can go ahead and unmute. Hi, good evening, thank you. I am Lori Valancourt and the principal of Northampton High School. And tonight I join my colleagues in requesting that Dr. Provost's contract be renewed. I'm asking that this committee commit themselves to um, the data-driven decision-making that all of the leaders in this school have also been asked to do. And in this case, it is the evaluation process, which reflects our superintendent as proficient and exemplary. I'm requesting that this committee recognize that this is not a time for change. Following a pandemic, it is a time for consistency. It is a time for stability. This is not a time to add additional stress and change to the district that is feeling like we are already flailing and seeking routines and consistency. This is not a time to adjust to new leadership. It's a time for us to lift the vision that drives the district improvement plan and this school committee and our superintendent have developed that together. 
I'm asking you to respect that this is not a time to change. It is a time to come together. It is a time to work together and it is a time to lead together. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. The, uh, let's see, um, there are no other hands raised um, for uh, public comment. Um, so I will then um, return back to the agenda for the evening. Um, we have a, uh, first I'll turn to see if there are any announcements from members of the school committee. Are there any announcements that school committee members have? Okay, I'm not seeing, oh, uh, Member Gold. Um, I, first announcement is, uh, thank you, is just, I don't want to make sure, maybe it's going to come up later in the agenda, sorry if I'm uh, saying it earlier than it's supposed to be up there, but I um, want to make sure the public is aware of um, the efforts by the district to provide written video messaging concerning the anti-discrimination policies uh, within the district. Um, recently, a video was uh, shared where uh, Dr. Provost um, interviewed or was interviewed by two students about our policies and it's a public video highly recommend folks watching it um so if you haven't had a chance to see it yet um you know it's a short 15 or so minute video i really appreciated it and helped me as a school committee member better understand our policy so uh, that's one announcement um and the second one is just a little bit of a clarification uh mayor and i don't know if it, you know help me phrase this the right way but there was a suggestion and during the public comment just now that we are considering non-renewal of the superintendent's contract. And I just wanna clarify that we actually have a vote to ratify the contract. At the last meeting, we voted to give you authority to enter into the contract negotiations. So I just didn't want the public to think that we're voting um, to uh, not to do the contract piece. It's a little bit different. So just trying to clarify that for the public because I didn't want them to think we're voting to, for non-renewal at this time. Okay, thank you. Is there any other announcements from the school committee? Okay, um, hearing none, I will move then to our um, recommended actions item four, which is our consent agenda. Um, we have one set of minutes on the consent agenda this evening. Uh, they are the minutes of June 10th, 2021. Um, and I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded. Um, Member Goldman, you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, I didn't have a chance to review the um, meeting notes, and so I won't be able to um, vote one vote to approve them at this time. I I don't know. Okay. That's, thank you yeah. for announcing that. So we'll, uh, your abstention is duly noted. Um, is there any other questions or comments about the uh, minutes or the consent agenda? Hearing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman, I'll note your abstention. Thank you. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. And Member Busanski? Yes. The vote is eight in favor, one abstention. Okay, so the uh, consent agenda is adopted. Um, the next item on the agenda is our reports and recommendations, um, item five. Um, and the first item, item A, is a report from our rules and policy committee. Um, I, so that would be, um, is member, has member Fallon joined us? Uh, member Lee, member. Are you giving that report? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Member Fallon apologizes for having to be late to this meeting. She is doing a law school thing. Um, the uh, report from our subcommittee is that we've got our next meeting scheduled. Um, 
And the agenda items are the anti-bias and hate speech policy, as well as the pesticide policy. So we'll be discussing both of those. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Member Levy, for that report. Um, the next committee is the Budget and Property Committee, and Member Busansky, is there a report from the Budget and Property Committee? Thank you. Uh, we have not met since the last meeting. Our next meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, October 26th at 4.30 p.m., and it is open to the public and will be posted as so. Um, we'll be discussing the October... Um, mm -hmm. Um, Gold had mentioned before update and um, we're the, to be honest, the agenda is still in formation. So there could be a couple other things on it. Thanks. Thank you, member Busansky. Um, now we'll move to the uh, superintendent evaluation committee. Um, member Condon, is there any report from that committee this evening? Uh, uh, similarly, we have no uh, update uh, other than we will be meeting next Wednesday uh, at 5 p.m. to uh, get a first look at uh, Superintendent Provost's goals for the upcoming year, um, as well as establish some future meeting dates uh, to move the process forward. Thank you, Member Condon. The next item on the agenda is the um, Business Administrator's Report, uh, followed by the Personnel Report. And I'll turn to uh, the Business Administrator, Nick Bernier, for that report. Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> in the uh, packet, was, uh, it included the um, current FY22 Appropriation Report, uh, which is basically uh, just our year-to-date budget report um, through October 6th, 2021 is when I uh, printed that. Um, you'll notice that more of the appropriation has been spent uh, than in the previous months, um, and that's because school has started and payrolls are now now hitting that. So um, you'll see that change a lot more as, as the months go on than they did um, in July and August. Um, <clears throat> I'm currently continuing to prepare needed transfers um, while monitoring the spending of our appropriation funds, um, along with our federal COVID grants. Um, at this time, uh, I guess this is a good segue to item number two. Um, the ESSER three grant application was submitted last Monday. Um, <clears throat> in this nearly $3.4 million proposal, I included allocations for support slash tutoring for students, um, technology replenishment, um, PD, um, and also outdoor dining slash learning spaces. Um, among many other things, um, the, the list was quite extensive um, in the, the report, or the sorry, the proposal that I submitted. Um, <clears throat> we received input along the way from nine different groups of stakeholders um, and took unfinished learning and needs of students who were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic into particular focus while developing this proposal. Um, well, I'm the actual one who submits it into the state website. Um, there's the, the I in no way, shape, or form did this by myself. I worked closely with many people um, to develop a spending plan that was going to be the most impactful um, that it possibly could as, as we continue to recover from the pandemic. Um, I'm currently still waiting uh, approval from DESE. There, there's a, a pretty big log jam of grant applications sitting in there. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I went to a MASBO uh, event for business managers, and at the time, I, I'd heard there was uh, some people that submitted their proposals in August that hadn't heard yet. So uh, it may be a little bit of time before um, we hear if the proposal's been accepted or if there's anything I need to do to, to change it. Sometimes that happens. Um, <clears throat> But there um, is still plenty of ESSER 2 and um, even some ESSER 1 money left right now. So it's, it's okay that we have to wait a little time to get that um, approved. Uh, that won't be a problem at all. And, and you know, we're able to move forward with the spending plans for those two grants um, as they were submitted previously. Um, <clears throat> a more detailed spending plan for our ESSER 3 money will be developed during our FY23 budget process, similar to the ESSER 2. Um, spending plan that was in this, uh, this current year's budget book. Um, <clears throat> next item, um, I'm currently in the process of collecting median salary data from the area. 
in preparation for upcoming um, bargaining and negotiations for a new uh, collective bargaining agreement as our current one will expire at the end of, of this fiscal year. Um, so that's that's kind of the starting point of that, that process, um, at least on, on our end. Um, number four, uh, during the month of September, one gift was received, uh, which was valued at less than $1,000. Um, it was a $75 gift card to downtown Sounds uh, that is to be used to support the music program at Bridge Street School. Uh, this was donated by uh, Maxine Schmidt and um, was approved by Dr. Provost. Um, so we, we thank her very much for that donation. Um, and lastly, um, also included is the one bill warrant that um, Member Fallon approved during September of 2021. Uh, normally there's two bill warrants, but um, at the time during September when the next, uh, the second bill warrant would have been done, um, our accounting and personnel system was shut down for two days um, because they have to start the new fiscal year in it. Um, and turn everything over and do all kind of things that I don't begin to understand. So uh, that shuts it down for a couple of days. We're not able to go in it at all. So there was only one bill warrant for uh, September, but it's, it is in your pack. Um, so that is my um, financial report. Um, I see that member Voss has a question. Thank you. And thank you for your report. I do have a question. I'm really glad that you're starting to look into the median salaries in anticipation of using that data next year. And the question is just um, one thing I learned last time was the salaries that are, say, listed on the DESE website are quite out of date by a couple of years. And so are you able to um, get more current ones or how are you handling that? Uh, yes, I, I am. Um, <clears throat> basically, the, the way we, we do that is to reach out to folks from other districts so we could get their, their data. Um, we're actually getting some help with this. A um, uh, superintendent from another district actually volunteered to put together um, pretty much a compendium of, of surrounding communities with their current data. So yes, that will be much more current than what's on the desk. And, and thank you, that's fantastic. I think another piece of information that could be really important to go with that would be some sort of, I don't know exactly what the metric is, but median like years in teaching or you know some way of judging a median salary. Are, you, are we comparing it to the same um, level in our district? Because some small districts might have you know, more beginning or more, um, teachers at the beginning of their careers or ones that have been there for a long time and that can really affect those medians as well. Yeah, the, um, you know, in, in different um, towns and, and municipalities also have different numbers of steps in different grades um, in their salary scales as well. So, you know, sometimes it's impossible to compare apples to apples there. Um, generally, the way that, that, that it's done is you'll get the lowest salary for each grade the you know say about the middle whatever depending on how many steps you have and then the highest for that grade so you would look at bachelors you'd look at masters masters plus 30 and so on and, and kind of get your data points that way um you know once that's all done and we get deeper into the process um that's you know when i can really look at our own individual employees and you know determine how many are, are at each point in the, you know, our salary scale, which would give me a way more accurate number of, you know, what salaries could cost next year. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Of course. Member Gold. Um, yeah, just to add, since it's part of the process and maybe it's efficient as well as Member Voss was saying, um, finding out um, when they're doing that compendium, the length of the school day, and so how many, you know, salary relative to how many hours are worked daily um, and like the school day would be helpful. Yeah, that's something that I believe gets looked at when you're looking at hourly employees, um, you know, because their per hour rate, of course, is going to be different if they work different numbers of hours than in a different district. Um, I, I don't have complete data at this point. We're very early in the, in the process. Um, but that which I had, I actually did do a little bit of looking at at the hourly rates of of different, um, you know, staff members from different districts, and 
it seemed, you know, at least in what I looked at, and granted, it's nowhere near an exhaustive amount um, at this point. It, it's the school day lengths were similar. The couple I looked at, I believe, had like 10 minute variations, you know, in either direction. It wasn't anything huge in terms of amount of hours worked during the day. Any other questions for uh, the business administrator? Okay, Nick, do you wanna go on to the personnel report? Sure. Um, so you have in your packet the September 2021 personnel report. Um, there's quite a few new hires as you can see there. Um, <clears throat> a lot of ESPs. So we're, um, we're starting to fill some of the vacancies that, that we had um, that we discussed last uh, meeting. Um, we had five transfers as well during the month of people just moving from one position to another uh, within the district. Um, and then you see one position increase, which we had discussed at the September meeting as well. Um, for separations, there were six during the course of the month. Um, we had uh, one, or sorry, two retirements. Um, one individual took a position elsewhere. Um, and then the other three were unknowns. Um, you know, just no reason that I know about it all. Um, you know, demographic wise, um, the month of September um, in terms of separations, 67% um, of those that left were female, 33% were male, 83% um, were uh, identified as Caucasian. Um, and 17% or one of the separations um, identified as black. Um, uh, at the last meeting, I was asked to look at like year to date demographics in terms of separations, not just, um, you know, for the month. Um, so I, I did that. Um, so year to date, um, pretty much since uh, I've been doing this since I've been on board, um, we've had 27 separations. That does not include the many that happened in June there that we discussed at the July meeting. I kind of consider those to be FY21 separations because they happened at the end of last school year. Um, but this is from July up to September. Um, we had 27 separations. 70.4% um, were female, 29.6% male, 85.2% uh, Caucasian, 7.4% Black, 3.7% Asian, uh, and 3.7% or um, one individual identified as white and Hispanic. Um, so I, I did look at the demographics on a more longitudinal basis there. Um, <clears throat> you know, for the most part, they seem to be in line with our, our staff demographics as I, I saw them on the Jesse website. Um, which I, I referenced um, at the beginning of when I started doing this. Um, Desi has not updated this for this year just yet. Um, that must be forthcoming soon. It'll be based on the, the EPIMS reporting that um, gets given to the state uh, anytime now. So we should have that, I would hope, within the next month. Um, I believe based on hiring, at least, you know, the hiring that I've seen come across my desk that uh, the staff will look um, more diverse than it, it did last year. Um, so that's, um, that's my personnel report for the month of September. Member Levy, you have your hand up. Thanks. Thanks so much for the report, Nick, and I really appreciate you listening to our um, our hopes for the kind of data that we might get and, and responding so, so swiftly. Uh, you actually touched on, I have a few questions and you touched on them. Um, one was, it would be really helpful to see the data next to the demographic data of our staff. And I wonder if, if um, it, you know, I, I hear you that it's, looks close to you, but I, if there's a way to like put it side by side for us to see, that would be really helpful. Um, and then the other piece was, uh, I was gonna ask about the demographics of our new hires. And I wonder if that's something that, I, I don't know if we collect demographics of our staff when we hire them. It sounds like we are waiting for Desi to collect that information. And I'm wondering how 
if we collected and if not, why not? And can we start? Well, we do collect it. Well, the HR department more or less collects it. When you um, get hired, you um, go to the HR department and fill out quite a bit of paperwork, um, including um, some information about your, your own demographic data and identity. Um, and okay. that is, um, Desi gets it from us. Um, okay. So Got similar it. similar to the SIMS data that has to be reported um, about students, um, there's uh, what's called EPIMS data, which is really staff data. Um, and in that is includes some demographic information, licensure, that kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of how Desi, um, you know, gets their info about staff. So they, they are getting it from us. Okay, great. So then we should be able to go in and pull out the, the demographics of our new hires, as well as the demographics of our current staff, as they might, so that we can compare those to the folks who have, who have separated? Yeah, that, that's, that's doable. Great. And then I think, and I'm sorry if I'm not remembering, uh, I thought we had asked if you could put together not just a, a year to date, but a five year um, tally of separations. Uh, is that something that did I, am I making this up that I thought we had talked about this? If not, is it, I, I hate to keep asking you to go back and do more and more and more. Uh, but I think that would be helpful and something that we could just continually update. That would have to be something I would have to get from HR. We did talk about that at the last meeting, so you're not making that up. Um, okay. It would just, they would have that information. Um, I, I I don't believe I could go back far enough in the system to get all of that, um, but it would also require probably some bandwidth on their behalf as well. Like, I don't know how easy that would be for them to do, but it's certainly a conversation that I could have. That'd be great. And um, I do recall now when you say HR that, that that's what you said last time around. And I, um, if there is somebody in HR who's able to put that together and then maintain that report as one that can be regularly reported or annually reported to the school committee, I think that would be really helpful. I can have a conversation and just see what the feasibility of, of getting that would be and you know what, what that would entail and everything. But you know, I, I do agree that you know once that's established, you know, continuing to maintain it is important because if you don't, then you can't analyze it and and make decisions based off it or or you know problem solve if you feel you need to or you know you can't do anything with it if it doesn't get maintained. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Member Gold. Um yeah thanks Nick I was wondering, did did you share if we how many vacancies we still have and if you don't have that today no worries you know I can get that to you tomorrow I apologize for that it was something I wanted to do and then I got carried away working on the capital um no worries. proposals no. that we're going to be doing later on tonight so um and and also it, it Unfortunately, the vacancies can vary from day to day. You know, you could get a, um, you could get somebody to resign on the fly and, and, you know, so if I actually put the vacancies on the personnel report, um, like when it's printed and given to you, it might not necessarily reflect what's actually there when we have the meeting. But um, yeah, I can, um, I can easily look that up and get that info to you. Okay. And, and you don't have to do it tomorrow. Like if you want to, yeah. If it, if it isn't reasonable to get, don't worry about it. We can oh, it's reasonable. For the next, it's not yeah. hard to get at all. Okay, cool. But I mean, like, yeah, if it, if it doesn't make sense to do it, you know, I'm down. Yeah. But if maybe next meeting, fine too. Thanks. Absolutely. Any other questions for the business administrator? Okay. Thank you so much, Nick, as always. Um, and now we'll move on to item F on the uh, agenda, which is superintendent's report. And I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Provost. Thank you, Mayor Narkowitz. Before I get into my report, I just wanna take a moment to thank everybody who spoke during public comment tonight. It's, um, often, it's often remarked that one of the tragedies of human life is that you are not able to be an active participant or even conscious at your own wake, because um, that's when people say the good things about you. I feel like tonight I was able to hear um, 
what might be said at my wake. And so that's an experience that I'll take forward with me for the rest of my life. I thank everyone who um, who contributed to that. I also thank those of you who embedded criticisms within your um, endorsements of me, which I'm truly am guilty of. My only fear after hearing that is that at my actual wake, any of you who survived me may attempt to bury me for all of eternity with a Red Sox cap, um, which I suppose would be a fitting, um, a fitting punishment for my sins. So anyways, with that being said, I will um, move forward to the more formal part of my report and I will begin sharing my screen. So you'll recognize this from our district improvement plan. This is the goal two page. I'm calling your attention to the last objective in the systemic policies and practices column. I have some really exciting to news to share about the progress towards the district improvement objective circled here, which is communicating our existing policies to caregivers and protocols for managing situation when students experience a microaggression or racism, sexism, or transphobia. The exciting part is not the 40 page summary of the district's anti discrimination policies that everyone received in their emails this week. The real exciting part is the opportunity to engage with students. As Member Gold mentioned uh, earlier this week, we do have our first video up, which is the companion piece to the memo that went out earlier this week. This is a shot from the first episode of that companion series, which we launched at students suggestion to support a better understanding of the district's anti-discrimination policies. I'm realistic about the public appetite for a long policy document, but I'm already up to 250 views of episode one, which makes me feel that we're having an impact. This week, I had the pleasure of taping episode two, in which we explore policy ACA, non-discrimination on the basis of sex. My guests this week were JFK Middle School students, Amelia Durbin and Zara Usman. The episode should drop next week, so like it on Facebook and subscribe to the channel. With the formation of the District Family Action Team, we've also taken a huge step forward to the DIP objective from Goal 3, the first one in the Caregiver and Student Engagement column, which is uh, to engage caregivers, students, and the community members with a formal ongoing feedback mechanism to identify issues and concerns that creates differentiated opportunities for family voice and engagement. So let me talk about how we're doing that. And I wanna thank Lauren Berry for the next slides I'll be sharing with you um, because some of these uh, are borrowed from her. So I think there may be two, yeah. So the district family action team is something the ALT team has been developing as part of their work with Black Print in the DESI Culturally Responsive Leadership Practices Academy, which is a three-year-long professional development experience that all members of the district administrative team are engaged in with colleagues across the state. We're currently in year two, and at this point in the process, our goal is to bring forward a culturally responsive leadership model that can be shared with other districts at a showcase later on this year or early next year. So this is a multi-part plan, as you may recall from the DIP, DIP implementation guide with metrics. The plan for this year is for the district to establish and sustain a district action team made up of family engagement leaders and community partners to strengthen engagement efforts and provide resources to support educators and families in the district. And that is to become a model for the work and a support for the work next year, which will be for each of the schools to establish and sustain school family action teams. Um, so the district action team will collaborate with the FSE coordinator to deepen their understanding of the strengthening partnerships framework and family engagement and fundamentals tool. That's a resource we're using to guide this work. Um, the 
DAT will be made up of NPS staff and community members whose family engagement support spans the six schools. The DAT will collaborate to identify areas of their work that need strengthening or sustaining and provide resources to support educators and family partnerships in the district. And DAT meetings will be facilitated by our FSE coordinator and the group will meet throughout the school year. So we had our first meeting um, last week. The district action team could include, but not be limited to the FSE coordinator, district social workers, school registrar, early childhood staff, student services, community workers, clerical staff, the superintendent, the real coordinator, Title I coordinator, and focus program coordinator. We had most um, of these roles represented at our kickoff meeting last week. Um, our goal as a district leadership group is uh, to support family engagement efforts for our schools and faculty. We feel it's imperative to build resources for them and model practices for them. We'll su um, support the goal by um, utilizing school-based family engagement assessment data to build capacity of staff and, and schools in the district, by advocating for district partnerships with uh, uh, district partnership personnel and resources and supporting and participating in the school-based partnership teams to be developed next year. So let me close with two quick updates that are not directly related to the district improvement plan. I wanna to talk to you about the superintendent's health and safety advisory committee and childcare. I'm pleased to announce that we have hired Gabrielle Hollander is our child care coordinator. She's in the process of setting up training for our early bird and late bird staff and developing the policies we need to submit to obtain state approval for the program. From the Health Advisory Committee, I'd like to share that we're seeing a, a definite downward trend in disease identification rates, both in our community and regionally. I know many in our community want the implementation of test and stay to begin as soon as possible, and that is our ultimate goal. We still feel we need to get pooled testing and, systemat and symptomatic testing working first. As you know, I've been a strong advocate for additional resources for pooled testing in our district. I'd like to acknowledge the work that CIC Health has done to increase staffing in the past two weeks. I'd also like to thank the commissioner and governor for prioritizing Northampton for additional testing support from the National Guard while CIC continues to build its workforce. But even with all of this, we've not begun to conduct double swab pool testing. And I think that double swab will be a significant step forward because it'll allow us to con conduct contact tracing more efficiently. We are probably at least two weeks away from having the staff needed to implement double swabbing because the double swab takes about twice as long as a single swab. Um, we, I think I'm getting Zoom bombed here. So let me stop the share. Um, probably uh, still two weeks away from implementing the double swab testing. As I was saying, we need more staff because it takes twice as long. Um, but with all these things being said, we are definitely getting better and better at testing every week. Database issues are being resolved, more testers are coming online, and the productivity of testers is increasing as they gain more experience. So good things are happening and even better things lie ahead in the area of our health and safety protocols. And that's my report for this month. Thank you, Dr. Provost. Um, okay, um, sorry, I just have to switch back to my agenda here. So um, next we move on to uh, the new business uh, portion of our agenda, that would be item seven. Um, and uh, we have on the first order of Business is the student representative report, um, and Lila Niels Duffy uh, is our student representative. Um, Lila, are you still with us? I'm not. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, excellent! Great. Sorry, um, too many too many screens to look for. So, uh, please proceed with your report. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lila. Um, I'm the student union representative to the school committee for this coming year. Um, I'm a tenth grader at Northampton High School. Um, and I'll just be 
I'll just be presenting to you a little bit. So um, just a brief um, overview of what the student union's been doing. We just elected our cabinet um, for treasurer. We got Jake Fine. Um, the chair is gonna be Kamini Waldman. The vice chair is gonna be Tolly Serlin. And our uh, secretary is Eloise. Um, so yeah, we also just formed our subcommittees for this year. Um, we have a lot of subcommittees um, going on right now. We have an anti-racism and bias subcommittee that's going on from last year uh, that presented a little bit in the meeting before this one. Um, the lending library subcommittee, uh, a mental health subcommittee, an athlete subcommittee for athletes to help um, each other through missing classes because of the late start time. Um, a wellness subcommittee to try to look over the wellness curriculum and see how we can improve it if we want to. Um, a fundraising subcommittee um, for our grants and um, a subcommittee to deal with the unsafe intersection in front of the school. Um, as you all know, I'm sure there was a um, kind of tragic incident earlier this week or last week, I think. Um, and so I know that th that's also being dealt with, dealt with by the city. Um, and a constitution amendment subcommittee to amend our constitution. The student union constitution is pretty old. So uh, there are a lot of student union members that want to update it. Um, a flex block and start time subcommittee to deal with these recent changes um, and see how students are feeling about them. And a survey subcommittee, which is just kind of writing and sending out a survey to the student body to poll students on different issues. Um, and influence what we're gonna be doing this year. Um, so some things that have been going on at NHS uh, this year is that this week is booster week. Um, I believe on Monday, each grade did a different theme. There was a rock and roll theme, an Olympians theme, a Cowboys theme and an out of this world theme. Uh, there, was some, there was an issue with, with uh, this booster week um, that at one point the, the plan was for a grade to dress up as founding fathers. Um, which a lot of uh, students, particularly students of color, um, found problematic and kind of harmful to them because of the um, harm that founding fathers did um, against the black community and slave and were slaveholders and all of that. Um, but that was that was changed to the rock and roll and et cetera theme. Um, I believe yesterday we took the PSATs. Um, so a lot of sophomores and juniors did the, the prerequisite to the SAT and the practice SAT. Um, and that was a big, a big thing in the school. Um, last week, I think the Northampton High School team played the Amherst football team. Uh, it was called the Battle of the Bridge and Northampton won 42 to nothing. So that was very exciting. And the last thing is that the musical is going on and it's they're holding auditions um, in a few weeks, I think. And so there are posters all over the school about that. Um, yeah, I think that's the end of my report. Just a quick update on what's going on at the high school. Thank you so much, Lila. We appreciate it. Um, there's Member Levy, you have your hand up. I have a really important question. What is the musical? That's a great question. The musical is Mamma Mia. Okay, all you ABBA fans out there. Um, any other questions for our student representative? Okay, thank you so much again. Um, we'll now move on to um, item B under new business, and that is a report on the special education audit. Um, and uh, Director Plummer is here, um, and this was an item that previously been on another agenda that got uh, moved to this agenda. So I'll turn it over to you, uh, Pam, to give the report. Sure, and for my colleagues who know me, I'm super distracted now that we were just talking about the school musical and how excited I am that it's back. I will just say that's very exciting news. Um, so I definitely can't start uh, this presentation tonight without a few sentences supporting what my colleagues shared earlier. I have been incredibly lucky to work with John, the other Dr. P, for the better part of a decade. And I second the eloquent words my colleagues shared tonight. I can't match them. I might be able to sing a song about them, but I can't match their words. 
I'm so glad that despite the very difficult and long days we experienced, John, that you were able to hear those comments made publicly tonight, and I hope they stay in your heart for a long, long time. Um, you're a true servant leader, uh, putting the needs of our community ahead of everything else. You're an exceptional superintendent and a remarkable person, and I'm grateful for your leadership. Um, so I will now start sharing my screen. I'm going to try this. Let's see. Um, hold on. It's coming. All right. Can you see it? I go to the beginning. Can anybody see it? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so for people who just need a little bit more information, um, at our the special education um, audit and, and we had some civil rights um, standards that were embedded into this particular audit or tiered focus mod review, they call it now, um, is every three years. Our process was delayed a little bit because of COVID. Um, this is my fifth year. So when I had first started, we were in the middle of a, of a review. At that time, the review um, resulted in five findings and this time we had one finding. So that's a tremendous amount of progress um, in, in the period of time that we had just experienced. Um, I do wanna say that um, I'm incredibly grateful for the work that was accomplished by our teams, particularly since March of 2020. Um, in my professional career, I've never been prouder of anything than how our teams collaborated with each other last year and with families um, since the start of COVID to ensure that everyone was safe, cared for, and that students were getting the services they needed to the best extent possible. The fact that our department was found out of compliance for only one standard at a time when the education system was in upheaval is a remarkable testament to the work that was done by our teams. I really couldn't be prouder. Um, and with that said, I know we have work to do. Um, it's a really hard fact that even when we felt like we were working our hardest, we still weren't able to maintain deadlines for the evaluation process for all students. But I am confident that we can improve our practices through some of the steps I'll mention in this brief presentation tonight. So I'm trying to turn my page and I can't, <laughs> here we go. All right, so first um, we have, I'm just including, I'm just gonna turn off my, I'm trying to read off of two things, here we go. So you can see that the first slide right here, nope. There we go. It's This is the list. We had uh, over 30 indicators that we were responsible for. You can see that um, I'll just, I'm just listing them here and then I'll describe the process a little bit later. But things they look at are a process for um, looking at requirements for students with autism, looking at our timeline determ eligibility determination, um, looking at our process for doing independent evals or re-evals or assessments were are properly selected keep trying to change the page and it's very slow, so hold on. Um, the second set of standards is right there. It's um, really looking at uh, transition, um, everything from how we do our progress reports, which was actually an area that was indicated three years ago um, as an area of concern, um, how we look at the least restrictive environment, how we include caregivers in our um, participation. And we also look at, um, I went backwards. This is terrible. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm scrolling to the right and it's not going to the right. So something's going wrong. I don't know what to do here. Hold on. All right, I don't know what's happening. Let me drive one more time and then I'll just read to you if I have to, but this is, here we go. There's sometimes a lag I know with PowerPoint. Yeah. So sometimes you hit twice inadvertently. So I'm not sure. It works when I touch my mouse pad slightly, but when I touch it to the, <laughs> How about the arrow? Here I go. I've got it. 
the left side of my mouse pad is working well. And uh, oh Lord. Okay, so I here's the most important part. We were found in compliance um, for everything. Um, we had three indicators, which is actually part of the year. It requires you to collect even more information. Um, so one of them was a transition indicator that was highlighted in the previous slides. The others were indicators 11 and 12. Um, one of those relates to timelines and the other relates to eligibility from when students are identified from, um, from reach. So up to age three to the tra their transition to our preschool programming, that timeline. Um, and ultimately we had, I'll, I'll explain the process we went through for that, but at the end of all of it, we were found out of compliance for one area, which is special ed criterion nine, which was found to be partially implemented. Um, so the timeline for determinant of eligibility within 45 school working days after receipt of the parent's written consent to an initial evaluation or reevaluation, the school district determines whether the student is eligible for special education. Student record review and interviews indicated that the district did not consistently provide the parents with a proposed IEP and proposed placement along with the required notice of proposed school district action within 45 days from the time consent for evaluation was received. So I just want to bring us back to the timeline of this. Um, so in back in November of 2019, which was the November before COVID started, I participated in a training about um, the data collection that was going to be happening in the spring of 2020. Um, we all know the spring of 2020 was very different from what we thought we were going to experience. The indicator 11 data collection a window was October 1st through December 31st, 2019. And that was the consent received for initial evals. Indicator 12 data collection window, which was around our EI transition timeline was January 1st to March 31st of 2020. Um, March 17th through April 6th, 2020, we had a pause in evaluation timelines. We had a pause in almost everything in the world. Um, our special education timelines though did resume April 7th, 2020, despite the fact that we were all remote and working from home um, and schools were closed. Uh, annual, we prioritized at the time annual reviews, so we made sure we can do any meetings that didn't involve actual testing, if possible, we started those up right away. And we made sure that we uh, postponed initials and reevaluations. We actually did start doing some remote assessments. Some of our incredibly skilled providers started um, doing remote evaluations. On, I just like this data point, on April 15th, uh, our first Northampton Public Schools IEP was actually accepted via email. Um, and at that point, we're we were really trying to start prioritizing our initial and reevaluation meetings that had been postponed. Um, and those where testing was complete was a priority. In the summer, we started a combination of in-person and remote summer programming. Um, it shifted our due dates for our self-assessment and our indicators. Um, and we completed a lot of that work in the summer. We uploaded all of our self-assessment documents in the fall of 2020 when we were all trying to figure out how the school year was beginning. Um, and we began with Ernest really completing evaluations that had been delayed from the spring of 2020. Uh, in December of 2020, we received a non-compliance letter from DESE for indicators 11 and 12, which was the timelines for the transition from early, uh, the, the REACH uh, transitions, and um, also our timelines for evaluations and we submitted a correction, corrective action plan. We received closure letters for both of those in May and June of 2021. And in May of 2021, we actually had our on-site TFM. We were going to have it earlier where we actually have members from DESE come and review our review piles of documents and interview our faculty and, and caregivers um, that actually got postponed because we um, had hoped we could at least wait until people had vaccines because we needed to be able to invite people into our, our spaces. Um, so when they did come, they did record reviews, caregiver surveys. There was a PAC meeting, a parent advisory committee meeting and interview, an educator, administrator, educator and administrator interviews and caregiver interviews as requested. Um, so in terms of the one area where we were found non-compliant, um, Desi is very clear that there, if you're not able to have, if you're not able to get an IEP to the family by the 45th day, there are allowable reasons, which include parent, a parent scheduling needs. So in case the parent needed to reschedule a meeting, if the evaluation was extended with signed parental consent, if a student was ill, if there was a parent delay in returning consent, 
if there's a school closure because, because of weather, if we got a late referral from EI, um, or we don't have enough time for an evaluation at the end of the year. Um, reasons for delay not allowed, district scheduling problem, ins insufficient staff availability, lack of qualified staff, and evaluator reports not received on time. So um, as you might anticipate, the, the pieces that factored into ours most prominently were, um, were district scheduling and, and staff availability um, this past year, for sure, were a big challenge. And our, continue to be a challenge this year in that we, when we have meetings, we really need subs to cover the classes so all of the participants can, can be at the meeting. And um, I think you'll see, we'll talk about this later, later tonight, um, we continue to have issues with subs. Um, but certainly, um, we uh, want to be able to pr prioritize these initials and the reeval meetings. I want to point out, I mentioned the tremendous work that our teams did in May and June of 2021 alone, which was about 34 working days, we had 269 team meetings, which is about eight meetings a day across the district, which is quite a lot. Um, and on a, I tried to look back at some longitudinal data. And in previous years, when we've ranged from like 170 to 180 initial evals per year, in the 2021 school year, we did 150, um, uh, 150 initials, which is pre pretty remarkable. Um, given how many challenges we were up against. Um, here's, I mentioned some of the things that were related to our non-compliance findings, certainly illnesses and absences at the time of data collection. We also found that our information system had gotten pretty bogged down and it isn't particularly user-friendly. We spent a lot of time this summer making sure that our data was incredibly clear in the information system. And that's been very helpful in our ability to track um, timelines and monitor um, monitor cases. Um, we've also had some restructuring in early childhood and student services um, in terms of making sure that, um, which we had already identified even prior to um, the audit, uh, there was an increase in the preschool education team leader hours with the sole focus on special education, which is really key. Uh, the restructuring of the EL coordinator position. Um, we also have um, so which has allowed um, me to be able to participate more with um, making sure that we're staying in compliance across the district. We have a dedicated evaluation team at the preschool level, which allows us to have to rely less on our preschool teachers, which makes them have to um, cancel services or, or leave their students. Um, and we also have our early childhood centers instituted weekly, I think they're yeah, pretty sure they're weekly meetings um, with contractors. Um, to make sure that we're really paying attention to the timelines for, um, for EI uh, with Criterion and REACH. We have a new process for monitoring timelines that includes the time it takes to mail things. Um, we have basically a, an alarm system that goes off in our office when an initial and a reeval um, comes through that we're very uh, attendant to. Um, and we also have a process for completing it bilingual evaluations that's more clear. Um, we have a, a much stronger collaboration with our EL coordinator in our new structure. We have an increased number of EL teachers in the district. We use our EL assessments better in order to inform decisions. We have um, a clarified SST process that includes our EL teachers if the student is an English language learner. Um, and we have a more efficient and effective system for referral. We have a contracted Spanish bilingual evaluator that has um, contracted for a number of evals with us. I found out very way after the fact that we were contracting one case at a time, which I hadn't quite realized, which really meant, which meant the person was waiting for an, each individual contract in order to get started. Instead, we started the year by saying, here, please expect to have at least this number of vowels in this fall and we'll, re, we'll look at the contract again in the, um, the spring. So that's allowed us to stick to timelines much more effectively. And we also purchased the bilingual verbal abilities test for all of our schools and psychologists are able to utilize that in order to determine the language that testing needs to occur in. Um, Finally, this is really the last step. Um, we submitted a corrective action plan that was approved and we need to complete the following, which is by October 29th, we have to have trained all of our staff around this particular criterion. And we need to, um, I need to submit um, the sign-in sheets to make, and the agenda from those meetings. 
And then by February 28th, 2022, conduct a review of 20 student records across all grade levels with initial or re-eval team meetings held after September 2021 training was provided for evidence that the caregivers were provided a proposed IEP and proposed placement within 45 school working days after the receipt of the parent's written consent. Um, and we need to submit a spreadsheet to DESE with that information. So that is um, a summary of our audit results and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Director Plummer. Um, are there any questions uh, for uh, Member Goldman? Your hand is up. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Plummer for that, that uh, report. It is, um, congratulations, it's great. One question I had is you were talking about um, that non-compliance was determined for 11 and 12 and that um, previously and that now for them to know that you're in compliance, you're going to submit evidence to DESE. Um, how does DESE find out initially that you're out of compliance? I know it's part of an audit process, but is it also a spreadsheet with dates and numbers or is it is it some other way that that's determined? Sure, so we actually, um, so it's, it's, we only have to submit a corrective action for one at this point. We had already submitted them for two indicators. It's weird, the timing was off because of COVID um, and we were found to be in compliance. And then we, we still have this one for initial and reavals that left, that's left. But every year districts are required to submit um, a specific number of indicator data to DESE. And in this particular previous year, those are, the, those are the ones we needed to submit. They're very, very clear of what you're collecting. So you're looking at every student who turned three between the age, uh, between the months of, of I think it was um, January 1st and March 30th of, of 2021. And you're looking so specifically at the dates everything happened. Um, and you submit that through a smart macro spreadsheet and they then look at it and ask you more questions about the data and then determine if you have to take follow-up steps because you are out of compliance or not. Thank you. Sure. Dr. Provost. I just wanted to share some context with the committee as a former special education director. Um, I was, I've been through this audit process about five times in two different districts. And I'll, I'll just say that this is an extremely common finding. In the best of times, with every potential you know, advantage, uh, I don't think I ever had a, a, a report that didn't have a, a finding of non-compliance on this. Um, there was a time when um, DESE used to give this thing called substantial compliance, which means you know, if we look at 100 files and you know, 95 of them were within timeline and five were out, we'd say, okay, you're obviously doing this almost all the time. But now it's really only takes one um, file that's out of compliance to result in a, a finding of non-compliance. So um, I just want to really, again, echo your words of, um, of thanks to the special education department for everyone who, you know, gutted out all of those team meetings, got the evaluations done as quickly as they could. And it's not surprising to me at all that, you know, in the midst of a global pandemic, you had a few IEPs that were more than 45 days late. Yeah, I think what John pointed out, it's it, you you end up being out of compliance if you're one day over or if you're 30 days over. Um, and so um, for us, you know, there were all sorts of factors that that played into it, certainly staffing and the ability to have meetings in a, in a timely manner, but also just things we were doing on our end. And like I said, we have bells and whistles now that go off in our office. We actually really do have like special colored paper and bells and whistles and we are hand delivering some IEPs to students' homes if the student is turning three um, the following Monday, just to make sure that those services are in place. Um, it's hard, but we're making sure we're, we have a we have a backlog of cases right now. And in one of our buildings right now, we actually have a substitute ETL who can help with um, really holding meetings very very quickly and getting those IEPs out in time. So those are things we're doing as a result of of the pandemic for sure. Member Gold, your hand is up. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, Dr. Plummer, um, as part of the audit, did CPAC, were they 
is it, is it really just a, um, and I'm sorry if you mentioned it in your presentation, but was, yeah, what role does CPAC have and have they been shared this presentation as well already? Yeah, so they, CPAC actually had a, a, an individual meeting with the, um, with, I, they don't like to be called auditors, but with the people from DESE, they met, they went over the process and then they did, they were part of, um, one of our co-chairs was part of the, was part of the interview process. Um, and I shared the results of the, um, I shared the results with them as soon as we got, as soon as we got them. Um, I'll, I'll, having attended, I forgot what event it was. There was a, a CPAC event um, where there were a lot of parents and were there and there was a discussion. I just feel like it'd be something that'd be good, like a unique, like public sharing of it to show there's how much is, you know, specific to just that, that, you know, inviting parents to see like what happened or, or to hear, you know, I think it could answer a lot of questions or give a lot of information on how much is being done, if you know what I mean. Yeah, we have our first big meeting coming up. Um, if it's not next week, it's the week after. And certainly I could um, talk to them about making that a part of it um, for sure. Thanks. Okay, are there any other questions or comments for Dr. Plummer this evening? Okay, thank you so much uh, for the presentation and um, have a good evening. Thank you. So the next item on our agenda is a um, vote and this is regarding the district's capital requests to the, um, well, to the mayor. Uh, and, um, and I believe we have uh, Nick and Antonio Pagan uh presenting um as well as uh tony kuzniers uh let me see if, who wants to go first what's the order of speaking um i guess i can start <clears throat> um so i'm going to really just focus on transportation and food service um antonio will obviously handle it and and tony will discuss other building maintenance um, proposals. Um, so in the packet, um, and this was added into the folder today, um, so hopefully you've, you've had time to see it, um, <clears throat> looking at you know, what we would like to include in our, our capital proposal for FY23, um, <clears throat> we'd like to start with um, an eight passenger van uh, we already have two in our, our fleet, um, and there's a couple of reasons for wanting to go in this direction. Um, I know initially, um, looking at last year's capital project summary, um, there was a 30-passenger wheelchair bus that was uh, possibly going to be proposed for FY23, but um, I, I had a good couple of conversations with um, Tammy Lever, our transportation supervisor, and <clears throat> she, she believes an eight passenger van addition to our fleet would be a good direction in which to go because um, primarily that this will help us um, not have to contract as much as we currently are uh, with an, you know, an outside vendor to um, transport um, mainly special education students, but also um, students who are considered homeless or in foster care. Um, and, and, you know, we do contract quite a bit, um, specifically with Vanpool to do that. Um, so adding a, an eight passenger van to our fleet would be helpful. And, um, you know, according to Tammy's analysis, uh, replacing uh, one of the 30 passenger wheelchair buses, um, it will be able to wait um, another year to, you know, to propose to do that. Um, the estimated cost of this would be about $70,000. Um, <clears> benefits would obviously be, it would give us more flexibility um, in scheduling um, our pickups and, and drop-offs. It'll allow us to transport more of our students rather than having to contract. Um, and looking at it from a, a climate lens, which I believe was added to the form just this year, um, the, the benefit there would be um, currently the, the vans that we contract with uh, Vanpool travel all the way up to Northampton from Wilbraham. 
um, which is where their garage is. Um, if we added a van to our fleet, they would be able to park locally um, and thus travel many fewer miles throughout the day. Um, you know, fewer miles traveled would be fewer overall emissions um, locally. Um, obviously, the, the driving would still take place within Northampton, but um, locally, uh, the, the van would be traveling fewer miles than it would be if it were coming from Wilbraham. So um, that would be something that we would propose um, to be part of the capital plan for FY23. Um, the other three items are food service related. Um, a steamer and kettle unit and a double convection oven unit. Those were on last year's list for FY23. Um, I spoke at length with Ms. Del Hanna, our food service director, um, and those are definitely needed um, for, for next year. Uh, the steamer and kettle unit, um, has, it's inoperable at this point. It's not able to be used. Um, and the double convection oven unit um, is, is aging and needing quite a bit of repair. So um, it's that that is definitely a priority for next year. Um, the last item would be a, a dishwasher for the NHS kitchen. Um, this was not on um, the plan for FY23, looking at last year's summary form, um, but <clears throat> the dishwasher um, since the publication of that form last year has uh, proven to be <clears throat> in, in need of being repaired. So. Uh, or sorry, replaced. So the um, the estimated cost for that would be about thirty five thousand um, dollars, ballpark figure at, at this time. But um, so anyway, those are our largest priorities going into next year. Um, I, I don't know if you want me to discuss the things that I would suggest for FY twenty four or leave that for another year. I I don't know what you would like me to do there. I think. Um... Uh, well, there's some hands up, so let's see where the hands go on those. Uh, Member Seraphie Cox. Thanks. Um, Nick, I have a question about the van um, that's a part of the, uh, the plan. Um, I remember that uh, the superintendent was going to be working with the city to uh, investigate how we can um, um, move away from either diesel or gas um, engine you know, powered uh, vehicles. So I'm wondering um, how this um, uh, how this expenditure would relate to that uh, to that process. Like, would we be able to get a, a hybrid or electric vehicle? It's very possible. Um, I, I don't believe any meetings have taken place yet. Um, with with the city um, concerning the plan going forward um, in, in terms of replacing current vehicles with either hybrid or electric uh, electric ones. Um, but I know it was discussed at a previous meeting that there was going to be some sort of, I, I'm not sure if it was a committee that was going to be formed or possibly just a couple of, of meetings just to kind of determine the plan going forward so the city and the school department could both be on the same page re regarding this because in order to do that we have to be uh, we need the infrastructure to be able to charge vehicles um, should they need it um, currently we don't have the infrastructure to charge that um, or, or charge an electric vehicle our, our vans are housed at jfk and there is no there's no charging station there currently um, but, you know, I, I, depending on the outcome of, of whatever meetings are held or whatever committee is formed, um, it's certainly worth looking into what options would be available for, for an eight passenger van. Member Voss. Uh, oh, maybe I'll let like Dr. Provost can, yeah. go ahead of me if... Um if that's okay. And then sure, I'll... sure. I just wanted to give some context on that. We did, um, uh, as a result of those prior meetings, reach out to the city about wanting to form a joint committee um, to discuss the future of electric vehicles in Northampton. And the city responded positively. I do think that since the time that's happened, a lot of the energy of the same people who would be involved with that has gone into trying to get our application for the solar arrays ready. Um, so I just think that's why we haven't had more meetings about that. Um, but that's that's definitely coming. 
Can I go now? Yes, Member Voss, sorry. Thanks. So um, one clarification, Nick, um, I was on the subcommittee that talked about these buses last year. So I, I, I think we had a 30 passenger bus, um, which I actually had some serious questions about the need for. Did we buy that? Or are we saying this eight passenger van is instead of that? We did buy a bus um, at the beginning of FY22. So I believe the bus to which you're referring has been purchased. The one that would be on this sheet for FY24 would be another one um, replacing an older one. So the one that's that we purchased, um, it's not in yet, it's been purchased, but just like everything else, um, orders are backed up and there's supply chain issues and and everything, but it, it's coming. Supposedly, it's going to be ready in November. That's the last I heard. Okay, thank you. So this one you're proposing, you said 2024, that it's an eight passenger van. Yeah, uh, or okay. yeah. Sorry, the eight passenger van would be for next year. Um, another bus would be for the year after. Okay, so I guess um, there are definitely some challenges with electric bus infrastructure, and I'm glad that's moving ahead to discuss. There's also grants and a lot of upcoming ability to try to start transitioning to that, and I agree it needs to be done with the city, but um, vans, vans take a lot less charge than a huge bus, and I really think before we approve buying a fossil fuel powered van, we should know more what's available in the world of an electric vehicle for this and um, try to see what we can do. The charging stations for these kinds of things are, are starting to pop up all over the city and they're just not, you know, I don't know exactly what an eight passenger van requires, but um, it seems to be the scope of, of things that are getting charged and within a year or two might be very reasonable and instead of putting my hand up for all of these capital improvements um i'm going to say this now and maybe at the end but um and i see tony's hands up and tony some of the things you're going to talk about this applies to as well um we i think are making a really big mistake in spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on anything that requires fossil fuels at this point as our city and our world is trying to transition off of them so entire heating systems that run on fossil fuels, if we're going to be putting hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars into those, we should reconsider and see what the options are. And, um, you know, Northampton has certain uh, goals to rid ourselves of fossil fuel. And there's just a lot of these capital improvements on this list that I don't understand well enough to know if they're short term fixes for a transition, but anything that's really looking to last on the horizon of more than five years, I have to really question putting this amount of money into. I'll so stop there, I, I'll, I'll keep a list. Okay, before I turn it over to Tony, I just, I wanted to just say that one of the capital projects that's been underway, a, a capital project that's part of our climate um, planning is a project where we're doing an analysis of every city and school building. Um, to look at the conversion to electric, you know, to, to electrification to move away from fossil fuels. So that is a process that's been underway. Um, and Chris Mason has been leading that and we've had them, uh, the folks going through all of our buildings. So I, I'm not sure what, the, um, when that'll be completed, but Tony, you have your hand up. Hey, David, sorry, just sorry. to, just, just to finish what I said then, it would be helpful to know if that work of Chris Mason has affected which of these capital improvement um, recommendations have been affected and looked at by that group and which haven't. So as you go, if you know the answers to that, I would appreciate it. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't tell you that except I, I, Chris is well aware and so is our central services department that this, I mean, they're the ones leading this um, effort. So um, I, Fairly confident that anything we'll be doing, unless it's emergency related, will will be um, you know will be looking to the future, not not with fossil fuel. Um, but I can't give you specifics of each one of these. But you know this is a this is an initial request um, that goes to the city, and then it is going to have to go through our city um, review, and ultimately um, will will be developed into a plan. Um, which is still subject to appropriation and and all the other process. So, um, but you're you're definitely your points are well taken, Tony. 
Hi there. I was going to add something real quick, and I'm not going to go into my list right now, but I don't know if I can add the electric van is one of the things that is on my list. And one of the things that Chris Mason and I are, are looking at and Ford does make an electric transit van. The limitation is the mileage. So that charge only goes 126 miles. So I think it can be outfitted to a cargo van, which we would have, but I don't know if it would be retrofitted for passengers. I think it can, but it still has a 126 mile limit. Just putting that out there. Mary Busansky. Thanks. Um, I guess I'm just curious, Mayor, if there's any kind of companion piece on this list um, to support, uh, you know, an electric charging station or, you know, any kind of capital improvements on that end, or maybe you're not at that point yet. I, but the school has submitted. Um, definitely the city has been, has been expanding our charging infrastructure. Um, mm -hmm. But I, 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 you know, but not for buses or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're doing the roundhouse lot over right now and adding a bunch of charging stations there. And certainly the departments that have electric vehicles currently in the city, um, which include, you know, the fire department and um, parking maintenance and um, trying to think of the other one, uh, have, have we have charging stations that have been installed there. So certainly going along with any electric vehicle purchase um, we would, you know, we would want to make sure that we're charging stations to be able to support them. So I, I think the two, it's, it's, it'll be a two-step process, I think, as we're developing or a parallel process as we're looking at vans, um, we'll have to, uh, you know, account for, you know, where, where, where we'll be able to locate charging stations. Okay. And then I was just going to add um, that I, in my day job, I got word from the state that the state, not this year, but next year. Next year is moving to only allowing state money to be used for hybrid and electric vehicles. Um, that's affecting my work. I don't know if that'll be um, for cities and towns as well, but they're really trying to align their whole sustainability plan with the way that they give out money across the board. So I think the sooner that we prepare for this, um, the better, because we might bump into that moment where we're, um, I know we want to be ahead of this as a community, but we might not even have a choice. So no doubt, no doubt. And I mean, when Northampton became a green community under the state's program, we did pledge to, to only buy vehicles that were, you know, uh, hybrid and, and or met certain, whatever the certain green standards were. Um, the challenge still remains that, that um, many of the specialized vehicles, you know, dump trucks and, and fire engines and things like that just aren't, aren't available yet in, in electric. They should be, they could be. Um, you know, we have hybrid cruisers now um, and, you know, little electric parking vehicles. Um, our assessors are getting an electric vehicle because they basically just drive around town. So it's perfect for them. Um, our fire inspector has a hybrid plug-in hybrid, uh, again, just in-town driving. So we've been moving in that direction, but the challenge is going to be is the, you know, the actual development of these specialized vehicles. Um, so, okay, um, so, member Voss, your hand is up. Yeah, just to continue this. Um, so when we're asked to vote on this in a short while from now, and I don't want to vote for something that is going to be run by fossil fuel in terms of a van. I mean, I know you'd say you can change it. I'd rather vote for an electric passenger van if possible, and you can change it back to the other. But what I learned last year was sometimes these buses and vans can be used for an extra year or two. And I just don't see a point in investing in something brand new that's um, not going to be running on this electric infrastructure that the city's building. So how do how can we modify this to meet that goal? Is it possible? I would I would say that the requirements for, and we say this to every department that the requirements for a CIP submission are you need to research it and get the bids and get the, you know, get the costs of, of operating and maintaining whatever the piece of equipment is. So I don't know what was priced here, um, but if there's changes that have to be made to these, then you'd have to read, you know, if you're rejecting a certain type of vehicle, then you'd have to just make sure that, um, whatever data was needed to be collected so that the form could be updated. 
Um, I, and what I'm saying is that if it's a you know forty thousand dollar fossil fuel vehicle, but it may cost sixty for the electric or something, then you just have that has to be updated on what specifically you're looking to purchase. Can I just uh, clarify something before we move forward? Um, I you know. I didn't, I don't have my heart set on purchasing a van that uses fossil fuel. Um, you know, I, I just, with the current infrastructure um, that exists for, for charging this van where it would be, you know, parked right now. And the fact that these forms are due to the Capitol Committee tomorrow, I, I had to write it with the parameters with which I had. I, I didn't want to write it um, as, you know, an electric or hybrid vehicle not knowing that I'd be able to have that thing charged sufficiently as, you know, as it needs to be. Um, so I, I just wanted to clarify that before we move forward here. I, I didn't know exactly where we were in the process of getting more charging stations and there was a deadline. So that's, that's why this was written the way it was. Member Gold. Um, yeah, just, uh, Nick, is there is leasing ever an option? Because I do hear the whole idea of buying something that's maybe is going to outlast its its environmental friendliness. Um, is leasing ever an option on a on a van? Uh, I'm not sure. It would definitely be worth looking into. Okay, yeah, like if there's a way that we could just lease one for five years or whatever. I don't know. Looking at that, would be interesting to know that possibly. Um. Any other questions um, about this? Um, okay, other, uh, oh, sorry, Member Busansky. Uh, just a quick question on the process. So we vote on this. Um, I believe Member Levy might be our liaison to this committee. So that is correct. A, uh, there, there's okay. a liaison from the city council and the school committee. Um, and then there's, um, three members of the public who also serve on this um, along with and led by the finance director. Um, and the committee's role is to really take all these CIP forms, um, actually interview, have interviews with department heads um, who submitted them, um, and then to basically go through and, and try to prioritize them. Like what, what are the highest priority, you know, medium and long range priority. Um, and sort of to vet them that way. Um, and, then, and then it sort of gets turned over then uh, to the finance director and the mayor to then work on developing the plan, which is to actually figure out what the whole exercise of the CIP is to, is to assess all of your potential capital needs on a rolling five-year basis, but then also to map out what, how you would propose to pay for them, like how they would actually fit into um, the city's debt structure or other structures to pay for it. So um, that's sort of what the process looks like. So is there an opportunity in that process for our liaison then to um, advocate or as this document's being kind of refined to work on, you know, looking for a electric or hybrid vehicle? I mean, I think it would really be a case of the school uh, department because the, the, committee is not refining requests. They're not changing requests or refining requests. They're really looking at the requests in a totality and then trying to really see what they feel are the highest priority, um, you know, trying to put them in so, uh, some sort of priority order. Um, so really the, it would be, I think it would be more appropriate for the school department if it wanted to make a change. I mean, obviously I know your deadline is tomorrow and we're having this conversation tonight, but um, you know, I, I don't, uh, I, I don't, uh, obviously we wouldn't want wholesale changes of everybody's capital request, but if there was a, a substitution that needed to be made, it, uh, made uh, mid process, um, that certainly would be allowed. Um, so I, I don't think that, uh, so certainly if there was, if, if, if someone wanted to modify their request, um, that certainly could happen. Um, so I, again, that, I guess that's my best I uh, guess it wouldn't really be up for the committee doesn't like um, it's not their job to like change the requests or modify the requests or re-engineer the requests. That's not really what their role is. Um, okay. you know, they're, yeah. So that, that would be my best suggestion on that. So it sounds like there's an opportunity for us to refine it for the school department to 
refine yes. or to yes. change it sort of. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So member Levy. My question is about our process tonight. Uh, Cause I have some questions about some of the other pieces that we haven't yet been presented. Are those still coming or should we ask questions about those things now? I think Nick was presenting his, and then I thought other folks were going to present okay. their aspects of the plan. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm not sure who that, if uh, that's Tony or who else, who wants to go next. I can be next. Oh, go ahead, Antonio. Hey, good night again. Uh, I have only one uh, request, so I, it, this will be uh, pretty easy. I actually... Uh, we decided to call the, the, the project the 21st Century Classroom Technology. And I'm going to give some background. You have the document in front of you, so you, you might ask questions about the, the content of it. So about four years ago, we started with uh, um, the creation of the digital literacy and computer science coordinator to actually assess the whole technology uh, capacity for the district. And at the time, we uh, concluded very rapidly that the priority was the um, IT infrastructure, which we've, we've been investing efforts and um, resources during the last three and a half years. One thing that we've known for years is that besides that, uh, the classroom technology itself is being lacking, you know, uh, the most modern um, technology and capacity. So before COVID, we started a process to evaluate by grade level what the needs are for the technology. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we, we had to um, basically uh, uh, pass that process and we haven't finished yet uh, identifying specifically what kind of technology would be used, for example, on elementary versus uh, meter or high school. <clears throat> but what we are really clear about is, for example, we heavily um, rely in the past on um, smart board technology in all buildings. The technology that it was installed on those buildings and uh, it is not compatible with Windows 10, it's not compatible with the infrastructure that we have now. And uh, we've been basically just using the the smart boards as whiteboards. And we've been relying on projectors, which we actually invested a, a good amount of money uh, about three and a half years ago. Uh, things that we have discussed with uh, different grade levels is whether interactive uh, whiteboards or interactive LCD panels are the solution, whether um, document cameras that we've been using are the best option, whether um, web cameras that we are using are the best option. So there's been a, a constant communication during the last um, couple of years before uh, COVID. And now we are coming back to the same discussions. What we know is that regardless of the technology we pick, we are facing about $3,000 to $5,000, depending on whether it is a, a math, science, or technology classroom versus uh, a, you know ELA or classroom. And uh, based on those numbers, we are estimating the cost. We are not set on any technology. We know, as you can see on the document, that we want to use green technology as much as possible. Um, and that we want the uh, principals to have the opportunity to work with their department heads to choose what is the best technology for their needs. Uh, but definitely we have to, to start um, working on upgrading our classroom technology. And it's not the idea of increasing screen time or anything like that. This is more like allowing the teachers to have a better way of communicating with kids and be able to differentiate uh, um, uh, learning process based on, on individual needs and group needs. And in order to do that, we definitely, the technology we have today is not, is not helpful for, for that purpose. 
So what we are putting there in uh, in terms of a request is uh, a three-year plan for uh, going building by building and in, in terms of priorities based on uh, our conversations that are going to be happening. They started, as I mentioned before, COVID and they will continue now and uh, start basically designing building by building what is the best technology and not only building, but by department, uh, whether it's math, science or technology or whether it's uh, ELA or arts um, in, in any case. So that is basically the, the request is, um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Any questions for um, Antonio Pagan? Oh, uh, Member Gold. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Antonio, for bringing this one. It's very exciting to see this, this effort uh, in place. I'm just curious, do you have, um, is you you I seeing that you have like two hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, and then um, and then three two and two forty. Um, is it each year difference grade levels? Is it like do you have um? Yeah, the um, the, the, the way it's showing there is uh, middle school first, high school and elementary schools. Obviously, that was a way of of dividing the cost. I think that we actually made the calculations based on. Uh, classrooms numbers so we could uh if the process guide us on a different way we could mix and match uh different grade levels if needed but uh, i know that there are uh you know for example we have done some pilot uh uh demos in in the high school and uh, we've done some at the middle school and right now we are actually working on the most recent technology from smart technology uh, and uh, we're running a pilot right now uh, so that we can look at it. It The way we have done all the work that we've done in technology is being always through, uh, through the principals. And uh, so we go through them. They normally pick uh, a few leaders in the, in the building to work with us. And obviously we have the technology integrators and, and Molly that are the, the ones that are looking at different options. And as soon as we identify uh, the needs, we will be able to, um, you know, prioritize better. At this point, because of COVID, we, you know, the process was completely uh, paused. So we don't have all the data that we need to say, okay, this is the most uh, uh, needed grade level at this point, but we could, you know, I, I've done this kind of project before with the city and uh, we've, you know, we normally do three years divide by, you know, almost, almost equal amount of money per year. And then we prioritize as we go. And the, the next piece, the way it's written, it's, it's broad, which is nice. It allows anything interactive. So it could be any devices that support interactivity, whether the teacher is using it or the students using it. Yes, exactly. And, you know, we want to be able to have, you know, quick response from, uh, from students, quick response from teachers, so that they can evaluate and assess uh, the needs right away. It's, it's been in use in many other districts before, and, and we are missing that, we are lacking that piece. Um, that will really help a lot on, on, on the assessment process for, for the kids. And then my, just my last two things then are, um, are um, first, I, I also think that considering the world we live in now and the possibilities of, um, there's uh, closures and, and remote learning, you know, who knows what's there. The more interactive the classroom can be, the more adaptable it is to what happens with students learning at home or in the building. So I think that's a wonderful investment for us. So that's one reason I hope our, my colleagues, um, you know, do support um, this investment. And then lastly, I'll throw out there, Antonio, um, I'm the technology coordinator for my school down in Springfield. And we have everything from rooms still with chalkboards, all, you know, to ones that have the Ford of interactivity to the Jaguar of interactivity. So like, if you want to come and see different ones and speak to teachers there, we we have the breadth of it. And it's a very large building, a lot of different versions. Be happy to share with you guys. I really appreciate that. And we'll be happy to to do that. And, and definitely that's that's how it's, it's best learning. Just seeing what is working in other places, definitely. Thank you very much. Thanks. Member Voss. Thank you. And I have to apologize. I'm having trouble finding the document and it might just be me. Um, I think 
I think it's me, <laughs> but um, so if this is in there, I'm sorry, but I'm thank you for that. And I have, a, I guess, a different question. Um, uh, member boss, you can see there, I'm sharing it. Oh, thank you, I can. Um, I guess what I'm gonna ask could be in here, but over the past year, we've just heard a lot of um, stories about internet connections, um, you know, not working very well at some of our schools when it's been super important. And I'm just curious, since we have you here, I wanted to ask you if if that is something we need money for. Sorry, I have. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And, and, and how we're going to, if, if it's fixed or how we need to, what we need to do to support that. At the point we don't, we, let me let me just go a little bit back. At, we have, um, Anything in, uh, related to internet, we actually go through E-rate funding, which give us 50% discount on any technology. And we have a project that is being approved. We haven't been able to uh, deploy it, mostly because of everything else that is happening in the district uh, for uh, basically overhauling the whole wireless network. And that's going to happen over the winter um, break and it's already funded. Okay, thank you. So, so just to clarify, your expectation is once that happens, we our internet problems that we hear about a lot will be much reduced. Definitely, and definitely is you know we have had some improvement in the last year before COVID, but this one will be a replacement. You will be implementing the latest um, technology available on Wi-Fi, and uh, and it will be including all buildings. And, and since you shared this um, with me, I just want to highlight and make sure I understand this for other school committee members, cost to maintain. So once these things that you talked about come in, we will need to adjust our school committee budget to maintain it at 10%. So is that like 10% um, of what, of 200,000? So are you saying we'll need another $20,000 in our budget to maintain this? So let me, yeah, let me, let me uh, clarify that point. We, we had a conversation last year on our um, annual you know, operating budget. We currently have $65,000 for all schools to replace um, and repair uh, technology. We said that the, the goal is basically to double that over three, four years. So we are going to be requesting more operating budget. That budget is actually uh, distributed among all schools. And right now it's used basically to replace projectors, replace projector boards, project, uh, you know, any kind of uh, uh, accessories that they need, cameras and things like that. When we replace the technology, we have to make a big investment, but the maintenance of it, it will be basically coming out of that operating budget, uh, which is already been uh, basically earmarked to be increased because it's not being reali uh, realistic to have $65,000 for, for maintaining budget for, you know, 2,700 students is, is, is not realistic. So, so it's being taken in, 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 uh, um, in consideration as we make the budget, but normally it's about 10% for maintenance over uh, um, annual uh, operating budget. Yeah. Thank you. You are very welcome. Okay. Um, any other questions for the IT portion of the um, capital submission? Okay. If not, then why don't we turn over to facilities and uh, the other projects that you're working on, Tony? All right. Great. Thanks for having me. So first off, I don't know if you want me to go through FY23 list from top to bottom and then answer questions, or did you have other questions up front you want me to answer? It may clear up other questions down the road. Member Levy? Thanks. It's a really long list. So it's I. It's a very I long list, right? So. <laughs> um, I, uh, I have a question just about just process uh, and dollar amounts. Can you give a sense of, of 
how you landed on the specific dollar amounts that are in these these documents? Um, some of it is best estimates, you know, between discussions in our department um, on past projects and what we project or things are going to cost in the future. And some of them are hard estimates that we've gotten already. Okay. Um, some of these numbers seem really high. Uh, and um, no, very high. I don't, I don't question the necessity to do the projects. Um, I guess one of them that just sort of struck me was the recarpeting of the JFK guidance and main office. Uh, and I, I don't want to nitpick. Um, it's just, I'm bringing it up as an example of, um, you know, wondering how many square feet are we recarpeting for $75,000? Uh, and what happens, um, I guess what happens if uh, these numbers are, do, are we able to make the case that these are really important if our, if our numbers are um, potentially higher or even lower than in the end they're gonna be? Yeah, I can talk to that a little bit. So we try to overshoot if possible. We don't want to request lower amounts and not have enough money. So we're always in a better situation if we have a little extra money in that account so that it will stay in that account. Um, and we have past capital money that's still available in different accounts. And it either stays there and we use it on similar projects or we reprogram it for other projects. So we always try to have sufficient money to get done what we want and not have enough. That's the biggest problem. So if we don't have enough money and then we, we bid it and we go out to get costs and we don't have enough money in the capital, it is a whole other process to request more money. Right. Okay. Thank you. So Member, Voss. Start? Uh, Member Voss had a question, I believe. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's kind of in the same spirit. It's a long list and I don't know if it makes sense to put it up or if you're gonna go one by one, but my general question remains as you go through these. And I think uh, just in terms of putting hundreds of thousands of dollars into energy systems that might be obsolete soon um, versus waiting to replace them for a few years so that we can do it um, in a more modern way. And, and I'm not, I, I don't know the answer to that, but just having somebody, you know, who knows how to look at it from that perspective, come in and tell us, you know, and, you know, at a home level, it's mass safe comes in and helps you decide if you're ready or if it makes sense to put certain things in that will save you money and use less fossil fuels. And so on this list, I have to switch screens here, you know, all these things that are about energy managed systems upgrades and ventilation and greenhouse gas emissions upgrades. Of course we need that, right? We, we're headed for climate change. We need better ventilation, better air conditioning, but I don't know if some of this is heat systems and I, I don't want us to be signing off for investing in things that don't make sense for 10 years from now. So if you could help us understand which of these that have been looked at through that lens and which maybe still need to be looked through that by that lens, that would be really helpful. Sure. I will say that all of them are looked at through that lens. So Chris Mason, the city energy officer is in our department and sits in every one of these meetings with us and goes through these projects as we develop them. So we're also still doing those feasibility studies that the mayor talked about that are going through city buildings, but they're doing school buildings as well. So their recommendations will help drive the action product. All right, Antonio, you got to mute yourself. Antonio, I think you, um, okay. All right. Awesome. So yeah, the feasibility studies help drive the actual project. So it doesn't dictate the money per se, but it helps us decide what we're going to install. Um, and technology is changing. So we're, 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 for example, I can use one that's on here that's a high dollar figure one is an FY23 is the Leeds ventilation upgrade. And the reason that's on here first is Chris Mason is already working on this project now. Um, 
we were going to request originally just sixty thousand dollars to match a, a funding source for him but we're going to request the whole project total because he's got a, potentially a five hundred thousand dollar grant that'll pay for most of this but he's not positive that we're going to receive the grant in time so this project for example is installing an energy recovery unit ventilator along with heat pumps um, we're, and we're getting rid of an old steam heating system in the old section of leads so any opportunity we have to eliminate old technology we are um, and we're replacing it with current the current standard of what is you know new technology uh, we don't know what's in the future obviously but Chris feels pretty strongly that heat pumps of one way or another will be around for a number of years still. Um, and along with like the energy recovery units that recapture and reuse energy. Hope that helps answer those questions. That's fantastic. Thank you. I'm really glad to hear that that that's how it's proceeding. Yeah, it is. And that's in our five year plan. So if you there are some of the dollar figures are staggered and they're staggered for reasons based on those feasibility studies when they come due um, and just the timeline of being able to get projects done. We don't have a huge department, so we got us. We have to stagger some of this stuff. And, and just my other final thing to clarify, there's a van listed on your list as well, Tony. Yeah. And does that fit under Mayor Narcos's? Um, that does. that would automatically be an electric vehicle? Yeah, every project that we do uh, that requires use of energy falls under the mayor's directive to try to find ways to reduce greenhouse gas. So that's why I brought up the point about the van. We've already researched it. So Chris is reaching out to see if there's any sort of rebates that we can get from the utility. Um, he's not quite sure yet. Ford has just started releasing these. So they're pretty new as of now. So, and they're on some state contracts already. So it's gonna be an electric utility cargo van in a sense. The limit is it's only got a battery that is 126 miles. But for our use driving around the city every day, as long as it gets charged every day, it's fine. And like the mayor also said, along with the purchase comes charger. So, this is going to be stored at the high school because that's where our vans are stored now and that's where our foreman's based out of and we'll find a suitable spot there and, and work with the utility and have a charging station put in thank you no problem dr provost i just wanted to add for the committee's benefit you you heard a little bit this at the beginning of this meeting about my style of leadership but and this process of coming up with the capital list started last year when I charged Tony with central services, really prioritizing healthy buildings and healthy planet. And I said, I'm not an HVAC expert. I'm not an environmental expert, but I know that we need to improve ventilation in our schools. And I know that we want to have the most efficient technologies to do that. And I think that all of the items on his list that have to do with um, HVAC improvements fall into that category. And so I just want to thank him for that. Thank you, John. Uh, Tony had begun by asking the question: do, do you want us? Do, do you want him to go through item by item on his list? Um, are there, or do we want to just, if there are people, review the list and have questions? Um, um, are there things that you think you'd want to highlight? Maybe Tony, just give a quick highlight of things that you think are relevant or important. Yeah, I can go through some of the big dollar figure ones and, you know, maybe that'll help. And then I can kind of summarize some of the other stuff. So we have a mix. We Every year we have a mix of kind of replacement projects, upgrade projects and maintenance enhancement projects in a sense. So you'll see some additional money for leads we're spending a lot of money on leads because part of that energy retrofit in the old section of leads if you can picture the leads old school building are all those old windows so we have a 1952 building with 1952 windows that wrap around that whole wing of the building so we're going to be doing engineering and replacing all of those old windows as well that ties directly in with the energy project 
So Chris is involved in both of those um, to try to create the best building, I guess, for the, the use of the energy that we're going to be using. So it's going to be eliminating a lot of the windows and changing inside some of the visual effects um, because having all of that glass is certainly not energy efficient. So that's another huge dollar figure that you'll see. You know, smaller ones, for example, we have money. We're going to be replacing the high school uh, intercom slash uh, bell controller, you know, and that's a project where it's just replacing something that's outdated that was from the 90s that, that is, you know, not able to be supported any longer. We've got other projects like the Ryan Road sidewalk, um, which we've requested money for years for that. But this will be just enhancing some of the sidewalk around the building, building some ramps, making it a little more accessible um, for people in wheelchairs. Uh, energy management upgrades. You've probably heard that mentioned or seen it on various capital plans. That is an ongoing process in the city. Um, we've been doing it for probably eight to 10 years already. Um, and we'll continue requesting money for that um, for every building. That's similar, the technology changes. It's based on older computer technology and software. So we have to continue updating it. Those are some of the highlights for FY23. I can go into some other ones in other years, but that covers FY23 pretty well. Other, um, other highlights of other, oh, sorry, Member Voss, sorry about that. Um, well, I have one question. I was also gonna, from my perspective, I don't think you need to go through everything, Tony. I appreciated the general response. Um, I do have one specific question coming back to this and I'm hopeful you might know the answer, but um, with the hot water stuff, are we going towards solar hot water or are we going to heat hot water with um, electric or something else? Do you know? We are looking at all options. Okay. Solar is not sufficient to, to create the hot water need that we have. Okay, so that makes we've, sense. We've looked at all sorts of options and we'll continue to. There's heat pump options along with solar, supplemented with gas, uh, all of those, yeah. Okay, but we're not putting in big fossil fuel, um, huge no. hot water. No. Okay, that's and, all I need to know. Yeah, no. Every energy, every project that requires use of energy will be looked at from that protocol. I, I'm satisfied. Others can speak up if they're not, but thank you. Okay, um, Member Goldman. Thank you. Um, Tony, I just, I've had a number of constituents who are concerned about hot rooms and second floors of school buildings that do not have air conditioning. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to those specific spaces um, in general and how it relates to what you're proposing here. I don't have necessarily a great answer. So some of our buildings are gonna, unfortunately, they're unable to be cooled. So our requests that we're putting in for energy projects will provide air conditioning to parts of buildings. It won't be to entire buildings. So we're, we would look at replacing old sections of buildings first um, and then installing air conditioning in buildings that don't have it is millions and millions of dollars. So that would have to be something the city would really want us to move forward in the future. Uh, for example, to retrofit an elementary school, and this was a few years ago, a number would be three to $4 million of installing mini split heat pump AC units in one building alone. So, so now we try to supplement best we can with portable AC units and, and move them around as needed in buildings. Okay, thank you. I'm just really concerned about the well being of students um, and creating environments that support learning. And we know that those spaces get sometimes too hot for that, especially with masks. Thank you. Member Kaufman. Yes, thank you. Um, 
Thanks for doing all this work. You know, I, I looked at the list, I read through most of it. It makes a lot of sense, but I think where I need help, um, and I don't know if this comes from Dr. Provost or May Narkowitz or someone from the, um, one of our subcommittees, budget and property subcommittee, but I, how do we make a decision about this is, is not clear to me. Like if we vote for these things, what are we not getting? And, and this is just a, such a more extensive list than I recall ever going through. I might've missed a meeting, but this is, this is difficult. So are we voting on everything or nothing? Are we trying to prioritize? How confident are, are you, Dr. Provost, and again, Mayor Narkwitz, only because you've dealt with big budget items. How do we go about making a decision on a list that makes a lot of sense on paper, but is an awful lot of money? And I don't really understand what our task is here. Can you help me out? Um, I can say that um, uh, this is a process that's been going on um, well since 2013, I think, since the new charter passed and then we switched to this five-year um, program. Um, and I can say that um, prior, uh, I think in the past, NPS had just submitted these things and then we modified our practice a few years ago to um, present what was being submitted to the school committee. Um, but it hasn't really been refined beyond that. Um, so, so it's always been like, here's the, here's the list of what we're submitting to the capital plan um, and re basically requesting that these items be put on the city's five-year plan and hopefully they would get funded sometime over those five years. So um, that's really it. And um, in the past, it was in response to concerns about specific types of, of specific projects. Yeah. Um, so I, so this is the practice that the school committee adopted. Um, yeah. No, I think I'm okay with that. Thank you. But I mean, I, I'm just confused as how do I get to prioritize my voting tonight? Like maybe I'll ask more specifically, is this an all or nothing? Or is this, um, are we trying to prioritize where the money goes? And if there's extra money, is that going to come back to us to make a decision around it? Definitely not. Um, no, it's really, it's really your, every department in the city is being asked to go through this exercise. And yeah. so um, you're not making fiscal decisions. I mean, you are in the sense that you're, you're saying these are the capital needs of, of our department, of the school department. Um, and obviously, like, like the city, uh, you know, we do rely on the folks that are the, you know, the, the, the folks that are taking care of the buildings every day and taking care of the systems and um, to, to make the recommendations. Um, so you're really, I think what you're being asked to do is, is just review the totality of this submission. Um, and I guess if there was things that, if there were items that the committee said, you know, we don't want this or we don't think this is necessary, yeah. you could say we would pull that particular item, but you're not being asked to make any fiscal um, determinations. Um, okay. It's not really, it's, it's part of the capital budget, which spans city and schools. Right. So um, yeah. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. Dr. Provost, do you have anything to add to my question? I agree with everything the mayor said. I guess I would just add that, you know, this is the school committee's um, request that, you know, we're asking you to, to make with our input. If you think that all these items are not necessary or some of these items are not necessary what the opportunity cost is that you were asking would be you know that some another department might get something that they wouldn't otherwise get if a project was being funded for the schools right okay thank you very much um let's see um member voss before you um before you speak uh Annie's having some technical difficulties with her um, management of Zoom and she's not, her screen is not registering fully and she's, um, but she can't make me host. I would want her to uh, basically, I was gonna suggest she log off and log back in and see if she can get a better connection. I'm co-host. Uh, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you. I think if she logs off, it will ask her if she says leave and she's the host, it will probably ask her if she wants to make somebody else host. Okay. Can you. I, can I just jump in? Cause I've been involved with these conversations too. I think what's happened is her computer is completely frozen. 
Um, so she can't even lock out, log out. So I asked if she could join by phone. I think I see a new phone person. Yeah. I think that is, that's Annie. So I think okay. she's probably just going to leave this meeting open with the old computer and then participate by a phone from this point forward. Okay. Um, it's going to be challenging. We want to go to a breakout room for executive session. Um, but I guess we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, I, I guess I could have her pull the plug on her computer quite literally, but I think that would end the meeting for everybody. Hmm. Yeah. Is Antonio still on the line? <laughs> Antonio? Uh, I think he is. I'm here. I can, I can try to communicate with, um, with Annie and see how we can uh, work on that. Let me, give me a couple of minutes. Yeah, it's happened before in some other meetings I've been in where the host has been like jammed like this and they can't. Yeah. Uh, so, um, okay, uh, thank you. Um, all right, so let's go on to questions then, um, Member Boss. Thanks. And so I've asked all my uh, energy related ones, I think, but my other question set of questions about this um, revolves around ventilation and thank you member Goldman you started that conversation um, uh, I guess my question you know this year we learned a lot about our buildings and and that some of them are poorly ventilated and from my perspective we have band-aids in place right now with HEPA filters in there but we learned oh I have a terrible echo sorry um we learned that we really need four 0.5 plus air exchanges in a normal typical classroom size and we don't get that and that's when you have COVID going on but it's also what's best for learning um, as CO2 levels rise throughout the school day kids get sleepy teachers get sleepy if the rooms aren't well ventilated so I guess my question is have we thought about that and there's all sorts of federal and maybe other funds out there to address ventilation in schools. And I actually emailed Dr. Provost that question a few weeks ago and um, he said, we're gonna talk about it during this conversation. So um, I don't really care if we ask for capital improvement money or other federal money for this kind of thing, but it seems really important that it's part of the conversation and, and that might include air conditioning, but certainly ventilation has to happen all during the year. So where are we at with that, Tony? similar answer that's been included in this discussion as well so with the heat pumps are included the energy recovery units which in basically so for leads for example it'll run like a collapsible duct in the old attic space of the building so it'll circulate uh, fresh air uh, through the building um, at a much higher rate than it does now um, and we'll use that model and other spaces and then adapt and build as we move forward and as these other energy studies get completed and then we continue working with engineers we'll figure out ways of increasing ventilation the large portions of our schools have pretty good ventilation so they really do um, we spent a lot of money and time over the last five to six years up, updating and upgrading and fixing equipment so, but this brings us to the next level of introducing hybrid equipment. You know, we're not just putting a, a HEPA filter in the corner of the room. You know, we're retrofitting an entire wing of a building with new technology and then and seeing how it performs. And that's only this coming year. So this is a, a fluid document that, that goes over five years and we keep building and adding to it. And we'll keep building and adding to it. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I I feel like um, from the numbers I saw, and I, I don't, there were certain schools, older elementary schools, that the ventilation was really quite inadequate through a lot of the classrooms. And I'm just, I guess I'm saying, are we allocating enough money to get this done quickly enough? And I don't know why that's not part of an air conditioning conversation. Um, I appreciate some rooms might not be able to get air conditioning, but ventilation and temperature control in those older buildings, um, especially in keeping people healthy, just seems like it should be a top priority. So are, are we doing everything we can on a time scale that is reasonable? 
my perspective, yes. So we have to work through this first project in engineering and see what our feasibility is of adapting it in an old section of the building. So we're looking at the old section of Leeds and then second would be the old section on Jackson Street. So those were two of our, our highest need areas and then seeing how they perform and how we're able to adapt similar projects in the future. Okay. You know, and then it's a funding source issue. You know, if we, we have millions that we can dedicate towards retrofitting entire buildings with the same technology um, and we'll keep moving forward with that goal. I mean, our goal is the same as the city's is kind of heading towards net zero buildings as possible. So, and that's where we're, in our mind, that's where we're thinking. So, and along with that is healthy buildings, increasing ventilation as well. And, and it just, I guess the final follow-up is, you know, I'm thinking of, uh, at Ryan Road, my recollection was a lot of the rooms had really limited ventilation and needed multiple HEPA filters. And are we gonna just keep those HEPA filters plugged in until we upgrade the building's ventilation? Or what is what is the, plan for that? I would say that is the plan for now. Yeah. It supplements the current building system and provides that air exchange, you know, and we've learned a lot, obviously, with through how to increase air exchange and get more air in buildings and cracking windows and using fans and opening doors and, and all those strategies. So, yeah. Okay, I really appreciate you answering that. I'm just going to put out to the committee that, you know, I don't these ESSER funds and all this money, I don't know the right balance, but I think we should keep talking about uh, air conditioning and ventilation. But thanks, Tony. Thanks for all your work on that. Welcome. Member Levy. My question is really about prioritization. Um, I mean, it would be amazing if all of these things get um, approved. Uh, given that my role is gonna be to advocate I'm wondering, and, and maybe this isn't a conversation for right now, but it's just a hope that perhaps there can be some kind of a um, prioritization list to, so that I have an idea of, of um, most important pieces to advocate for. There is a priority designation on the forms that you were given. So when I present this to the Capital Committee, you know, that is obviously something that we discuss as well. So they, they use that same logic to, to gauge what we're telling them is the highest priority um, versus low and medium and funding is how they approve it really. So what my experience has been over the years here now is if we tell them that, you know, something is of high priority and needs to be done, um, it moves to the top of the list and generally gets funded. And we did, if you look on various, I don't know what documents you have, you have a lot yeah. of documents, so. I see the, I see the check marks, low, medium, Those are high. the priorities. And that's on the master like spreadsheet that the capital committee will have, and it'll correspond with each one of those individual sheets. So just to be clear, Member Levy, um, you do represent the schools, but your sole purpose is not just to advocate for the schools. You're there because you're an elected official and you're serving in an ad hoc advisory capacity. And you're supposed to because, you know, everybody's going to say that all their projects are the top priority. And so but there's only so much capacity within FY2020. So but clearly you're going to bring the school perspective, no doubt. But everybody's going to say these are the top priorities and there's only so much capacity in one fiscal year to do them. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the task is to try to figure out which ones are the highest priority. So, and how, and so anyway, just adding that little editorial. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. I thought I was put on it cause I was so convincing, yeah, uh, but yeah. well, I, I fair enough. I appreciate that. Okay. So um, any, uh, Tony, do you want to then, um, I don't know if there's other out year projects you want to talk about that are, that are looming. Um, uh, so, uh, I, I mean, I, I, think I, I covered, I covered a lot of them, you know, some of these other ones in the future are a little more fluid. You know, we've got on your money potentially for resurfacing the track, uh, stuff like that. Some, 
additional grounds equipment to support the, you know, the pesticide free turf program that we're going to be doing, you know, th those types of things in the future, yep. you know, and you'll see various dollar figures that are similar with similar descriptions over multiple years for the energy projects, you know, and then mayor, as you know, this is, this gets changed quite often as needs come up over the years. So, mm -hmm. you know, we'll keep adding to this and changing as we go along. You know, we have a roof on here for the JFK middle school. That's a huge, huge dollar figure, but you know, we may just keep bumping that down the road, but we're wanting to get it on here. Now that's the next building. that will need a new roof. So. And I assume that would be an MSBA type yeah, project that we would apply for MSBA funding. Yeah, it'd be MSBA. And we got somewhere in the neighborhood of 56, 57% reimbursement last time from the state. So we think that would probably be around there, but that's a multi-million dollar project probably over a couple summers. Okay. Um, so are folks, um, are there any other specific projects people want to ask about or um, concerns you have about other projects that Tony hasn't gone over? Okay. Um, so I guess the, um, the, the, the item on the agenda is to, um, you know, is to uh, approve the capital request. So essentially it's sort of you're endorsing the requests that are gonna be submitted on behalf of the school department um, to the capital process. So uh, I, I guess I would entertain a motion um, if someone wanted to make that motion. Um. I'll, I'll make a motion um, to accept the capital request, capital and permit requests with one amendment, which is within the school transportation part to encourage us to try uh, something about wanting the van to be um, prioritized to be electric, if I need to say that, right? No, that makes, that makes sense. Yep. And, and, and future bus and the future bus. So the vehicles, and I could even just broadly paint it that all capital requests here that involve vehicles should prioritize and do everything they can to make them electric and apply for appropriate grants, which I'm sure you would do. Second. Is there a second? Second. Oh, Member Kaufman. Okay. Is there any further discussion on that? Okay. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Uh, Annie, can you call the roll? Yep, yeah. Member oh, Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Um, Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. I'm I'm oddly gonna, I think I've abstained in the past. This is an awkward one because you're basically making a recommendation to me. So I, I sort of am in two parts of the process. So I, I'm just gonna abstain. Just, I mean, I'm supportive of all these, but I, it's just always an awkward one when you're basically submitting them to me. So I'm gonna abstain. Uh, and member Serafi Cox. Yes. The vote is eight uh, in favor. Annie. Oh, Member Fallon is Member, here. Member Fallon is here. I'm sorry, Member Fallon. I had some technical difficulties, so I did not see you. Member Fallon. Yes. Okay. The vote is nine in favor, one abstention. Annie, you also forgot me. Oh, are you kidding? I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm a little flustered from my technical difficulties. Member Busansky. I vote yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. The vote is nine in favor, one abstention. Excellent. So, um, so that it will has been accepted with that amendment, and obviously, um, thank you to Nick and to Tony and to Antonio and to all their staff for the work um, that goes into putting this all together. Um, okay. So the next item on the agenda is a vote to approve the NEF book fund donations, and um, we have um, Amy Levine here tonight. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm, I'm Amy Levine. I'm the uh, 
That's okay. That happens all the time. It's okay. Um, I am the volunteer book fund coordinator for the Northampton Education Foundation. Um, and of course, you know us um, besides book fund, I'm providing grants to the schools. And um, the book fund, um, we raised for this fiscal year, um, 16,500. And some of that is shared with um, Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School. Um, and so the amount, the new amount coming to NPS is um, $15,732.77. I apologize for the specificity. Um, it is based on the, the funds get distributed on a per capita basis on the, um, based on the current um, school enrollment. And um, they are shared among all six of our schools. Um, um, the total fund available to all the Northampton schools is um, about $17,500 because there's a little bit left over from last year. Um, and um, the way the fund runs is that schools apply through our website um, and we provide oversight merely to just see that the money is spent on some kind of text. Um, we don't judge in any way. Um, I, I personally really like to learn about what's happening in the schools. There's been a lot of efforts to diversify curriculum and um, provide all kinds of a huge range um, for students and, um, and uh, to meet the needs of ELL learners um, as well. Um, and also funds last year, especially um, at the high school and the middle school, um, for remote learning, we were able to provide some online resources for particular teachers and also um, a large number of them through the JFK library that um, just provided um, like graphic novels, for example, for um, middle school kids at home, um, if they had act if they had online access, um, and also some some interesting, um, I know they piloted some interesting software um, for research. Um, and um, the elementary schools um, seem to prioritize some of their youngest readers. Um, and I know some of those choices were made in the spring after Ames web testing, for example, I know that from Leeds, um, they knew like the incoming first graders um, this year would have some more needs than um, a pre-COVID no, uh, regular first grade class. Um, and so they purchased more of those early leveled readers like in the early alphabet range um, to be prepared for them for when they came in September. So um, the vote is merely um, to accept this money and then it will come to you, um, it will come to the school department. I think it takes about a week for an e-transfer. Um, if there, uh, do you have any questions? based on the um, information. Any questions for Amy? Um, okay, well, um, thank you obviously for, for this and thanks to NEF for um, all the different ways that it raises funds to support our schools. Um, I would entertain a motion um, to, to um, accept this uh, donation from the NEF book fund. Motion to accept the donation from the NEF Book Fund, and thank you very much. Second. Okay. Uh, any further questions? If not, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Thanks, Amy. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes, thank you. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. And Member Condon. Yes. The vote is 10 in favor. Thank you all. Excellent, thank you, Amy. Okay, the next item on our agenda is a um, vote, and this is to um, increase substitute teacher pay to $100 per day. Um, and I'll turn this over to Dr. Provost. Thank you. I actually think this is the first um, 
act I've made under the policy giving me emergency COVID powers. Um, we, as I explained to you in an email, and I'll explain to the public now, we have had in a precipitous drop in our ability to fill sub positions. Um, at the time I made this move, our fill rate was about 40%. Typically our fill rate for sub positions would be 70 to 80%. And um, anyone, anyone who's uh, worked in a school that has, has even 20 to 30% of people out and the day knows how difficult it is to get through the day. So imagine it being 60% of the people out and uncovered in the middle of the day. So this is um, this is something that I felt was important to do to try to increase our competitiveness. Uh, the hundred dollar a day rate would put us uh, with the top um, paying districts for subs in the in the um, area. I will say in the 10 days since the new rate has been into effect, um, it hasn't helped. We've had 356 vacancies over the last nine days. We've, and we've only been able to fill it about 32%. Um, so more than 200 of those vacancies went un, unfilled in the last nine days. Um, however, I don't think that going back to the lower rate is gonna do anything to improve our uh, fill rate. I just think it's, it's symptomatic of what we're seeing all across the, the workforce. There's not enough workers in any field. Um, we don't have enough workers to do pool testing. We don't have enough workers to deliver food to our schools. We're um, juggling, we're juggling um, menus because we don't have enough workers to pick food out of fields or to um, stock warehouses. We were talking about trying to implement midnight deliveries because they're, they're running the few truckers they have on outrageous hours. Um, I just think they're not enough workers right now, but I do think it's a move in the right direction to increase this, this rate. And I would ask for your support to make the um, increase permanent. Okay. Um, I have hands from member Serafie Cox and member Kaufman. Member Serafie Cox. Thank you. Apologies for having my camera off. I'm experiencing some pretty severe back pain, so I'm laying down at the moment. But um, my question is really about um, where our, you know, where we were earlier talking about where our teacher pay and, and other the other units that will be um, um, looking at salaries for in the next year where that lies in terms of the, um, our counterparts. Um, so I'm just curious, since we're, it, we're probably competing against other districts in a certain sense, where do we lie in terms of other districts? Uh, you're on mute. So the prior rate, which is $87 a day, would put us about in the middle of the pack. This new rate will put us at the top for um, other districts in the area. There are, I believe, one or two other districts that also pay $100 a day, um, but it, it will put us right up there. Did that answer your question, um, Member Serafie Cox? Um, more or less, I, um, I, I mean, I've, I, I guess I'd like to maybe know more specific, obviously, uh, um, superintendent provost wouldn't be able to provide that for us right now. And I plan on supporting this, so I don't need that information right now, but I do think that, um, actually looking at those numbers would be helpful for me. If, um, if I, you could come back to me in a minute, I will look up at an email I sent and, and just um, re read those into the record. We've got a couple of other questions um, as well. So you can, if you want to find that, John, um, if you can multitask. Uh, uh, Member Kaufman. Yeah, thank you. So when we don't have subs, then what happens in the classroom? Sorry, I was working on the email. Yeah. Um, yeah. When, when we don't have subs, uh, it is extremely difficult to get through the day. I think is the, the best way to put it. Principals uh, are stretched to the 
limit of their creativity and staff are pulled in all kinds of different directions. Sometimes we have classrooms that are covered by ESPs. Um, sometimes we have um, classrooms that are covered by other teachers who work during their prep period. Um, okay. And we've been doing all of those kinds of strategies just to, to try to get through the situation. Yeah, that's what I figured. So, I mean, I, I would definitely not only support this, but have you considered more money? It, it seems like such an abominably low amount of money to begin with. I used to sub, I used to get $15 a class. So I get like 45 bucks. So this was in 1984. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable how little money that is. And I know that there's a mixed range of subs, but you know, if we can get subs who are good and know the school system, and I mean, it just seems like would have such a positive impact on student learning and on the whole culture of the school. So I guess my question is, have you considered more? I don't know what it's gonna take, but if we paid 115, 120, does that hurt our budget too much? And if, so, and if not, would that make a difference? I'm, I'm not opposed to uh, a higher rate. I would turn to Nick for what the potential impact would be. Yeah. I'm, I'm somewhat um, concerned that I don't think it will help too much based on the, the the impact of increasing the last increase we did. But um, that being said, I, I have no problem with going above the $100. Let me let me try to find those figures on what other districts are paying. Yeah, I mean, you probably get your peers angry at you. You care? Uh, no, I mean, I'm sure they would raise their rates too. And then, you yeah. know, we, we, it's right now a, a, a seller's market for subs, I guess. Well, I would advocate for that, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. That's not on the agenda, but I would advocate for even more unless somebody has a counter argument that makes sense. Um, uh, let's go through the questions and then at some point someone will need to make a motion. So certainly if you wanted to make a motion that was different than what the superintendent was requesting, that's certainly, I suppose, um, possible. Member okay. Gold? Um, what is the, the timeline? Is, is this like a temporary increase, uh, Dr. Provost, or is this a permanent? Sorry if I missed that. I would propose to make it permanent. Okay, thanks. Member Voss. I'm just going to follow up on what Member Kaufman said. I was going to ask the same question. I would really support making it higher. Um, I can't really imagine what if what happens when only 30% of the sub the courses are covered and especially this year with COVID going on, um, this is a way to support our teachers so that they're not over stressed during the day. And it's also what our kids need. And um, even if it's gonna cost some money, I think we have to find it. So I, I don't know, I, I would think if we were offering a good percentage more over the, over other districts, maybe people would come here. And I think it's a hard job to do for a day, especially with what's going on in the world. Um, so I can make a motion and somebody can offer a friendly amendment if you don't like the amount. Um, and if we get more information on how much this might cost, that's fine. But it, it feels to me like it's, how can you send kids to school if there's no teacher there? It just, it's, we have to figure out a way to try to support it. So I'll make a motion that we increase it to $120 a day. And again, I'm really open to a friendly amendment, but we need to solve this. I'll second that. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded. I do have some other member, um, I'm just, can I go to you, John? Do you have the numbers you wanna share? I do, so I did share this in an email earlier, but um, for the community, the FY22 rate for Frontier is $93 a day. It's uh, scheduled to go to 97 for next year. Gateway is currently at $100. Granby is 70, 75, um, 70 and 75, proposed to go to 80 and 85, or $90 for a retired teacher. Hadley's at 80 for uncertified and 85 for certified. Hatfield is at 90 for licensed and 80 for unlicensed. Mahar is at 95. Mohawk is at 13.50 an hour currently um, and proposed to go to $15 an hour for next year. And then just um, our rates that we had moved up from were 87 and 85.
sorry, proud Mohawk alum here. Sorry about that. I got a little emotional. Um, uh, okay, Member Levy, do you have a question? Yeah, I, uh, I, I know that this is a lot worse right now because of COVID, but my understanding is this is not a new issue for us as a district that we've, that we've uh, struggled in the past to get sub coverage. And I'm wondering if, well, I guess this is a budget, a, something that, that really is a budgetary issue, but I, I would propose that we budget in our next uh, opportunity for district-wide subs, folks who are within our schools, get to know our culture, get to know the students and are available on a daily basis. Um, I mean, that we would still need to hire other subs because we would probably not have enough to go around every time we need a sub, but I think that would help us moving forward. And I'd like us to think about that uh, when, we, when we're when we writing the budget. Was that a comment or did you want uh, feedback on the history? I, I'm happy, I don't know, it's mostly a comment. Uh, I'm just watching the time, so. Okay. Member Goldman. Thank you. Um, Nick, I'd appreciate any thoughts you have on this topic. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I guess my thoughts would be in, in two different opposing directions. I mean, obviously we're in a situation where there is a labor shortage and we have to do something in order to, you know, try to fix that as best as we can. Um, part of me feels that I, I, I don't know if throwing more money at it is going to be that impactful. Um, I honestly, I, there's just, there's a lack of workers out there um, in all sectors everywhere. It's, I mean, you're seeing it all over the place. Um, it, it may have a, a slight impact. Um, budgetary wise, you know, that, that's, that is a large increase. I and mean, we started at what, $87, um, you know, when we made the FY22 budget or when that was made prior to me being here, uh, increasing it to $120 a day, that, that's a lot. Um, that's $33 a day more. And, uh, you know, it certainly when they made, you know, the amounts that they were gonna put in all the substitute accounts for the buildings, it was based on an $87 a day rate. It was not based on a you know, $120 a day rate. Um, you know, I mean, I, I can't like right now without, you know, I, I guess crunching some numbers and looking at things, tell you exactly what the budgetary impact would, would be. Um, you know, on the one side, the fact that we're currently rocking about a 40 to under percent fill rate means that our sub accounts are not taking a huge hit on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so there's that. I mean, if we do increase what we pay them, uh, you know, that there, there's at least in the short term money there that we're not spending on, on subs um, because they're not taking the jobs at this point. Um, so, I, I mean, I would really need to, to look at the numbers and see, you know, what the long-term impact on that would be. Um, you know, I, I, I honestly, in my experience as a building principal in the past, I'm definitely uh, piggybacking on what member Levy said, having permanent building subs was, was definitely good. Um, Cause I, you know, I had one in my building um, and they were there every day um, doing whatever was needed. They could be an ESP, they could be a teacher, they could, uh, they were, I had a substantially separate special education program in my building and they were in there sometimes. They, they knew the culture of the building, they knew the kids, they knew the staff, even some pair, uh, caregivers. Um, I, I don't know the history of, of that's ever happened here in Northampton, if, if permanent building subs have ever existed here, I'm not sure. Um, but it, it worked well, at least in my prior district, and it, it kind of gave you some stability. Um, the problem I encountered with it is uh, in my previous district, um, they had to be certified. Um, and, th and that's not a, a mass state law or a DESE thing or anything. It was just a, an Agawam preference, really. 
And it's sometimes been difficult to hire people because most folks that are certified are looking for full-time permanent, you know, teaching positions. Um, so, but I, I don't believe based on like the sub requirements that I've read here that that would necessarily be a requirement. So that, that might make it easier to hire these, these folks. Thank you. Um, Member Voss, I'd like to make a friendly amendment to your um, to your motion that um, maybe we could do make it one hundred dollars per day permanently, but make it one hundred and twenty dollars for the next, say, three months um, or for some period of time, based on um, what Nick said, and we could wait until we have. Uh, more information about the impact that a more significant increase would have on our budget and on whether that does the trick. Maybe we, we could use those resources um, for some other solution if it doesn't, if it's not effective. So there's a, a friendly amendment. I, I would turn to the maker of the motion that they would have to accept that friendly amendment. Um, I'm not. I'm not opposed to it. If others want it, I'm feeling very flexible. My sense is, if we are offering 120 in Northampton, we're going to have more takers. And if only, like Nick said, 30 or 40 percent, or we, you know, we'd have to get up to 60 or 70 percent um, to even be to exceed the current budget we have. But I, I guess a question I have related to this is. Does anybody know our substitute budget for the year? Um, because we could add 30% to that and see how much money we're really talking about. Um, and, and another question is, can't we use some of our ESSER money for this kind of thing? Um, this is certainly not, right now the need for subs does include some of the COVID issues. And I, 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 I don't know, I just, I wonder, like, I guess I'd be more inclined to say keep it for this whole school year since the school, once we start getting certain subs in there, if they would return, it would be really nice. So I'm not against putting a limit on it. I'm just, I, I think my, my gut tells me we can absolutely afford that this year and we kind of have to, to support our community if it helps get us more subs. Um, Member Goldman, would you be comfortable if we amended it to just say for this school year? I'm just concerned that we're making this sort of from the hip decision um, without a lot of information about, about it at this point. Um, I think I'd rather, you know, have the numbers crunched and have people think about it a little bit. I mean, the, the idea of increasing it more than $100 just came up. I feel unprepared to make an educated vote um, on the increase. I'm curious to hear what the other people who have their hands up have to say. Can I just go to uh, Nick? Nick, you are you responding directly to, um, to the, I think, the question that was asked? Um, well, I can address the question about Esther. Uh, yeah, Esther money could be used to um, pay for substitutes, absolutely. Um, because you can, you know, attribute staff absence directly in many cases to quarantining or caring for a child who has to quarantine or, you know, being out until they get a test or, or whatever COVID related absence you're, you're looking at there. Um, we definitely could do that. Um, if we were to raise the, the rate, um, you know, for, for just a limited period of time, though, I worry that once that period of time expires, then we're going to be back where we started. You know, we can't, once we offer X amount of, of money per day, then, you know, take it away. Um, you know, the way the building sub budgets are designed, um, you know, there's, there, there's actually a couple different categories. There's regular ed subs or special ed subs, there's ESP subs and uh, you know depending on the building a different amount gets allocated in each each place um there's there's less in the special ed sub accounts just because there's fewer special ed teachers than there are 
uh, regular ed teachers. Um, and it's always a moving target too, because you, you really can't predict staff absence with any sort of certainty. Um, you know, but we also have to consider the future here and, and remember that at, at some point, although none of us in this meeting or, or really anywhere can tell you when, um, the pandemic will end. Like these absences will eventually decrease. Um, this is not a forever thing, although in the moment it seems like it will be. And uh, believe me, I know that very well as a former building principal juggling this on a day-to-day -day basis with almost no subs last year. I've, I've lived that, so I can definitely be very sympathetic to all of the efforts that our principals are making and, and the staff that are covering these classes. Too. And, and I, I, I know exactly what they're doing. and I very much appreciate all that work. Um, so, I, I mean, I... If somebody was to ask me my advice about this, um, you know, I would, I mean, if, if, if the committee feels that 100 is, is too low, um, but maybe 120 is too high without all of, you know, without any sort of numerical analysis or anything like that, I don't know, maybe meet somewhere in the middle. Um, and then when we're making our budget for next year, you know, be mindful of, obviously of, of whatever rate increase gets decided upon, but also mindful of the fact that, you know, these absences will eventually decrease. So um, before I go to other hands, I just wanna bring closure to the friendly amendment because there was a, there, we do have an amendment that's been made and seconded. There's been an offer of a friendly amendment, some back and forth. Um, it sounds like, Go ahead. I, I'd like to keep it on the table, but hear what other people have to say, just so I can kind of get a sense if that's okay. Okay. So then you're, but I just want to say that not you're, yet, not yet. You haven't just, accepted yeah. the, you haven't accepted the friendly amendment. So okay. But I haven't rejected it either. Okay. Oh, understood. Um, so member Gold. Um. Yeah, I was just going to share in case the, the acceptance means anything um, impacts the acceptance that I would have liked to I'd like to see us do it just for the, the school year and just say that's what it is. And so um, we at least know it's a commitment through this year. And then if we can lower it, then we'll lower it. So I'm, a, I'm comfortable with raising it to the um, 120. Um, maybe we could say raising it to 120 for certified and 100 for uh, 120 for licensed and 100 for um, unlicensed subs for the remainder of 2022. Member Fallon. Um, so first off, I do wanna say, I appreciate what Member Goldman said about kind of moving beyond the scope of this too much. Like I, I really only wanna address the, the substitute rate that you brought, because I do think that there is a lot to be discussed around permanent substitutes. And I think that tonight's not the night for that discussion. But I, I do wanna bring up the point of equity on a global scale. We say that we're promoting it in our district, but I do worry that if we raise the rate too high that there are districts surrounding us that we've already said are paying $85. Now we're raising our rate to $120. And, and I get that that, you know, it's a it's a labor market. It has to be competitive. But I do I will feel a little bit bad if if other districts can't even remotely compete um, or are forced to raise their their rates to that level or unable to. Um, and so I was a little bit more comfortable um, when we were at one hundred dollars per day. Um, and I also would feel like as a long term plan, having one um, hundred dollars per day as a you know, or having a salaried position where we were able to use it as a stepping stone for people um, who want to enter the profession and offering benefits. I think that that would be a great way to have a permanent um, pool of substitutes available. But, um, but yeah, so that was my only thought was how you feel, Dr. Provost, about this as our other superintendents going to be upset with you if they find out what you're offering substitutes and that they no longer can get them. Well, I think you know the the most likely outcome was will be will be that they'll raise their rates too. Some of them, it'll be harder for them to do than for others. Um, well, while I have the floor, you know, one thing I wonder, because we're all we're all just trying to pick numbers, and I'm doing that too, right? I said 
hundred dollars based on what everyone else is doing. That means no one else is paying more than us. So there'd be no financial reason for a sub to go anywhere else. I hear what you're saying about um, wanting to be even more competitive than that. But I wonder if it would be possible or desirable to try to do this um, empirically by telling me what my limits are, asking me to keep raising you know, the sub rate until we reach a balance point between what our, our um, demand is and, and who's willing to come in. And then, you know, that might be a way of trying to find what the, the optimum solution to this problem is. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if I'm being clear right now. Um, do folks need clarification? So essentially giving you the authorization to go up to a certain level in the school year, um, but not necessarily you're going to jump right to it, that you would, that you would um, adjust the rate to see what the response is. Correct. Okay. Member Serafi Cox. Uh, thank you. I um, just wanted to express my support for, uh, well, as I said before, express support for the raise in general, but um, I would be supportive of uh, member bosses. Um, uh, proposal, but I also like what uh, what Superintendent Provost just uh, just suggested. So if Member Voss was amenable to that, then um, I would definitely uh, be supportive of that. And um, I'm also cognizant of the other things on the agenda. So maybe um, moving to a vote on this. And I'm ready to 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 state my motion. Uh, Member Voss, your hand is up next. Yep, I know. So I, um, taking into this all of this, I'll I'm gonna make a bit of an uh, amendment to my motion. And um, Dr. Provost, if I I want to just personally, and that's what my motion is gonna be, just set the highest rate that seems reasonable and not make you play that game. I just think it's more efficient, and I think these people work really hard and and I do want to just respond if some of those numbers you said if you divide them by six hours they're not even really close they're very marginally minimum wage minimum wage is going up every year right now and so where I'll tell people where I got the 120 I was thinking a substitute was probably in the school for about six hours so that's twenty dollars an hour and that to me is um, a pretty hard job for twenty dollars an hour whether or not you have a certification or not. And so I, for me, I'm really comfortable with that. And I hear we don't, it's a little bit last minute and it's during COVID. So what I'm going to suggest is that we raise it to $120 um, a day for this school year, and then get a report back from Nick and Dr. Provost and the next school committee can continue this practice if, if we, if they think it's necessary, because Certainly our kids are not doing well if they don't have teachers in their classes or substitutes in those cases. So, so that's the amendment um, for the year. Um, and I'm assuming the seconder is okay with that? Yes, okay. Okay. Um, so now member Serafi Cox. No, I already spoke. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, member Fallon. Can I just ask why we have to vote on this at all? If the if you had already taken this measure under the pandemic policy to begin with, sure. Because the policy says that at, if I do take an emergency action, I'll bring it to the committee at the next meeting for their approval. Right, but could you have done? Could you raise this again then? Essentially. Like, could, I'm saying, like, can't you keep I, toggling I, with this? I without could. Our I could. That was kind of the essence of my, the last thought I put out, which is, you know, if you wanted to define the um, limits of, of what you would consider to be reasonable discretion, I could move within that. That's not the motions on the floor, but I believe that with the other policy, that would have been permissible. Okay, thank you. Okay, so there has been a motion made and seconded, and the motion is to increase the sub rate to $120 a day through the end of the 2021-2022 school year, and then that the business administrator and the superintendent will analyze and continue to monitor and revisit with the next 
school committee as part of the FY 2023 budget process, if I summarize that correctly. Okay, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Vysansky. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. And Member Levy. Yes. The vote is 10 in favor. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is a request to approve um, uh, the, uh, the, the acquisition of board docs software. Um, and I know there was a little explainer in your packet, uh, Dr. Provost uh, and or other folks that are here to speak to this. Do you want to give us an overview? Sure, I will give the general overview and then I will turn it over to Drew Wareham if he's on the call. Um, so this would be a request for approval for funding for the conversion to board docs. It's a subscription product. It's $18,000 a year. There is a um, $1,000 discount when you join. Um, there are many districts. The other thing is that this would be a change in the procedure for the school committee. So instead of um, having all the documents created and shared via Google Docs and Drive, they would be um, shared by through this board docs process, which is a solution that's specifically for school committees and school boards. Um, I would just share from my perspective, the committee is extremely active right now. There are a lot of meetings. There are a lot of subcommittee meetings. We're um, gearing up for um, negotiations on the CBA to begin again. So that's going to exponentially increase um, the amount of meetings and efficiency is important. You know, we've been um, farming out some of this work to um, help Annie try to keep up with minutes, but anything we can do I, to, to assist her and to make that process more efficient, I think would be helpful, not only to her, but I think for the members who um, want to get minutes as quickly as possible and want to make sure that packets are kept organized. So with that, you know, I would turn it over to Drew if he has more detailed information to share about the board doc solution. Hey, Dr. Provost, thank you. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Perfect. Do I have access to share my screen? I actually have a demo I could walk through in about five to 10 minutes here if I'm allowed. Um, I can get it, I can get through it real quickly. Let's take a look here. Can you guys all see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so uh, appreciate you guys um, letting me present to you all tonight. I know it's already late, so I'll, I'll get through this here in about five minutes and then um, save some time for questions if you guys do have them. Just to piggyback um, of what already has been spoken, you know, board docs, uh, you'll hear me say it a lot, is that one-stop shop mentality. Um, most of our districts in the state of Massachusetts, what they'll do is have their board docs URL hyperlinked onto their committee or, or district's website. So if I hit the you know, school committees tab or the agendas and minutes tab, it's going to hyperlink me to this board doc screen. So just for timing purposes today, I'm only going to cover the user, user facing side of board docs. But keep in mind, this is also what the public is going to be seeing. Now, the nice thing with board docs on the user side is we can have a public agenda but maybe there's some private content on the back end that we'd like to share. That goes for our regular school committee and any other subcommittees that we may have. So real quickly here um, on this feature page is where we'll see any of our most recent or um, any most relevant uh, content that we've created. So you can see here, I do have um, a most recent board meeting, also had a finance committee meeting recently. We have general documentation, events, board goals, um, and policies. So really just quick access here. But to show you guys my most recent meeting, this will pull me to my meetings tab from the featured page. Um, so I do apologize if my Wi-Fi is being a little bit slow tonight. Doesn't like working with Zoom. But what this will do is bring me to my meetings archive. And this is where we'll find any of our previous agendas and minutes. 
So very transparent for the public and very easy for them to search or find any information that they're looking for. And even uh, as committee members yourselves, if we're in a meeting and we wanna go back and reference a previous agenda, um, anything in board docs is gonna be keyword searchable. So whether we're preparing for the actual school board committee meeting and wanna see what our other subcommittees are discussing, very easy for us to review those agendas and help prepare for the agenda itself for our school committee. So just going into this agenda itself, we'll find our agenda items and categories to our left side. This is completely customizable. So we're gonna match your current agenda layout and put it into the board docs digital format here. And then as we click through each item, so I'll go down to some of my, um, let's go to just a regular policy reading. If we have a paper icon next to an item, we're gonna see that there is an attachment related to that. So as I click on each item, it's gonna pull up any of that uh, detail for that specific item. So it keeps the agenda very clean. Um, and we can also post our attachments in here as well. There's no limit on the amount of attachments we include, no limit on attachment type, and no limit um, on the amount of attachments we include per one agenda item. Board docs will also allow you to tag any goals which are found in our library section here. So as we're working on goals as a school committee and want to be, again, that transparency to our public, I'll quickly go over to our goals section here, and this will allow us to track any of our goals that we're working on, whether they're committee goals, um, new hires that we need. I heard you guys mention substitute teachers. We can post job recs on here, contracts we're working on, COVID updates. So really just completing that one-stop shop mentality, and those are able to be tagged into agenda items, as we can see here. Notice that there's three levels of content, public content, administrative, and executive. Public is obviously what the public's going to see when they access your board doc site. We can have a public item, but maybe there's some private reporting on the back end, whether that's disciplinary, you know, new hire resumes, you name it. Um, so we can separate who can see what based off of user permissions here on the back end. What's also nice with board docs, and I won't go through how we can generate the minutes fully, but we have what is called a meeting control panel. And that will actually allow Annie to record minutes and take voting during a real or during a live session, I should say. As we take these votes, that resolution is going to show immediately on the agenda. So if the public is joining via Zoom or they're just following along during the meeting, we won't have to wait for next month's minutes to be approved to at least see any of our action items with their motions. After the meeting, Annie has to click one, one button. It's called Load Minutes from MCP, and that'll generate your minutes, I'm not kidding, in 30 seconds. Um, what that will allow her to do is then tag those minutes either on the site or tag them to the next month's agenda for approval. Once you all do approve those minutes, all we have to do is simply hit this release button, and that's going to give the minutes access to the public. Simple as that. So very, very quick, very efficient. Also keeps everything in one location, and everything's keyword searchable. You can also track your policy books in here, whether that's you know the school district's policy, uh, student handbooks, employee handbooks, you name it. So just like with the agenda, everything is cloud-based. So whether we're making updates to active agendas, making changes or revisions to policies, first reading, second reading, legal review, you name it, everything's cloud-based. So as we make updates to agendas and minutes and policies, it's gonna update for our public and our board right away. So we know that we're always looking at the most recent or most updated version of any of our material in here. Just like with the agendas, everything is keyword searchable and our support and training team is gonna help you get all of your previous content or your current policies into board docs if we do end up moving forward here. Lastly, I'll finish on this library section. And I think this really completes the one-stop shop mentality. This will allow us to post in our general section, any generic or general information. I see commonly posted in here board notes that go out again on that private side. So if we have weekly updates from the superintendent or board president, we can quickly get that out to our board members. I see newsletters get posted to the public a lot in here. And then anything from you know COVID updates to return to school plans, as creative as you guys want to be. This is a really great place to be very transparent to our members and to our, to our public. Events is pretty self-explanatory. We can track upcoming events we have on the featured page. And then I did briefly mention the strategic goals here. So not only can the school committee use board docs, but you can also separate by subcommittee as well. This will give them access rights to run their group completely separate from the actual school committee. So you're gonna have your own publishers for each group. You're gonna have your own user permissions for each group. So they're basically using board docs like you all would be if we moved forward to manage and govern their own separate meeting body um, separate from the actual school committee. 
what this does is just, again, that transparency tool. It's that one-stop shop mentality. So I'll quickly go to my finance committee, which will pull any of my finance committee's agendas, minutes, documentation, attachments, you name it. Real quickly, did want to show you guys a feature, and then I'll finish. Um, I, I noticed that we're doing Zoom tonight. Another great way to get our, our link out to our public members, if we do have public comments or just to our, our school committee itself, you can actually tag your, your Zoom or WebEx or Google Hangouts meeting directly on your agenda notice here. Um, so that was like the 10,000 foot overview. I know I went through that very quickly, but um, is there any questions that I can answer for you all or anything in specific I can go into more detail? So we have a we have a one hand. I just wanted to ask a quick question. I assuming since this is in Massachusetts and in other Massachusetts districts, there is a mechanism. We still have to file a, a notice with the city clerk, right? So we still this will generate an agenda that can then be filed with the city clerk prior to the meeting. Yes, absolutely. So we can either share or actually download the agenda itself. Most of our Massachusetts districts will copy this agenda's URL and then send out to the clerk. Um, I did forget to mention that we are partnered with the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. Um, so not only do you have the resources of board docs, you also have MASC for, you know, support um, and also, you know, does grant you guys some discounted pricing as well. Okay, member Serafie Cox. Two questions. Uh, one is, um, what is the mobile uh, accessibility of this feature or of yeah, of these, uh, both for the public and as uh, school committee members, because I'm often on Zoom with my computer and then looking at sure. the documents on my phone. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a great question. So anything with internet or uh, data, if we're on a cell phone, so tablets, laptops, computers, mobile devices, you name it, you'll be so able to access a, board.com. It's a mobile friendly website. It's not an app. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then my second question is, um, I facilitate the um, negotiations for mm -hmm. the school committee, um, and we use a lot of shared documents in order to track changes of very complicated um, agreements and documents. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so those attachments, those can be like a, a Google Doc, which is what we use now. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So again, there's no file type limit. So you can think of it, you can post it in here. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I, th I think those are my questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions about this? Um, how many, uh, how many, Districts are you in in Massachusetts? I'm just curious. Um, that's a great question. I do know right now we have 42 current customers in Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure specifically how many districts we have using it, okay. uh, yeah. but I know that we have 42 current clients, whether those are educational services, school districts, community colleges, um, and technical schools. So, Okay. Um, and obviously, uh, Annie, you, this is something you've reviewed with our IT department and, uh, and you know, Antonio, Molly, et cetera. Yep, they said that it would be very easy to attach us to our website and we would just be able to use it. And they liked it. Member Gold? Um, yeah, that was sort of my question. Is that this was something that are uh, the school commit the school district initiated going to look for like what can we do to streamline our process kind of thing and and you guys found this one that was it i can answer that i found it through my masc listserv um other clerks across the state were singing the praises of board docs and one of them offered a demonstration withdrew and i um i attended that meeting and then after that i got another demonstration from drew and and presented it to the superintendent and the mayor and the business administrator and the IT department and everyone take a look, took a look at it and uh, they advised, they liked it. Okay, um, so, uh, so the, the, um, the request on tonight's agenda is to essentially approve the school uh, district, um, you know, moving forward with with um, subscribing to it and beginning the implementation and training process for it. So, 
Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the board doc software if someone would make that. Motion to approve board doc software proposal. Second. Okay. Are there any other questions or discussion, Member Gold? Yeah, just one, where where is this? Where from the budget is this coming from exactly? I'm sorry if I missed that. I'm just gonna, I'm going to have to do transfers out of accounts that we're not spending as much out of that we anticipated in order to cover it. I'll be able to do it. And is it a one year? Was it a one year license for eighteen thousand or? Yeah, that's going to be an annual cost, so it's going to have to be built into the uh, subsequent budgets after this year. Okay. Also, do want to mention that signature price would be your annual subscription cost moving forward, even if MASC does raise their pricing in the future. So whatever your signature cost would, would be your annual renewal. Okay, any other questions? Uh, uh, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Goldman. Yes, please. <laughs> Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. 10 years too late, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Member Busansky. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. No. And Member Kaufman. Yes. The vote is nine in favor, one against. Okay, so that motion carries. And um, thank you very much uh, uh, for that presentation. Um, and thank you all. <laughs> so now no, let's thank move you on. guys. Thank you. Thank you, Drew, for the presentation. No problem. Bye bye. Um, so now we'll move on to a vote to award the math tutoring bid to the U.S. Math Recovery Council. Um, and I'll turn this over to, uh, to Nick, I guess, who's going to explain it. And so this has to do with our liftoff learning program. Um, as you've heard in previous meetings, um, we're somewhat, we've had somewhat trouble staffing that in all of our four elementary buildings. Um, so we looked at different options of how we could do that. Um, <clears throat> and we work with the U.S. Math Recovery Council um, regularly. Um, they basically run a program um, called AVMR, which is an evidence-based math intervention program um, that is used in our schools. Um, and, you know, in, in attempting to find some solutions for our uh, liftoff learning staffing, uh, we came across um, what they refer to as a math champs tutoring program where they, they basically um, provide an intensive math intervention um, in very small groups. Um, so <clears throat> due to the cost of it, it was above the uh, $49,999 threshold of um, where I could, you know, just get quotes. Um, I needed to open it up to uh, a competitive bidding process, um, which I did. And I only received one bid, um, although 12 different uh, companies did reach out asking for the specifications. Um, the only one that actually responded was the uh, US Math Recovery Council. Um, so based on uh, their math, um, you see in the, the, um, the memo that was in your packet, um, their bid was uh, $165,726, but that is based on 12 tutors. Um, we are only going to be using eight. Um, so following their, you know, the formula, which, you know, is basically their price point, um, it would uh, cost us $110,484 to utilize the uh, tutors uh, eight tutors for um, a period of 33 total days, um, basically covering an 11 week time span of our liftoff learning. Um, and currently uh, some of these tutors are working uh, with Bridge Street in the liftoff program. Um, I did a partial service agreement prior to going out to competitive bid. Um, 
should this be um, approved by uh, the committee, uh, there will be three more weeks at Bridge Street. Um, the um, screening data showed that the need there was the greatest. That's why we started there. Um, the other three buildings, the need was not as great, although still there. So um, after the Bridge Street stint is done, um, the eight tutors would spread out between the other three elementary schools um, and provide the intensive intervention um, to the students whose data shows they uh, needed the most. Um, so I am still um, essentially playing phone tag with the um, person from US Math Recovery Council who submitted the bid. Um, so I, however, I could not get to the contract portion of it until you vote to approve it. So um, I just ask for your support in that tonight um, so I can move forward and, and you know, continue these services for our, our students. Okay, any, um, any questions or comments? Member Kaufman. Yep, thanks again, Nick. So, I mean, I, I guess I just have to ask what, um, so it's 33 days total or 33 days for each of the eight representing 200, whatever that is, 64 days? Well, it's 33 total days. Eight tutors would be working on each of those 33 days. And they would meet with two groups of students during each of those days. Okay, so the tutors aren't eight, eight tutors, 33 days each. Is that what you mean? As opposed to, is that right? Yeah, the, the, um, it would be slated to start on October 20th and it would end um, 11 weeks after that. I think that gets us with vacations to somewhere in mid to late January. No, but I know, but just so I understand. So it's eight tutors working collectively third, for a total of 33 days. Yes. Okay, I think I got that right. So it's, okay. So I'm just wondering, have we gotten any feedback yet from our math department chair or anybody just in terms of the quality of this company? Is it working out well? Are they doing a good job? Have you gotten feedback on whether we should continue with them or seek elsewhere? Um, Dr. Choquette at our last ALT meeting um, spoke very highly of the experience thus far at Bridge Street um, and even prior to them working with liftoff learning, as I said, they, they've worked with our district before. They've provided professional development. We have several um, educators trained in AVMR math yep. intervention. Um, yep. So it's, it is definitely familiar to our district. Are you, did you want to add to that question, Dr. Provost? I did. Um, I'll just add that, you know, th this is part of a tier two intervention, which is based on a universal screening and progress monitoring. This company is providing us with progress monitoring every 10 lessons with the students who are receiving the intervention. And they're providing very detailed notes on the progress the students are making in those two week segments of, of instruction. So I've been impressed for the progress monitoring side of this. And uh, the lessons- the results, You mean, you've seen the results, you're impressed with the results or just the fact that they're giving results I mean, are the results positive so i i haven't seen enough i haven't seen enough samples to be able to comment on the direction that the data is going in but i i can say that they're taking very um very detailed probes of the student's skills so it'll allow us to see how they're doing as we get more reports in okay okay um, um uh, before I go to you, Member Gold, can I just clarify? Was this a was this a competitively bid? Uh, like you put out a bid, uh, Nick, and we received competitive bids. I only received the bid from them. I, I did have twelve companies email me asking me for the okay. specifications, but they never actually they they weren't able to meet them or they weren't okay. interested. But I just wanted to clarify that the choice tonight is to either award or to throw out all the bidders and go back out to bid again. No, it's to award. But I'm just saying that if we don't award, there's not, then we would basically go back to go back out to bid. I just wanted to clarify that. Yes, so. if you don't, if you don't award, um, what'll happen is on Tuesday, October 19th, um, liftoff learning AVMR math tutoring will end. 
It will not lift off. It will no. It will be on the ground. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's go to Ronnie. Uh, let's go to uh, Ronnie. Uh, Member Gold. Um, just to clarify, make sure everyone understands this as well. These are all remote. This is all remote tutoring, correct? Correct. Um, right. They they do um, frequently film the lessons though to use them for progress monitoring as well as to tailor the next lesson. Um, so they're they're highly individualized. Okay, um, and then um, the only thing I'll share is you know there's regardless of what you think of the program the, to become licensed to be able to do this remotely. This is not just like they're farming out employees from anywhere in the world. Like it's, there's a high level of certification that goes into being able to do this. Just so everyone knows, like you have to become a, like, just like our staff in Northampton have had to go through all this training. People throughout the country have done all this training. All they've realized is we could do this now remotely. So you have people in Minnesota where it was started in Wisconsin, the Midwest that are zooming in. And um, so we at least know that the quality of the people that will be working with our students, um, even though it seems like a whole lot of money for a people, but at least we know that the quality is um, is a vetted thing. It's just to share that with folks. And I wrote the bid specifications intentionally, so they had to have champion level um, certification in ABMR. Um, so we, we are getting highly qualified um, folks doing this. Member Voss. Thanks. Um, I'm glad to hear we're doing a high quality intervention here. Um, I want to just understand the cost a little more. Um, and I'm assuming we can use, I oh, forget, I know we're using us for money. Um, so it's 33 days times eight people. And how many hours a day are these people doing this for? They're, each tutor works for one hour. Um, they see two different groups. The sessions are a half an hour apiece. Each group um, consists of three students. So essentially they see six students okay. in that right. day, which it came out to like $418 an hour, which I, I understand what your thought is, believe me. Um, so, so that's that's what I wanted to understand. $418 an hour. Certainly there's some overhead for the company, but um, that's a lot of money. And I don't know how to digest that because... $500 an hour is a million dollar salary. So this is $800,000 salary, but there, I, I understand there's a company involved here, I guess, with the technology, but that feels like a lot. It, it does, but we also don't know what they're paying their individual tutors. I mean, I, I don't know what the company's overhead costs are. I don't know what indirect costs are. I don't know what their benefits are. I mean, it, it you know, the, I, I have no idea what they're actually paying the staff that are providing these interventions for. I mean, I'm just going to say if we need this and hearing what how highly trained they are, I'm not I, in a position where I think it should be opposed. But I think we should if we need more of this, we should probably see if there's other options, because this sounds um, extremely expensive to me. <laughs> Well, we, we did look at several options um, in the summer when we were attempting to, you know, put the program together. I mean, uh, our own staff were, were the preferred people that we would hire, um, you know, those that were interested. And um, when we, you know, saw that there were some staffing shortages, we reached out to some local colleges. We've, uh, I did some research. I reached out to a couple of other companies, uh, including City Year, who never um, got back to me. And, you know, so I, yeah. I did do some research and some homework over the summer before we, we I think here. if we offered our people $400 an hour, we might have had a bigger response. So I, I actually will turn it around and say, I wonder if we need to rethink what we're offering our people to do extra work outside the school day. And when, just like we raised the sub um, amount um, raise that a little bit and get some in-house people who are, I mean, there was an argument made previously that, and it might've been before you were here, Nick, but um, if some of our employees are interested in doing this, they already know our students. And I think there could, that could be maybe something we should look into is um, rethinking what we pay them. Well, we, we, um, we do have to pay by the contract though. And, and that's where their rates come from. Um, which would be currently $30 an hour for a teacher um, and ESPs that are working in the program. Their rates can vary depending on how many hours they work. 
Um, their normal work weeks are 32.5 hours. Um, if they work an additional two and a half to get up to 35, then overtime gets triggered, which would be their hourly rate times time and a half. So um, each ESP is, is probably making a different rate, um, you know, but it's all, it's, it's just what the contract says we have to pay them. So that's, that's what we're bound by. Okay. I, I have one more follow-up question, then I'm done. And that is, I mean, I don't know what training these people have that we're hiring to this company, but is what they're offering completely different from what our teachers can offer or which would be better for our students? Well, we, we do um, have some staff members. I'm not sure how many off the top of my head that are AVMR trained that are working in liftoff. Um, but the level of training that they have is not the level of training that the, um, the AVMR tutors have. Um, as I said earlier, I wrote the bid specs purposely. So they had to be trained at uh, what the company calls a champion level. Um, and another piece of the bid specifications were that they had to provide documentation of each um, individual tutors actually achieving that level. So there's proof. I mean, because a company could just say, well, I have six people and they're, you know, they could just give me names with no evidence. And, and then our kids aren't getting what they need. So um, uh, the bid that I received um, had all of the requirements that, that I asked for. And, um, you know, while, while the price is high. I, I think we can all agree on that. Um, we are, we're getting a good service for what we're paying. I, I can confidently tell you that. Uh, uh, Dr. Provost. I wanted to point out a couple of other things that I think might have been um, missed in Nick's presentation. While he is accurately um, describing the, the number of contact hours that the tutors are providing. There's a lot of work that's being done to prepare for those lessons that we're paying for as well. As he mentioned, um, many of the lessons are being videotaped and then being reviewed in teams as they prepare what they want to do for the next lesson. Um, and then most importantly, every student gets their own kit of very specialized AVMR materials. Um, those are the same materials that we use in our math recovery program, and those become the district's materials, so we'll be able to reuse those. So that's built into the cost as well. Um, to answer the, the question about training um, to a, a little bit finer detail, you can think of champions within the AVMR world is the people who've achieved a level of training that allows them to create other AVMR teachers. Um, so we do have some champions in the district and they are providing training for our staff so that they can implement AVMR. Um, but all of the tutors who we have are at that champion level, which would be comparable to our professional development people within the district who are training the other teachers to, to implement these techniques. So I just wanted to make sure all of those were sort of on the table when you think about the cost. Member Gold. Yeah, who is a couple of questions, sorry, who's in the room with the three students while they're on Zoom with the, with the coach? So at this point we have it monitored, um, we have it monitored with ESPs who are working in the liftoff learning program. Um, and while I have the floor, I, I wanted to mention one other thing. Um, we do have teachers who are doing this work as well. Um, our preference was to hire our own staff. Um, and in every case where we have a staff member who wants to do this work, they've gotten the job over um, outside tutors. I really just think that it's, it's hard. Um, our staff are, are worn out at the end of the day. When you think of all the things that are happening with COVID, teaching with a mask on all day long, the, catching up the, the learning gaps that kids have, um, helping with the maturity issues that folks are seeing because students have been out of school for so long. And then, you know, on top of it, in an understaffed building most days because we haven't been getting subs, you know, I think the real issue is that um, people need to go home and, and recharge their batteries at the end of the day. And how many students are being serviced in total over the 11 weeks do we think about? Uh, Nick, can you, do you know that number? I know you built it, you're having a conversation with principals around that. 
Uh, well, each small group has three kids. They meet with two uh, groups per day. So, um, you know, basically each tutor sees six students um, a day. So times eight tutors would be 48 students. Okay. And then I'm at, I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, they do cycle as well. So it might be like, there might be other students potentially joining in. My whole point being with that, I mean, it is a large investment. It's around $2,000. Then I was doing that too per student for the 11 weeks. So if any, you know, I don't know if you look at it that way, it doesn't seem as much. Yes, I agree. They're getting an absurd amount of money if you ask me, but um, the last thing I'll do and that, and, and I don't, you know, I have no wood in the game with them at all um, and have my challenges with them, but at least it's an investment in something that the schools are already using. Right. Like, so anything else we bought, you know, teachers might have no clue what the kids did after school, but at least because it's been trained, the teachers have been trained on it. It can be turnkey back during the day and said, Hey, I know what you did after school. Um, so investment wise, it seems more than just those uh, after school time. Okay. So um, again, it's a motion to approve the purchase. To, it's basically to award the bid. Award the, to, to board the contract to the, Lone bidder, as it were, um, is what we're doing. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further? Oh, member boss. Can't hear you, member boss. You're muted. I'm 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 having a tough time voting for this, and I, I I'm not against it. So I just want to say that I haven't decided how I'm going to vote. I might abstain, and the real reason is I I hear you that the contract says we can pay our teachers a certain amount, but I guess I wish we could have explored. And at eleven o'clock, I don't really think now is the time, and the kids do need this, but explored ways to to pay people if they wanted to do it more just like we did with the subs and i'm just feeling like there might have been a better solution and maybe maybe we don't have time so i guess the question is are we only hiring these people for eight weeks right now is that what this is or is it going to be another one and can we think about, about ways to do it differently to keep the money within our own employees if possible the plan is after this 11 weeks is up to um to not continue this i mean it's not sustainable obviously at this cost okay. um and that was really to target the, the students who needed the most support based on their their screening data uh which okay. you know th theoretically and, and certainly hopefully uh this intervention will do what it's supposed to do and the need won't be there like the point of it is so the need is not there permanently um and a you know a not so intense intervention if, if some students still need one, um, hopefully will be sufficient after the ones that receive this get it. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Okay, um, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narquist. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Seraphie Cox. No. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. No. Wow. Member Kaufman? Yes. Who did I miss? Member Goldman. Hey, hey. Oh, Member Voss, I apologize. Member Voss. Yes. The vote is eight in favor, two opposed. Okay, so we are in... Um, we passed the 11 o'clock threshold during the middle of that roll call. So I will need a vote. I will need a motion to suspend our rules so we can, um, so we can continue with the business of the meeting. If someone would make that motion. Member Seraphie Cox. Uh, yes, uh, motion to extend the meeting 
by 30 minutes. Is there a second? Second. Okay, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Mem Member Busansky. Yes. Member Fallon. No. Member Sarah Cox. Yes. Member Condon. No. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. And Member Goldman. Yes. The vote is eight in favor, two opposed. Meeting will continue. Um, so the next item on the agenda is the um, is the discussion on the MASC delegate assembly resolutions. Um, and I believe uh, Member Levy is seeking guidance on these. And I don't know what your plan was, Member Levy. I don't know if you wanted to see if there were ones that people had concerns about and sort of work from there or how, how you wanted to proceed. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I do have a plan, but I see member Seraphy Cox has her hand up. I don't know if that's left over. Member Seraphy Cox. Okay. Um, so my, uh, my initial plan was to give you a quick summary of each of these, but given the time, I'm going to assume that you've read them. Um, I'm happy to answer questions if people have any but there, um, the reality is that a lot of these are going to be amended uh, before we actually get to the point where I'll be voting on them. So rather than go into lots of detailed discussion about them, um, what I wanted to get a sense of is two things, well, three things. One is, is there anything here that anybody strongly opposes? Um, the second thing is, is there anything somebody might want to offer an amendment on? Um, and then the third thing is, I just want to make sure you all support my kind of voting my conscience as the um, as these do get changed and and shifted. Um, so hearing from you about about sort of general thoughts will be helpful um, as I as I am doing my best to represent you as a body. But really with the timing, it's more about like strong feelings and amendments. Member Seraphy Cox. Um, I did read through them and um, there were none that I was strongly opposed to. And uh, uh, Dina, I think you kind of know the the spirit of this school committee and uh, uh so i would absolutely uh support that okay a uh, member fallon um i will email you the um, amendments that have made to the bill um the Senator Comerford's bill, the resolution that's supporting her bill, um, if you choose to incorporate that language into the, the resolution, that would be up to you. But it's a, um, there's quite a bit of, um, there are quite a few additions that have been added onto it um, during the, this Senate session. So I will send those to you, but that would be my only suggestion for an amendment. So Member Fallon, do you think those amendments are necessary in order to make the resolution really impactful? No, effect? no, okay. but I think you should have the language in case anyone brings it up since I was the one who wrote the resolution and I won't be there. Thanks. Just for your all's information, she's talking about resolution number nine. nine. Yeah, nine. Member Gold is next. Member Gold? Yeah, is, is this something that we can just, like, we're going to vote on our recommendations to you on this, Member Levy? Or, I mean, can we just email it to you rather than 
discussing this evening? Um, I don't think we can't really email the will of the committee to her. I think it's uh, that would not really be good, uh, but we could certainly. Um, or like to the Annie and then Annie sends it to, I mean. Yeah, I think, I think it's really, um, I mean, I think this is just an opportunity really to uh, give guidance to her as our voting representative at this, um, at this, at this meeting. Uh, as they take up these different resolutions. So um, I, I guess I, I guess is I guess I think what she's okay. looking for is the same stuff, the same things we've heard from Member Seraphy Cox. It's just if there's any if somebody has a strenuous objection to one of them or if there's one that we need to call out and and express concerns about. Um, yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm torn on one of them about even bringing it up right now. Um, whether it's worth it or not. When is the meeting? When do you get to know by? Meeting is November 6th. So we don't have another so, meeting. So this is our last chance. This is our last chance. I say trust your instinct and don't bring it up. <laughs> follow your follow your gut. Well, let's go with that. <laughs> okay. Uh, mem uh, so member Levy, you had your hand up, but I'm not sure... Yeah. No, I actually have one that I do kind of want to check in with folks about. Okay. Uh, and I don't, I don't, I do want to be quick. Um, so maybe Ron, member gold, this will be the same one you were thinking about. Um, but it's number five, which is about zero tolerance policies and, uh, no. Okay. Sorry. Um, well, this one is basically, um, saying that, uh, it, it's this, this resolution is not calling for, these policies to be eliminated or withdrawn, but simply for these schools to start, schools that have in the state that have zero tolerance policies to start with restorative practices and therapeutic alternatives and just other methods of intervention, which I appreciate. Um, but I also feel like we, there's a whole lot of data on the negative impact of zero tolerance policies, which includes the school to prison pipeline um, and I would, I would hope for a, I would hope for a stronger resolution that says, um, that's calling for the withdrawal of support of, of zero tolerance policies. So I would make an amendment to that if it came up, if you all supported that, but I won't do that if you all are not in support of that. Any thoughts or comments on that? Okay, I think you got your answer. You got a and a thumbs up. A member Voss. Member Sorry, Voss. I was muted. Do we need a motion here? Um, I I'll make a motion to to essentially what Member Seraphie Cox said to trust Member Levy's um sense about what she thinks our committee would support, and I completely. I'm grateful she's doing this. Yeah, I mean, we, we didn't have it scheduled as a vote on the agenda because it was really just a check-in. Okay. Um, so I, I don't think a vote is okay. needed. Um, and so it, we didn't post one on the agenda, but I, I think she's getting the sense of the committee. Member Bisansky. You're muted, Member Bisansky. There we go. Uh, I was just going to agree, Member Levy, with you. I'm reading it a little differently. Maybe it could be a little bit stronger, I guess, but it does seem like it's asking for these restorative therapeutic practices instead of zero tolerance, tolerance policies. But if you want to make if you want to make a motion to make it even stronger, I support you in that. Thanks. I did go to a meeting where where they were explaining these in detail, and they made it clear in that meeting that it was not uh, asking for the withdrawal or elimination of, of the zero tolerance policies, which is what got me thinking about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. I say go for it. Okay, so if folks are comfortable and member Levy, most importantly, if you're comfortable with the discussion, are we okay to move on? Uh, member Kaufman. Yeah, I just want to be realistic that we have 20 minutes and I, I don't think that there was a lot of enthusiasm to go beyond that. And we have three critically important items. So Mayor Narkowitz, I don't know if you want to 
make a decision about what we can cover now. I will throw out the idea that we are scheduled to meet on October 28th. I think that was MCAS. Is that right, Dr. Provost? Well, um, that's that's school improvement plans. Sorry, um, that's not what we typically use it for, but I just want to be realistic that we, we have three critical items is, can you think of something? I don't want to waste time talking about alternatives, but there's zero chance we're going to get through these three. So in my opinion- well, When you say three, um, you're talking about the remaining items on the agenda or- And, and the executive session, yeah. Okay, well, um, yeah. so I would say the, um, well, for example, one I think that's quite easy for us to get through uh, quickly would be the vote to refer the negotiation of successor collective bargaining agreement to the negotiating subcommittee. I mean, that's a fairly formal informality. A letter was sent to us, um, and it's okay. traditionally our custom to mo move to refer it. So, okay, um, maybe we can do that first. And so, then if you make it. the motion, then somebody can second it, and we can move forward. But that's not the issue. The issue is how we do. How are we going to address the other two issues that are likely to take a lot of time? And if we leave one of them out, um, what does that do about both circumstances? Um, I think superintendent's contract. I don't know what would happen. I think we should. I, I I think we should finish the business. Try to finish the business that we started, and that uh, rather than talking about how we're going to finish the business, I think we should just power through and try to finish it. Um, Okay. And get into the executive session, and we'll see see how see what the discussion is like. Um, that's my that's my take on it. Um, okay. These are these are some of these are important um, resolutions that have been worked on. That I think I know I, I'm fairly confident Member Sarah Cox would like to see them or was counting on them being voted on. So um, uh, okay, so I, let's fine. just keep. So would you make a motion to refer that letter or Member Sarah Cox? Your hand is up. Yeah, uh, you were uh, entertaining a motion. So yes. uh, we're going to make a motion to refer uh, the negotiation of a successor collective bargaining agreement to the negotiating subcommittee. Second. Second. Okay, any discussion? Hearing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Gold. Abstain, I don't understand it, sorry. Uh, Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busanski. Yes. yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. And member Voss. Yes. The vote is nine in favor, one abstention. So now the next, uh, the, the last remaining item before we would go to executive session is the request to send a letter to the Board of Health. And um, I guess that would be the question um, if we want to start that or if the, uh, uh, start that discussion. I suspect that may take us into 1130. Um, so that's, I guess that's a question for um, uh, the makers of that or the requesters of that, whether that's something they, they would defer to the next meeting um, or whether they would like to try to take that up tonight. My preference is to try and take it up tonight, but I don't, I, uh, I don't know if we can get through it quickly or not. Um, okay. Um, is, uh, Member Voss. My preference is to take it up tonight too. And I think there's some misinformation out there based on public comment that needs to be clarified very quickly and based on emails. And also I'm just gonna say, I member in response to member Kaufman, I think we can do what this, we can try to do it by 1130, this one issue. And my preference is to schedule another executive session at another time. There's way too many things to talk about that are so important in that executive session and to do it at 1130 isn't fair to anyone. So I would, I would be happy to schedule another meeting, put it off two weeks. I don't know how time important some of the um, things are. Member Serafi Cox knows, but um, that's my preference. 
Okay. Can I, should we try and jump in and try and be quick? Okay. So um, I, I did uh, hear in public comment so many folks uh, articulating the fact that, um, you know, there should be no mandate of vaccines that aren't fully approved by the FDA. And I, I actually agree with that. Uh, and that was my intention in writing the letter. And I actually amended it before public comment to be more clear about that, but um, folks obviously wouldn't have seen that. So if it's okay, what I'd like to do is share my screen, show folks an updated version, which makes it clear that what we're asking for is, um, is uh, for the um, vaccine to be mandated um, following Federal Drug Administration's full approval of the COVID vaccine for each age group. And I will also say that um, I, I really appreciate Layla's um, communications with me to help me understand who this letter should be addressing uh, and that the Northampton Board of Health is not actually, according to her, um, empowered to mandate vaccines, that in reality, it's, it's the Massachusetts Department of Health and our policies actually state that as well. So um, that's why the letter is written to the Massachusetts Public of Health, uh, Department of Public Health, uh, as well as DESE, and then CCing um, the Northampton Board of Health, our local representatives, uh, in hopes that they can help support this and also the Massachusetts Teachers Association. So I'm gonna share my screen. I'm not gonna, unless people want me to, I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you. I'm just going to point out what looks different in this version from the version you have seen already. Um, unanimously is in red. I'm not counting my chickens. Uh, I'll update that once we voted. Um, but you'll see here that uh, I've put in, we're urging them to add the COVID-19 vaccine to the list of, of vaccines required for students to attend school following Federal Drug Administration's full approval of the COVID vaccine for each age group. This is consistent with their recommendations, which state the, um, the high efficacy of vaccines. We go on to, to show which other folks have been doing this. Um, the fact that the Massachusetts Teachers Association supports it. Uh, and then finally, um, it's really the, our district and the school committee's role is to implement public health policy as directed by the state. So we're urging them to include COVID-19 vaccine as a requirement of attending school in the state of Massachusetts once it has been approved by the FDA. The other thing I'll say about writing this letter uh, in part in response to some of the, the public comments that we heard is that um, yes, COVID, uh, is is not as negatively impactful on younger kids and younger kids can carry it and it is impactful on their elderly grandparents and their teachers and other immunocompromised folks. And we know that vaccines help uh, help end pandemics. And so that to me is, is the reason, one of the reasons behind sending this letter. So I'm happy to um, read more or keep this open or not keep it open. Um, and uh, Member Voss and Member Busansky both um, were really, really helpful in, in crafting this and, and putting eyes on this. So I'll also defer to the two of them if, if you all wanna say anything before this gets opened up for comment and questions. Um, um, well, I'll just say thank you for really crafting it. And I saw an earlier version, um, and I suspect Member Busansky also helped after I saw it. it, it I, I see one thing in it that I'm not quite sure is accurate and I wanted to ask about, and that is the Cambridge schools. My understanding is that they're in a different bucket, which, and maybe I'm wrong, is can't. Can, Oh, is Cambridge mandating for um, school or only for extracurricular? I maybe Cambridge remember. mandated for school for all students to be uh, vaccinated who are eligible, not FDA approved, so twelve and up. Um, but if you are not vaccinated, you can still attend school with a mask, but you can't attend extracurricular. Um, 
mm -hmm. uh, you know, type of or sports, et cetera, activities. Thank and you. Then, yeah. Thank you. Um, and they did 12 and up, not 16 and up, so. So, so, so I'll just say I really support for now the 16 and up for the Pfizer because that's what's fully approved and not an emergency use. And I like this approach of writing this letter to all of these groups uh, as a way to say where our school committee stands on this. And I, I fully support what this says. Um, I also in the news today, Belchertown and there's Lexington and Cambridge, I guess is a little bit of a hybrid are asking um, for children who, again, 16 and up, um, I believe is what the Lexington one is that I put up on the screen the other day. Um, and I don't know what the approach is for us to consider that or who makes that decision, but I would like the entity to, that makes that decision to consider it and get back to us um, or get back to the community. I don't know, Member Levy, if you, how you feel about that or where that stands. Yeah, I think um, at some point it was like, let us know what you're going to do. And then we said your timeline for making this change. So, and we, at one point we had email addresses in there so we can make that stronger if you'd like. So, I, get, I mean, uh, maybe the mayor or the superintendent can help me, but like all these other school committees are passing something for extracurriculars. And what I've read is they feel like that's a place where more spread can happen. And again, it's it's older kids and it's going home and out to the community. And I, I just don't know where we stand or what we should be doing. I guess my response would be the agenda item that we're working on is this letter, whether or not to send this letter. And so I'm just, I, I really want us to finish this so we can try to go on to the other items on the agenda. So I, 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 think, I, think, the letter, I think the letter captures it, um, what we're trying to capture, I, I think. I, I wish we could take a vote on the letter. Member Bysansky. Uh, I just... I just wanted to add that I think there's an opportunity to try to, you know, try and push it, put some pressure on the state through uh, other school committees also sending a letter like this. We've seen other campaigns like this run. I'm not sure how to get that out there, but that was one thing I was talking to Member Levy about maybe at the mass conference or on the mask listserv, there'd be an opportunity to have other people send this to um, the Massachusetts Department of Health as well. Member uh, Goldman, sorry. Thank you. Member Levy, Levy could you address, um, just answer why we're asking for this, why, why we're doing this prior to FDA approval? Like, wh why would we do this we're now? Not, instead we're of not, well, the FDA has approved 16 and up, so there, it's not prior to FDA approval. This would I see say- what you mean students 16 and up would be mandated and it would put in place then in my mind that mandate as soon as the FDA does approve for other age groups so that it wouldn't need to be done over and over. This is what they did in California. They said that as soon as FDA approval comes in, then that becomes mandated for, for students to attend school. Thank you. Member, member Gold. Uh, so we're probably going to run out of time here because I got a couple of questions. Uh, first, I have a kind of a question for the agenda setting committee because, and Member Kaufman, if you can help me understand this better, I thought we voted at our last meeting to not take up and be uh, making health recommendations and leaving it to the health advisory board. Um, and so I, I remember, Member Kaufman, you brought up that whole motion and vote. So can you please speak to me how this doesn't contradict what we all voted to approve? Sorry, what we the, we approved last time? Yeah, so I mean, the way I interpret it is that we made the we voted not we voted that our Northampton School Committee would not make a decision, but I don't think that negated us from making a recommendation, and that's what this is. I think that's our role now at this point is that we, as a committee, may or may not, we'll find out after we vote, recommends that the people who do make the decision make a decision that affirms the fact that kids will get it. So. 
I see it as two distinct things. One is, one is that we're making a decision. The other is that we're recommending to the people that they make a decision in the way that we believe they should. You look confused, no? Yeah, it, it seems a little muddy. Like one thing is to, we're deciding. Another thing is that we're telling them this is what we want them to decide. You know, and let us know when uh, when you want to make the change or what. Or I forgot what that that last line was. But to me, it's yeah. a little. It's muddying the waters. Um, I don't. You know, I'm supportive of of vac the vaccinations and all that. But I I just don't think it's our role to do that. The superintendent also shared with us that the state yeah. or the commissioner said that it's not something that school committees have the authority to do. So like we don't have the authority to do it. Why do we, have, you know, I don't know if we should be asking for it. So that's another reason why I'm going to vote against it. The sure. other piece is um, that I want to ask is why shouldn't it say emergency? Like, do we want emergency approval versus FDA approval? Can you talk to that uh, member Levy? Yeah, that's exactly what the people who are doing public comment were saying was that emergency approval is not the same. To be honest, it's pretty close, but uh, they were concerned that um, emergency approval doesn't go through all of the same trial that the FDA approved ones do. And so this is actually not to say the emergency approval, but to say the FDA approval. Uh, the emergency approval would be 12 and up and ideally, hopefully five and up really soon. But um, until the FDA fully approves it, I, I do actually think it's unfair to put families and, and caregivers in the position to um, be forced to do a vaccine that the FDA is basically saying is still more or less experimental, even though that's not really the case. But uh, getting the, the full FDA approval is, is what I intended here. And I'll also say just in response to what, if that's okay, to what you were saying about I, I do think that uh, as elected officials, we do have a, a place to give recommendations and to speak, especially since it's not our local board and it's not the, it's not the body that is making decisions within the district um, that, that has the authority to do this. We're, we're writing to the state uh, and to say that, and, and urging them to, to move in this direction to say, this is where our school committee stands and in hopes that other school committees will do that as well. So this isn't taking the place of making decisions for our district, it's saying to the state, uh, we encourage you to make this decision since we can't. Okay, before I go to the next member, um, I'd like, to, I'd, could someone please make a motion to extend the meeting? Uh, preferably till midnight would be helpful, I think. I think 30, another 30 minutes would allow us to complete the agenda. Um, I apologize, Mayor, but I'm going to uh, make a motion to extend the meeting by 15 minutes. Um, okay. And just to let folks know that um, I think that uh, items on the executive um, agenda that I'm responsible for, um, I would like to see them taken up at a time when our brains are fresher and when I'm not literally laying on my back with an ice pack. Um, and can actually uh, facilitate more properly. Um, so I would uh, request that we schedule a special executive session for next week to take those items up. So are we, but it's, a, it's 1130 now, so we need to make a motion to extend the meeting before we can talk about what we're doing with the rest of the agenda. I'll second I'll, it. She, she made one to 15, I'll second extend it. Extend the minute for 15. So. Um, all those in favor, uh, please, well, you'll have to call the roll, I suppose. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busanski. Yes. yes. Member Fallon. No. Member Serafie Cox. Yes. Member Condon. No. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. And Member Gold. Yes. The vote is eight in favor, two opposed. Okay, so the meeting is extended. Um, Member Fallon had her hand raised to talk to the motion that's on the table. 
Thank you. I just want to briefly say that I, I'm struggling with this. I don't feel comfortable making a decision on this. I don't feel comfortable with mandating something um, until it obviously had full FDA approval, but I'm struggling because of the, the rare side effects that some young men are experiencing. I would not forgive myself if I made it a condition of attending school, which is compulsory. And I also want to point out that, for instance, Los Angeles School District did make it mandatory that students um, have be vaccinated, but then they also provided a re remote option for those who are refusing to be vaccinated. And I wish that if we were going to require vaccination, that we had an alternative for those families who, for whatever reason, um, were unable to or unwilling to get vaccinated. Um, and so that's where I just feel like I'm not comfortable. I'm not in a position to be making these sorts of medical decisions. So can Member I Lee. respond? Member Lee. Um, thanks. I, so one of the things that I thought about and didn't include in this language because it kind of felt implicit is that certainly in every mandate, there are, there are exemptions, there are opportunities for people to say either for religious reasons or medical reasons that they're unable or unwilling to get the vaccine. Uh, and I guess my question to you, Member Fallon, is whether that inserting that language in this document would help. Uh, and again, this is why we're writing, in my mind, we're writing a letter to the public health folks who are the experts to say, this is where we are, but we're not actually making the decision. We're asking them to make the decision. Member Bisansky. Uh, yeah, just to, I just want to reiterate once again, we're talking about only FDA approved. So that's ages 16 and up. This is not for emergency authorized vaccines. Okay. Um, so the question then becomes someone needs to make a motion and a second uh, to authorize the. Um, Authorize the school committee to send the letter. Uh, motion to authorize uh, the school committee to send the letter that uh, member Levy showed on the screen that includes the changes. Second. Okay. Um, let's. Uh, Member Bisansky, your hand, I, that was, did I just not lower it? I'm sorry. I would, did you have a question? Are you okay? Okay. I'm good. Right. Be down. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded. I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Bisansky. Yes. Member Fallon. No. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Condon. No. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. No. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. The vote is seven in favor, three opposed. Okay, so... Um... We have 10 minutes remaining on the time that, uh, that we have allotted um, future business uh, and meeting dates. Uh, we have the school committee meeting with the um, uh, student advisory, well, that's already on here. Uh, Rules and Policy Committee, Monday, October 18th, Superintendent Evaluation, Wednesday, October 20th, Budget and Property Subcommittee, Tuesday, October 26th, School Committee meeting, Thursday, October 28th, School Committee meeting, Tuesday, November 9th. Um, so, uh, my question is, so the, um, there is a, a request alluded to about rescheduling the executive session to another date. Um, I, I guess I want to hear what other people want to say about that. Obviously the meeting right now is only going to, is going to end at 1145. Um, it's rather frustrating because we had a brief agenda that we once again managed to um, 
talk forever and uh, basically drag the agenda on much longer than it needed to be. Um, so that part of it's extremely frustrating, especially for those who came to the meeting and spoke about, about issues. Um, Member Seraphy Cox. Um, well, I was, it, it looked as though you were kind of fishing for a, a motion related to what I had uh, suggested earlier. Um, so I guess I can just put that on the table. Um, so my um, motion would be to uh, table the executive session until um, a meeting uh, to be scheduled for next week. Second. Was that a motion? Yes. Okay, then I'm seconding it. Member Gold. Yeah, I thought that uh, what we were hearing from Member Sophie Cox was that she her items she was okay with moving till later, but I do feel like item C we should uh, take up to this evening still. So I'd like us to at least uh, discuss item C, which is the uh, superintendent contract. Okay, um, Member Goldman. Um. I also agree that um, these are really important topics and um, I'd like us to have a fresher frame of mind for it. I wonder if a friendly amendment would be accepted to move the executive session to 6.15 on um, October 28th to have a half hour before our meeting, our next meeting, which is in two weeks. <laughs> When has our committee ever done anything in a half hour, Member Goldman? Yeah, that's, I don't, I think We've that's not it. real. I think that's not realistic. Um, if that were the case, you would have accepted my uh, request to stay until midnight and we would have finished it. But um, Member Voss. Well, I, I like Member Goldman's idea, and then we could finish after the meeting, and we could make sure the meeting stays short. And I am going to push back a little and say, when I saw this agenda, I thought it was very long, and the agenda makers made it long. Um, we had millions of dollars of capital improvements that were really important to talk about. But apparently, the deadline's tomorrow. So that part... To me, I know I talked a lot, but it's an enormous amount of our city's money, our taxpayers' money, and it was very important. Um, we had a lot of visitors that were not given limits on their presentations tonight, and I don't think it's fair to blame us for making this meeting long. And that needs to be said. Um, if I, I, yeah, I'm done. Okay, Member Kaufman. Thank you. I think Member Goldman's idea is good. I would I would just suggest instead of a half hour before, maybe she would consider making it an hour before or something that would, might give us more time. Um, assuming everybody can make it. But I also feel like, you know, this is critically important evening for most of our guest speakers or our um, speakers, public, public commenters. And I obviously it's a critical meeting for Dr. Provost where he is now and where, where his future is. So I think he would, I would just love to hear if he feels it's okay to wait. Um, it's important for me to hear that from him, I guess, whether, whether he'd be okay in us waiting, if he's comfortable in responding. I don't think it's okay. I think it sends a message from the committee to everyone who spoke tonight that you don't respect them. Mm -hmm. I think that's how it'll be perceived. And that's how I feel. Yeah. Thank you. So um, any other thoughts, any other comments on this? I, I, I still have the floor. Uh, yes, you do, Member Kaufman, unless, okay. unless you are finished. I, I'm just going to wing it. I'll say I'd like to extend the meeting until 12.15. Okay, so we, um, so we sort of, we had the start of a motion that was, well, originally it was a discussion about moving to an executive session next week. 
then there was a discussion about moving it to um, the 28th or whatever it was, but I don't know that there was an actual so motion. I made, I, made an, I made a motion and it was seconded. I did not accept any friendly amendments. So my okay. motion is the one that's on the floor and my motion would have to be voted on before member Kaufman's yeah. motion. Okay, can I ask you, was your motion <laughs> to schedule an executive session for next week or what? Correct. Okay. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded to um, schedule a uh, executive session for next week. Uh, there are hands raised, are these about the motion? Mm -hmm. Okay, member Voss. I'm gonna respond and say that I think it's um, not accurate to say that we're putting this off because we don't care, we're disrespectful personally. I've been up and at work since about 7.30 this morning and I am fried and I wanna take the time to have a careful conversation and make sure that we do a really good job. And so I think the message we're sending is, this is too important to do at 11.45 at night. Um, that I, And I want my message to be that. I wanna make a special night to do this carefully because I can't do it right now, a good job. Member Levy. My thought is very similar. I just wanted to, to articulate Dr. Provost. In my mind, it's, it's a feeling of respect towards you that I want to be in my best mind and be able to really give this the attention it deserves. And I don't think any of us are able to do that at 1145. So I hope you know that for me, this is a sign of respect. Member Busansky. I, I was going to say basically the same thing. To me, this is much more about respect than disrespect and respect to all the speakers tonight. I don't think in any way. And that's why I would like to have the meeting next week and not wait two weeks. That's why I seconded Emily's member Sarah Fee Cox's um, motion, because I do think it deserves to be decided on as quickly as possible, but not at 1145 at night when I'm totally... Um, incapable of making a full sentence, as you can tell. <laughs> Member Fallon. You know, I've been voting against extending meetings. I do want to say my concern is that we are all here and present tonight and we have a rules and policy meeting scheduled for Monday. I don't know what the city side had, has scheduled for next week and I don't know what the superintendent schedule looks like, but I would rather all of us be present for this conversation than only have part of the committee there for such an important conversation, so. Okay, Member Fallon, so, okay. Any other comments or questions on this? Uh, I'll, Member Seraphie Cox, I, okay. Um, so I'll ask the question, I'll, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the question of um, rescheduling the executive session until next week. I, I just want to interject that there is no evening time in the superintendent's schedule next week, except on Friday. So keep that in mind. Um, Member Fallon. No. no. Member Seraphie Cox. Yes. Yes. Member Condon. No. Oh. Member Levy. Does the superintendent need to hear through this conversation? I mean that it was genuinely. He was, it, he was stepping out for that conversation. Okay, so yes. Member Kaufman. No. Member Goldman. No. Uh, Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. No. Mayor Narquist. No. Member Busansky. Yes. The vote is four in favor, six against. Okay, so we do need another uh, 
your motion would now be in order, Member Kaufman, if there is a motion to extend. Um, we do need a motion to extend because we're now motion, motion to extend to 1215. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Seraphie Cox. No. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. No. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. No. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busansky. No. And Member Fallon. Yes. The vote is six in favor, four opposed. Okay, so I would, I would now entertain a motion to move into executive session as according to the... Um, Motion to move to uh, request executive session under Massachusetts General Law, Open Meeting Chapter 30A, Section 21A2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparations for negotiations with, uh, no, not that, sorry, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation. Is it that, or contract negotiations with non union personnel in Chapter 21A seat? Second. Okay, um, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Seraphie Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. No. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Vysansky. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. The vote is nine in favor, one opposed. Okay, so I'll just say to the public that are here, um, we are gonna move into executive session to discuss matters that we cannot uh, be detrimental to discuss in open session. Um, we are scheduled to return to open session to take votes on those matters. Um, so Annie, I do not know what, uh, what your plan is. Are you thinking about a breakout room? Yes. And Karen okay. Albano, uh, our curriculum director, she's, I'm going to transfer hosting over to her okay. and then Karen is going to put us into a breakout room. Okay. Excellent. So for the members of the public, we'll be moving into executive session and, um, and then coming back out of executive session. Uh, if Karen is still with us. I saw her name there. She's here, and I just, uh, here. I mean. Yeah. Okay, Karen.
in the executive session, um, and it was the matter of the uh, superintendent contract. And so um, I would entertain a motion uh, on item C on the agenda um, to um, approve the superintendent contract. Motion to approve the superintendent's uh, um, what's the S word? The the next contract um, successor contract successor contract um, as written for three years. Okay. Second. Seconded by Member Kaufman. Okay. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Voss. No. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busansky. Oh, you're muted. Member Busansky. Sorry about that. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. And Member Goldman. Yes. The vote is nine in favor. Okay. Um, so the uh, nine in favor, there's 10 of us. What was the- uh, And one opposed. One opposed, sorry. okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so the motion does carry and the um, contract is approved um, for Dr. Provost um, for three years. Um, I would now entertain a, a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narquist. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. And Member Voss. Yes. And in favor of adjourning. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate this. So the meeting of the school committee is adjourned.